Give me control of the primary scanner, Commander, just for a moment, will you? The Commander fumed in his spacesuit for a moment, then nodded his eye stalks at the Lieutenant. The second hollow sphere became a narrow, dark cone and swung so that the wide end was directed towards the ceiling. Pittance glowed at the very point of the other end of the projection. The screen of defence devices reduced to a tiny florette of coloured light close in to the cone's point. At the far wide end, there was a tiny, fiercely, almost painfully red dot. There is the good ship killing time, Commander. It set off at almost the same time I did. Regrettably, it is both quicker and faster than I. It has already done us the honour of copying to me the signal it sent to the rest of the culture the moment we opened fire on its emissary. I'll transmit you a copy too, minus the various venomous unpleasantnesses directed specifically at myself. Thank you for the use of your control desk. You can have it back now. The cone collapsed to become a sphere again. The traitor's ship's last message scrolled off the side of the flat screen. The commander and the lieutenant looked at each other. The small screen came up with another incoming signal. Oh, and will you contact a front high command, or shall I? Somebody had better tell them that we're at war with the culture. Chapter 3 Gaynar Hafoan woke up with a headache it took minutes to calm down. Performing the relevant pain management inside his head took far too much concentration for somebody feeling this bad to perform quickly. He felt like he was a child on a beach, swinging a toy spade and building a seawall all around him as the tide rushed in. Waves kept overtopping, and he was constantly shoveling sand up to small breaches in his defences. And the worst of it was, the more sand he piled up, the deeper he dug, and the higher he had to throw. Eventually, water started seeping in from the bottom of his sea fort, and he gave in. He just blanketed all pain. If somebody started holding flames to his feet, or he jammed his fingers in a door, that'd just be too bad. He knew better than to shake his head, so he imagined shaking his head. He'd never had a hangover this bad. He tried opening one eye. It didn't seem too keen on cooperating. Try the other one. No, that one didn't want to face the world either. Very dark. Like being wrapped up inside a big dark cloak or some... He jerked. Both eyes tore open, making both smart and water. He was looking at some sort of big screen in hollowed. Space. Stars. He looked down, finding it difficult to move his head. He was held inside a large, very comfortable, but very secure chair. It was made of some sort of soft hide. It was half reclined, and it smelled very pleasant. But it had big padded hoops that had clamped themselves over his forearms and his lower legs. A similar hide-covered bar looped over his lower abdomen. He tried moving his head again. It was held inside some sort of open-face helmet, which felt like it was attached to the headrest of the chair. He looked to one side. Hide-covered wall, polished wood. A panel or screen showing what looked like an abstract painting. It was an abstract painting, a famous one. He recognised it. Ceiling black, light-studded. In front, just the screen. Floor carpeted. Looked much like the inside of a standard culture module so far. Very quiet. Not that that meant anything. He looked to his right. There were two more seats like his across the width of the cabin. It was probably a cabin, and this was almost certainly a nine- or twelve-person module. He couldn't see behind to tell. The seat in the middle, the one nearer him, was occupied by a bulky, rather antique-looking drone, its flat-topped bulk resting on the cushion of the seat. People always said drones looked a bit like suitcases, but this one reminded Gaynor Hafoan of an old-fashioned sledge. Somehow, it gave the impression that it was staring at the screen. Its aura field was flickering as though it was undergoing rapid mood changes. Mostly it displayed a mixture of grey, brown and white. Frustration, displeasure and anger. Not an encouraging combination. The seat on the far side of the cabin held a beautiful young woman who looked just a little like Dajil Gillian. Her nose was smaller, her eyes were the wrong colour, her hair was quite different. It was hard to tell whether her figure bore any resemblance to the other woman, because she was inside what looked like a jewelled spacesuit, a standardish culture hard suit plated in platinum or silver, and liberally plastered in gems that certainly glittered and flashed in the overhead lights, as though they were things like rubies, emeralds, diamonds, and so on. The suit's helmet, equally encrusted, rested on the arm of her seat. 
She wasn't shackled into place in the seat, he noticed. The girl bore on her face a frown so deep and severe, he imagined it would have made almost anybody else look quite supremely ugly. On her, it looked rather fetching. Probably not the desired effect at all. He decided to risk a smile. The open-faced helmet he was wearing ought to let her see it. Um, hello, he said. The old drone rose and flicked round as if glancing at him. It thumped back into the seat cushion, its aura fields off. It's hopeless, it announced, as though it hadn't heard what the man had said. We are locked out, nowhere to go. The girl in the far seat narrowed her fiercely blue eyes and glared at Gaynor Hawthorne. When she spoke, her voice was like an ice stiletto. This is all your fault, you ghastly piece of shit, she said. Gaynor Hawthorne sighed. He was losing consciousness once more, but he didn't care. He had absolutely no idea who this creature was, but he liked her already. It went dark again. Chapter 4 Stuttered tight point, M32, trial point at N4.28.882.4656 From LSV Serious Callers Only to Eccentric Shoot Them Later It's war! Those insane fucks have declared war! They're mad! Stuttered tight point, M32, tra, point, at 4.28.882.4861 from eccentric shoot them later to LSV serious callers only. I was about to call. I just got the message from the ship I requested to attend pittance. This looks bad. Bad? It's a fucking catastrophe. Did your girl get her man? Oh, she got him all right. But then a few hours later, the affront high command announced the birth of a bouncing baby war. The ship, Fedge sent to Tyr, was standing a day's module travel away. It decided it had better things to do than hang around on a mission it had never been very happy with, even from the beginning. I think the declaration of war came almost as a relief to it. It promptly announced its position to the steely glint, and was immediately asked to ship out at maximum speed on some desperate defence mission. Bastard wouldn't even tell me where. Took me real milliseconds to argue it out of confessing all to the steely glint, and telling it exactly why it was anywhere near Tyr in the first place. I was able to persuade it Phage's honour rested on it keeping quiet. I don't think it'll squeal. I let it know I give serious grudge. But it was demilled. Hasn't it just gone back to feed for munitioning? Ha! <laughs> Demilitarised my backup. Fucker left Fage fully tooled. Fage's own idea, sneaky scumbag. Always was overprotective. What comes of being that geriatric, I suppose? Anyway, the frank exchange of views is cannon to the gunnels and itching for a brawl, apparently. Whatever. It has gone which leaves our lass and the captive Gaynor Hoffman floating in a module nearly a day out of Tyr with nowhere to go. Tyr is requesting, make that insisting, all culture and front craft and personnel leave it for the duration of the hostilities, and nobody's been allowed in. I've tried to find somebody else within range to pick them up, but it's hopeless. A Tyr deep-scan inventory has already identified their module. The meat fucker is skimming in a day away, and the module can make, ooh, all of two hundred lights. Guess what happens next? We've failed. So it would appear. Was this the aim? And is this now the result of the conspiracy? War with the affront? I believe so. The accession is still the more important matter, but its appearance and the possibilities it may open up have been used by the conspiracy to tempt the affront into initiating hostilities. Pittance is worse, though. That pittance has fallen implies entrapment. It points to treachery. The Killing Time believes there was another culture or ex-culture ship there. Not one of the stored vessels, but another craft. Something no less old than the stored vessels, but wiser and more experienced. Something that's been around as long as they, but awake all that time. It believes that this ship was taking the part of the pittance mind when it communicated with it on its approach. I suspect it will prove to be a warship which apparently went eccentric or ulterior at some point in the last five hundred years and was supposedly, not actually, demilitarised by one of the conspirators. I have a list of suspects. The killing time suggests that this ship tricked its way beneath the pittance mine's guard and either destroyed it or took it over. The store was then turned over to the affront. They now have a ready-made instant battle fleet of culture warcraft. 
tech generations of development beyond their own ships and just nine days' journey from the accession. Nothing we can put in place in the time available can stop them. For what it's worth, the killing time is making all speed for Esperi. Nine days from now, we'll have the not invented here and the different tan from the gang there. The NIH has two operational thug-class ROUs it's in the process of cannoning up, a hooligan LOU and a delinquent GOU. Another couple of GSVs should be there too if they aren't diverted because of the war, with a total of five OUs, two of them torturer class. Eight of Phage's psychopath ROUs are bound for the accession, but the rest are down for defensive duties elsewhere to cope with likely threats from front battle units. Even those eight won't get within punch-throwing range of the accession until two days after the affront can be there. Bottom line is, there are a total of ten warships of various classes capable of making it to the accession in time to make a stand against the affront. Enough to hold off the entire affront navy if that was all we were going to be faced with, but simply not capable of holding back more than an eighth of the ships that could come out of pittance. If they all go straight to the accession, it will be theirs. For the record, all the remaining ship stores are breaking themselves open, but the nearest is over five weeks' travel away. A gesture, that's all. Oh, and a few other involved have offered help, but they're all either too weak or too far away. A couple of other barbarics are probably going to declare for the affront once they've stopped scratching their heads and worked out what they might be able to get up to with the culture's attention diverted, but they're even less relevant. And if we were expecting some well-disposed elders to step into the nursery and confiscate all our toys and restore order, it doesn't look very likely so far. No note is taken, as far as anybody can tell. So... That just leaves our old friend, currently, possibly, probably, almost certainly, also en route. Wildcard? Somehow part of the conspiracy? Have we any more thoughts? Come to that. Have you had any reply from it? None and no. No offence, but the SS is one of the more unfathomable eccentrics. Perhaps it thinks the accession requires storing. Perhaps it intends to ram it at that speed, or attempt to plunge into it and access other universes, I don't know. There is some private issue being played out in this, I believe, and Gaynor Hafoan fits in somewhere. I have almost given up thinking about this aspect of affairs. I shall continue my attempts to contact it, but I don't think it's even looking at its signal files. The point is that the war itself takes precedence, with the accession prioritised beyond that. No offence, Teakin. So, we are left with the affront on the cusp of apotheosis or nemesis. Indeed. Quite how they intend to use these elderly but still potent warships to take control of the accession, one can only hazard at. Perhaps they intend surrounding it and charging admission. But they have begun a war which, unless they can somehow gain control of the accession and exploit it, they can only lose. They have a few hundred half-millennium-old warships, capable of inflicting untold damage let loose in a peaceable, unmilitarized, if relatively unpopulated section of the galaxy, certainly, but only for a month or two at most. Then the culture gathers the force to crush them utterly, and moves on to rip the affront hegemony to shreds and impose its own peace upon it. There can be no other outcome, unless the accession does come into play, which I doubt. Maybe it is some sort of projection. Maybe its appearance was not fortuitous, but planned. This looks unlikely, I know, but everything else about this has been so cunningly put together. Whatever. The argument, which everybody had thought was lost at the end of the Adiran War, is about to be won. The agreement come to then is in the process of being overturned. I, for one, am not going to stand for this. We may have failed to frustrate the conspiracy, but it will still be possible to work towards the discovery of the guilty parties involved in its planning and implementation, both during and after the hostilities. I intend to copy all my thoughts, theories, evidence, communications and all other relevant documentation to every trusted colleague and contact I possess. If you have any intention of taking part in the course of action I am suggesting, I urge you to do the same and to relay this advice to the anticipation of a new lover's arrival. I intend to pursue the perpetrators of this unnecessary war for as long as it takes until they are brought to justice, and I am aware, both, that I will no longer be able to do so without them knowing that I am doing so, and that there is no better circumstance to arrange for the jeopardization of a fellow mind than in time of war, when blanket secrecies are imposed. Warcraft of every sort are loosed, mistakes can be claimed to have been made, deals done, mercenaries hired and old scores settled. I do not believe I am being melodramatic in this. 
I will be under terminal threat, and so will anybody else who determines to adopt the same course as I. The conspirators have played exceedingly dirty until this point, and I cannot imagine they will do other than continue to do so now that their filthy scheme is on the very brink of success. What do you say? Will you join in this perilous mission? How I wish that I could persuade myself, never mind you, that you are being melodramatic. You risk more than I. My eccentricity might save me. We have gone this far together. Count me in. Oh, meat. They never said this would happen when they invited me onto the group and into the gang. Hmm. I had forgotten how unpleasant the emotion of fear is. This is hateful. You're right. Let's get these bastards. How dare they disturb my peace of mind so, just to teach some tentacled bunch of backwards barbarians a lesson. Chapter 5 The battle cruiser, Kiss the Blade, caught the cruise ship, just passing through, on the outskirts of the Ekro system. The culture craft, ten kilometres of sleek beauty, host to two hundred thousand holidaying travellers of umpteen different species types, hove to as soon as the battle cruiser came within range, but the affront vessel put a shot across its bows anyway, just on general principles. The more determinedly assiduous revellers hadn't believed the announcement about the war anyway, and thought the missile warhead's detonation which lit up the skies ahead of the ship was just some particularly big but otherwise unimpressive firework. It had been close. Another hour's warning, and the culture ship's hurried reconfiguring and matter-scavenging engine rebuild would have ensured its escape. But it wasn't to be. The two ships joined. In the reception vestibule, a small party of people met a trio of suited affronters as they emerged from the airlocks in a swirl of cool mists. You are the ship's representative? Yes, the squat figure at the front of the human said. And you? I am Colonel Alien Befriender, first class, five-tied humid year seven of the Winterhunter tribe, and the battle cruiser Kiss the Blade. This ship is claimed as prize in the name of the Affront Republic, according to the normal rules of war. If you obey all our instructions promptly, there is every possibility that no harm will come to you, your passengers, or crew. In case you have any illusions concerning your status, you are now our hostages. Any questions? None that I either can't guess the answer to or imagine you'd answer truthfully, the Avatar said. Your jurisdiction is accepted under force of arms alone. Your actions, while this situation persists, will be recorded. Nothing less than the total destruction of this vessel, atom by atom, will wipe out that record. And when in due course... Yes, yes. I'll contact my lawyers now. Now, take me to your best suite fitted out for a front physiology. The girl was indignant, with a kind of ferocity probably only somebody from the Peace Faction could muster in such a situation. But we're the Peace Faction, she protested for the fifth or sixth time. We're... we're not the true culture, the way it used to be. Ah, Leffitt said, grimacing as somebody pushed behind him and forced his chest into the front of the bar. He glanced round, scowling, and ruffled his wings back into shape. The starboard lounge of the Zoanon was crowded, the ship was crowded, and he could see his wings were going to end up in a terrible shape by the time this was over. Mind you, there were compensations. Somebody pushed into the bar and squeezed the Peace Faction girl closer to him, so that her bare arm touched him, and he could feel the warmth of her hip against his. She smelled wonderful. Now, that could be your problem, he said, trying to sound sympathetic. Calling yourselves the true culture, you see? To the tear intricates and even to the affront. That could sound, well, confusing. But everybody knows we won't have anything to do with war. It's just so unfair. She flicked her short black hair and stared into the drug bowl she held. It was fuming too. Fucking war! She sounded close to tears. Leffid judged the time right to put his arm round her. She didn't seem to mind. He thought the better of hinting that, in his own small way, he might have helped start the war. Sort of thing some people might be impressed with, but not all. Besides, he'd given his word, and the tendency had been rewarded for its tip-off to the mainland with this very ship, 
currently engaged in the highly humanitarian task of helping to evacuate Tyr Habitat of all temporarily undesirable aliens, not to mention earning the tendency some much-needed cordiality credit with a whole raft of other involves and strands of the culture. The girl sighed deeply and held the drug bowl to her face, letting some of the heavy grey smoke tip towards her exceedingly pretty little nose. She glanced round at him with a small, brave smile, her gaze rising over his shoulder. Light your wings, she said. He smiled. Why, thank you. Damn, <laughs> my dear. The professor blinked. Yes, it really was an affront of floating at the far end of the room near the windows. Suit like a small tubby spacecraft, all gleaming knobbly bits, articulated limbs and glistening prisms. The gauzy white curtains blew in around it, letting bright, high-angled sunlight flow in waves across the carpet. Oh dear, was that her underwear draped over a hassock in the affronter's shadow? I beg your pardon, she said. She wasn't sure she'd heard right. Fuisa cloethel beldrunsa coriem iel poere da merire. You have been deemed the senior human representative on the orbital named Cloathel. You are hereby informed that this orbital is claimed in the name of the Affront Republic. All culture personnel are now Affront citizens, third class. All orders from superiors will be obeyed. Any resistance will be treated as treason. The professor rubbed her eyes. Cloud Jean, is that you? she asked the affronter. The destroyer Wing Clipper had arrived the day before with a cultural exchange group the university had been expecting for some weeks. Cloud Sheen was the ship's captain. They'd had a good talk about pan-species semantics at the party just the night before. Intelligent, surprisingly sensitive creature, not remotely as aggressive as she'd expected. This looked like him, but different. She had a disquieting feeling the extra bits on his suit were weapons. Captain Cloud Sheen, if you please, Professor, the affronter said, floating closer. It was directly above her skirt, lying crumpled on the floor. Heavens, she had been messy last night. Are you serious? she asked. She had a strong urge to fart, but held it in. She was oddly concerned that the affronter would think she was being insulting. I am perfectly serious, Professor. The affront and the culture are now at war. Oh, she said. She glanced over at her terminal brooch, lying on an extension of the bed's headboard. Well, the news flash light was winking, right enough. Practically strobing, in fact. Must be urgent indeed, she thought. Shouldn't you be addressing this to the hub? It refuses to communicate, the affronter officer said. We have surrounded it. You have been deemed most senior culture, ex-culture, I should say, representative in its place. This is not a joke, Professor, I am sorry to say. The orbital has been mined with AM warheads. If it proves necessary, your world will be destroyed. The full cooperation of yourself and everybody else on the orbital will help ensure this does not happen. Well, I, I don't accept this honour, Cloud Sheen. I... The affronter had turned and was floating back towards the windows again. It swivelled in the air as it retreated. You don't have to, it said. As I said, you have been deemed. Well, then she said. I deem you to be acting without any authority I care to recognize, and the affronter darted through the air towards her and stopped directly above the bed, making her flinch despite herself. She smelled something cold and toxic. Professor, Cloud Sheen said, this is not an academic debate or some common room word game. You are prisoners and hostages, and all your lives are forfeit. The sooner you understand the realities of the situation, the better. I know as well as you that you are in no way in charge of the orbital, but certain formalities have to be observed regardless of their practical irrelevance. I consider that duty has now been discharged, and frankly that's all that matters, because I have the AM warheads and you don't. It drew quickly away, sucking a cool breeze behind it. It stopped just before the windows again. Lastly, it said, I am sorry to have disturbed you. I thank you personally and on behalf of my crew for the reception party. It was most enjoyable. He left. The curtains, soft in and out, slowly golden. Her heart, she was surprised to discover, was pounding. The attitude adjuster 
woke them one by one, telling each the same story. Accessionary threat near Esperi. Deluge of craft mimicking culture ship configurations. Cooperation of a front. Extreme urgency. Obey me or our front allies if I should be lost. Some of the vessels were immediately suspicious, or at least puzzled. The confirmatory messages from other craft, the no-fixed abode, the different tan and the not invented here, convinced them in every case. Part of the attitude adjuster felt sick. It knew it was doing the right thing in the end, but at a simple surface level, it felt disgust at the deception it was having to foist upon its fellow ships. It tried to tell itself that it would all end with little or no blood spilled and few or no mind deaths, but it knew that there was no guarantee. It had spent years thinking all this through, shortly after the proposition had been put to it seventy years earlier, and had known then accepted then that it might come to this, but it had always hoped it would not. Now the moment was at hand, it was starting to wonder if it had made a mistake, but knew it was too late to turn back now. Better to believe that it had been right then, and now it was merely being short-sighted and squeamish. It could not be wrong. It was not wrong. It had had an open mind, and it had become convinced of the rightness of the course which was being suggested, and in which it would play such an important part. It had done as it had been asked to do. It had watched the affront, studied them, immersed itself in their history, culture, and beliefs. And in all that time, it had achieved a kind of sympathy for them, an empathy even, and at the start, perhaps, a degree of admiration for them but it had also built up a cold and terrible hatred of their ways. In the end, it thought it understood them because it was just a little like them. It was a warship, after all. It was built, designed to glory and destruction when it was considered appropriate. It found, as it was rightly and properly supposed to, an awful beauty in both the weaponry of war and the violence and devastation which that weaponry was capable of inflicting. And yet it knew that attractiveness stemmed from a kind of insecurity, a sort of childishness. It could see that, by some criteria, a warship, just by the perfectly articulated purity of its purpose, was the most beautiful single artifact the culture was capable of producing, and at the same time understood the paucity of moral vision such a judgment implied. To fully appreciate the beauty of a weapon was to admit to a kind of short-sightedness close to blindness, to confess to a sort of stupidity. The weapon was not itself. Nothing was solely itself. The weapon, like anything else, could only finally be judged by the effect it had on others, by the consequences it produced in some outside context, by its place in the rest of the universe. By this measure, the love or just the appreciation of weapons, was a kind of tragedy. The attitude adjuster thought it could see into the souls of the affronters. They were not the happy-go-lucky, life-and-soul-of-the-party grand fellows with a few bad habits they were commonly thought to be. They were not thoughtlessly cruel in the course of seeking to indulge other more benign and even admirable pleasures. They were not merely terrible rascals. They gloried first and foremost in their cruelty. Their cruelty was the point. They were not thoughtless. They knew they hurt their own kind and others, and they reveled in it. It was their purpose. The rest, the robust joviality, the blokish vivacity, was part happy accident, part cunningly exaggerated ploy, the equivalent of an angelic-looking child discovering that a glowing smile will melt the severest adult heart and excuse almost any act, however dreadful. It had agreed to the plan now coming to fruition with a heavy soul. People would die, minds be destroyed because of what it was doing. The ghastly danger was giga-death crime, mass destruction, utter horror. The attitude adjuster had lied. It had deceived, it had acted, by what it knew would be the consensual opinion of all but a few of its peers, with massive dishonour. It was all too well aware its name might live for millennia hence as that of a traitor, as an abhorrence, an abomination. Still, 
it would do what it had become convinced had to be done, because to do otherwise would be to wish an even worse self-hatred upon itself, the ultimate abomination of disgust at oneself. Perhaps, it told itself, as it brought another slumbering Warcraft to wakefulness, the accession would make everything all right. The half-thought was already ironic, but it continued with it anyway. Yes, maybe the accession was the solution. Maybe it really was worth all that was being risked in its name and capable of bringing placid resolution. That would be sweet. The excuse takes over. The cussus belly brings peace. Like fuck, it thought. The ship sneered at itself, examining the idiotic thought and then discarding it with probably less contempt than it deserved. It was, anyway, too late to reconsider now. Too much had been done already. The pittance mind was already dead, choosing self-destruction rather than compromise. The human, who had been the only other conscious sentience in the rock, had been killed, and the destored ships would speed, utterly deceived, to what could well prove to be their doom. The future alone knew who or what else they would take with them. The war had begun, and all the attitude adjuster could do was play out the part it had agreed to play. Another warship mind surfaced to wakefulness. Accessionary threat near Asperi, the attitude adjuster told the newly woken ship. Deluge of craft mimicking culture ship configurations. Cooperation of a front, extreme urgency. Obey me or our affront allies if I should be lost. Confirmatory messages from the GSV, no fixed abode, the GCU different tan, and the MSV not invented here attached. The module Scopella Franqui left the urgencies of the instant behind for a moment and retreated into a kind of simulation of its plight. The craft had a romantic, even sentimental streak, which Gaynar Hofoen had rarely glimpsed in all the two years they had spent together on God's Hole Habitat, and which, indeed, it had deliberately kept hidden for fear of his ridicule. And it saw itself now as being like the Castellan of some small fortified embassy in a teeming barbarian city, far from the civilized lands that were his home. A wise, thoughtful man, technically a warrior, but more of a thinker, one who saw much more of the realities behind the embassy's mission than those in his charge, and who had devoutly hoped that his warrior skills would never be called upon. Well... That time had come. The native soldiers were hammering at the compound's gates right now, and it was only a matter of time before the embassy compound fell. There was treasure in the embassy, and the barbarians would not rest until they had it. The castellan left the parapet where he had looked out upon the besieging forces and retreated to his private chamber. His few troops were already putting up the best defence they could. Nothing he could do or say would do other than hinder them now. His few spies had been dispatched some time ago through secret passageways into the city to do what damage they could once the embassy itself was destroyed, as it surely must be. There was nothing else which awaited his attention, save this one decision. He had already opened the safe and taken out the sealed orders. The paper was in his hand. He read it again. So, it was to be destruction. He had guessed as much, but it was still a shock somehow. It should not have come to this, but it had. He had known the risks. They had been pointed out at the beginning when he had taken up this position. But he had not really imagined for a moment that he would really be faced with either utter dishonour and the vicarious treachery of forced collaboration, or death at his own hand. There was, of course, no real choice. Call it his upbringing. He looked ruefully around the small private chamber that held the memories of home, his library, his clothes and keepsakes. This was him. This was who he was. The same beliefs and principles that had led him here to this lonely outpost required that there was no choice over surrender or death. But there was still one choice to make, and it was a bitter one to be given. He could destroy the embassy, and himself with it, of course, completely, so that all that would be left to the barbarians would be its stones. Or he could take the entire city with him. It was not just a city. In one sense, it was not even principally a city. It was a vast arsenal, a crowded barracks and a busy naval port, altogether an important component to the barbarians' war effort. Its destruction would benefit the side that the Castellan was loyal to, the cause that he absolutely believed in. 
Arguably, it would save lives in the long run. Yet the city had its civilians too. The outnumbering innocents that were the women and children and the subjugated underclasses, not to mention the blameless others from neutral lands who just happened to find themselves caught up in the war through no fault of their own. Had he a right to snuff them out too by destroying the city? He put the piece of paper down. He looked at his reflection in a distant looking-glass. Death. In all this choice there was no doubt about his own fate, only about how he would be remembered. As humanitarian or weakling, as mass murderer or hero. Death. How strange to contemplate it now. It always wondered how he would face it. There was a certain continued existence, of course. He had faith in that, the assurances of the priests that his soul was recorded in a great book somewhere and capable of resurrection. But the precise he he was right now, that would assuredly end, and soon. That was over. Death, he remembered somebody saying once, was a kind of victory. To have lived a long, good life, a life of prodigious pleasure and minimal misery, and then to die, that was to have won. To attempt to hang on forever risked ending up in some as yet unglimpsed horror future. What if you lived forever, and all that had gone before, however terrible things had sometimes appeared to be in the past, however badly people had behaved to each other throughout history, was nothing compared to what was yet to come? Suppose, in the great book of days that told the story of everything, all the gone, done past was merely a bright, happy introduction compared to the main body of the work, an unending tale of unbearable pain scraped in blood on a parchment of living skin. Better to die than risk that. Live well and then die, so that the you that is you now can never be again, and only tricks can recreate something that might think it is you, but is not. The outer gates fell. He heard them go. The castellan stood up and went to the casement. In the courtyard, the barbarian soldiers flowed through to the last line of defence. Soon. The choice. The choice. He could spin a coin, but that would be cheap, unworthy. He walked to the device that would destroy the embassy compound and the city too, if he chose. There was no choice here either, not really. There would be peace again. The only question was when. He could not know if ultimately more people would suffer and die because he was choosing not to destroy the city. But at least this way, the damage and the casualties would be confined to the minimum for the longest possible time. And if in the future he would be judged to have done the wrong thing and to have made the incorrect decision, well, death had the other advantage that he would not be present to suffer that knowledge of that judgment. He double-checked that the device was set so that only the embassy would be destroyed. He waited a moment longer to be sure that he was calm and clear about what he was doing, then as the tears came to his eyes, he activated the device. The module Scopella Franqui self-destructed in a blink of annihilatory energies centred on its AI core, obliterating it entirely. The module itself was blasted into a million pieces. The explosion sent a shiver through the fabric of God's whole habitat that was felt all the way round that great wheel. It took out a significant section of the surrounding inner docks area and caused a rupture in the skin of the engineering compartment beneath. This was quickly repaired. The destroyer, Rip Talon, was damaged and would require a further week in dock, though there were no fatalities or serious injuries on board. The explosion killed five officers and a few dozen soldiers and technicians in the docks and smaller craft alongside the module. A number of semi-aware AI entities were also lost, and their cause, later found to be corrupted by agent entities, the module had succeeded in infiltrating into the habitat systems shortly before its destruction, despite every precaution. These, or their descendants, continued to significantly reduce the habitat's contribution to the war effort for the duration of hostilities. So, what's it like being at war? Scary, when you have every reason to believe you may be sitting next to the real reason it was declared. The GCU, fate amenable to change, floated in a triangular pattern with the two Elentia vessels, Sober Council and Appeal to Reason. 
The two Elent ships had repeatedly attempted to communicate with the accession, entirely without success. The fate was getting nervous, just waiting for the pressure building up with the crews of the two Elentia ships for more intrusive action to overcome the reticence of the craft themselves. The three craft had secretly declared their own little pact over the last few days after the second Elentia ship had appeared on the scene. They had exchanged drone and human avatars, opened up volumes of their mindsets they would not normally have exposed to craft of another society, and pledged not to act without consulting the others. That agreeable agreement would lapse if the Elenchers chose to try to interfere with the accession. It would have to lapse to some extent anyway in a couple of days, when the MSV not invented here arrived, and the fate, suspected, started bossing everybody about. But it was trying desperately to dissuade the two Elenchers ships from doing anything rash in the meantime. Are there any affront warships known to be anywhere in this volume? The appeal to reason asked. No, the fate amenable to change replied. In fact, they've been staying away and telling everybody else to do so as well. I suppose we should have guessed that was suspicious in itself. That's the trouble with people like them, I suppose. Whenever you think you're detecting the first signs of them starting to behave responsibly, it's just them being even more devious and underhand than usual. You think they want the accession? The sober council asked. It's possible. Perhaps they're not coming here, suggested the appeal to reason. Aren't they attacking the whole culture? There are reports of scores of ships and orbitals being taken. I don't know, the fate admitted. It looks like madness to me. They can't defeat the whole culture. But they're saying a ship store at this rock pittance has fallen, the sober council said. Well, yes. Officially, there's still a blackout on that, but off record, of course. If they are coming in this direction, I wouldn't want to be here in about a week's time. So, if we're going to get through to the entity, we'd better do it soon, the appeal to reason sent. Oh, don't start on about that again. You said yourself they might not be coming, the fate began, then broke off. Hold on. Are you getting this? Semi-wide beam, a front base, all trans loop. Attention all craft in Esperi near space. The entity located at... Location sequence enclosed, was first discovered by the affront cruiser Furious Purpose on Trans N4.28.803.8+, and is hereby fully and rightfully claimed on the behalf of the Affront Republic as an integral and fully sovereign affront property, subject to affront laws, edicts, rights, and privileges. In the light of the culture-provoked hostilities now existing between the affront and the culture, the full custodial protection of affront administration has been extended to the forementioned volume, and to that end, an ordinance absolutely prohibiting all non-affront traffic within ten standard light-years around the entity has been issued with immediate effect, and hence all craft inside this volume are ordered to vacate said volume forthwith. All craft and material found to be within this volume will be deemed to be in contravention of affront law and in contempt of the affront supreme committee, thus subjecting themselves to the full punitive might of the affront military. To enforce said ordinance, a hundred-strong war fleet of ex-culture craft, which have chosen to renounce their previous allegiance to the enemy, have been dispatched to the above-mentioned location with instructions ruthlessly to enforce this order. Glory to the affront! So there the Sober Council communicated. That's us told. And they can be here in a week, added the appeal to reason. Hmm. That location they gave, the fate sent. Look where it's centred. Aha, replied the Sober Council. Aha what? asked the appeal to reason. It's not centred on the entity itself, the other alleged ship pointed out. It's just off centre, where whatever happened to that little drone took place. The furious purpose is one of a couple of our front of craft that left here at the same time the fleet did. It could have been following the peace makes plenty, the sober council told the culture ship. It is certainly the ship that returned to Tyr, thirty-six days after whatever happened here. That's a little slow, the fate sent. According to my records, a meteorite-class light cruiser should have been able to do it in... Oh, wait a moment. It had an engine fault. And then while it was on Tyr, it suffered some sort of... Hmm. Oh, look! The accession was doing something. Stuttered type point M32 tra point at 4.28.883.1344 From GSV anticipation of a new lover's arrival, the, to GSV sabbaticaler, no fixed abode. Right. I have thought about this. No, 
I will not help in trapping the serious callers only or the shoot them later. I reported my previous misgivings and the fact that I had shared them with the other two craft because in the course of my investigations into what I perceived as a dangerous conspiracy, I became convinced of the need to deal decisively with the affront. I still do not approve of the way this has been done, but by the time your plans became uncovered, it would arguably have caused more damage attempting to arrest them than letting them go ahead. I still find it hard to believe that the rogue ship which tricked the ship store at Pittance was acting alone, and that you merely took advantage of the ruse, despite your assurances. However, I have no evidence to the contrary. I have given my word, and I will not go public with all this, but I will consider that agreement dependent on the continued well-being and freedom from persecution of both the serious callers only and the shoot them later, as well, of course, as being contingent upon my own continued integrity. I don't doubt you will think me either paranoid or ridiculous for systemizing this arrangement with various other friends and colleagues, particularly given the hostilities which commenced yesterday. I am thinking of taking some sabbatical time myself soon and going off course schedule. I shall, in any event, be quitting the group. Stuttered type point M32, tra point at 4.28.883.2182. From GSV sabbaticaler, no fixed abode, to GSV anticipation of a new lover's arrival, thee. I understand completely. There is, you must, must believe, no desire on our part to cause any harm to you or the two craft you mention. We have been concerned purely to expedite the resolution of this unfortunate state of affairs. There will be no recriminations, no witch hunts, no pogroms or purges on our behalf. With your assurance that this ends here, we are perfectly quintessentially content. A great relief. Let me add that it is hard for me to find the words to communicate to you the depth of my... Our gratitude in this matter. You have shown irreproachable moral integrity, combined with a truly objective open-mindedness. Virtues that all too often are regarded as being as tragically incompatible as they are infinitely desirable. You are an example to all of us. I beg you not to leave the group. We would lose too much. Please reconsider. No one would deny that you have earned a thousand rests, but please take pity on those who would dare ask you to forgo one for their own selfish benefit. Thank you. However, my decision is irrevocable. Should I still be welcome, I may hope for a request to rejoin you at some point in the future, should some exceptional situation stimulate the thought that I might again be of service. My dear, dear ship, if you really must go, please do so with our fondest regards, so long as you swear never to forget that your invitation to restore your wisdom and probity to our small team stands in perpetuity. Chapter 6 Gena Hafoen spent quite a lot of time on the toilet. Alvesage was hell when she was cross, and she had been in a state of virtually permanent crossness ever since he'd properly woken up. In fact, since well before. She'd been cross, cross with him, while he'd been unconscious, which seemed unfair somehow. If he slept too long or day-dozed, she got even crosser, so he went to the toilet for fairly long intervals. The toilet in a nine-person module consisted of a sort of thick flap that hinged down from a recess in the back wall of the small craft's single cabin. A semi-cylindrical field popped into being when the flap was in place, isolating the enclosed space from the rest of the cabin, and there was just enough room to make the necessary adjustments to one's clothing and stand or sit in comfort. Usually some pleasantly bland music played, but Gaynor Hafoen preferred the perfect silence the field enclosure produced. He sat there in the gentle, pleasantly perfumed downward breeze, not, as a rule, actually doing anything, but content to have some time to himself. Stuck on a tiny but perfectly comfortable module with a beautiful, intelligent young woman. It ought to be a recipe for unbridled bliss. It was practically a fantasy. In fact, it was sheer hell. He'd felt trapped before, but never like this. Never so completely, never so helplessly. Never, with somebody who seemed to find him quite so annoying just to be in the presence of. He couldn't even blame the drone. The drone was, in a sense, in the way, but he didn't mind. Just as well it was, in fact. He didn't know what Elvisage might have done to him if it hadn't been in the way. Hell, he quite liked the drone. The girl he could easily fall in love with, and in the right circumstances, certainly admire and be impressed by, and, yes, perfectly possibly like, even be friends with. But right now, 
He didn't like her any more than she liked him, and she really didn't like him a lot. He supposed these were just not the right circumstances. The right circumstances would involve them both being somewhere extremely civilized and cultured, with lots of other people around, and things happening and stuff to do, and opportunities to choose when and where to get to know each other. Not cooped up. Grief. And it was only for two days so far, but it felt more like a month. In a small module, in the middle of a war, with no apparent idea where they were supposed to go, and all their plans seemingly thwarted. It probably didn't help that he was effectively their prisoner either. So, who was the first girl? he asked her. The one outside the Sublimer's place. Probably a C, Ulva Seish told him grumpily. She glared back at the drone. The two humans were in the same seats they'd been in when he'd first woken up. The floor of the cabin area behind them could contort and produce various combinations of seats, couches, tables, and so on. But every now and again, they just sat in the forward-facing seats, looking at the screen and the stars. The drone, Chert Line, sat oblivious on the floor of the cabin, taking no apparent notice of the girl's glare. The drone seemed to be glare-proof. Somehow, it was allowed to get away with being uncommunicative. Gaynar Hafoan sat back in the seat. The stars ahead looked the same as they had a few minutes ago. The module wasn't really heading anywhere purposefully. It was just moving away from Tyr, down one of the many corridors approved by Tyr traffic control, as free from warships and or volume warnings or restrictions. The girl and the drone hadn't allowed him to contact Tyr or anybody else. They had been in touch with what sounded like a ship mind, communicating by screen-written messages he wasn't allowed to see. Once or twice, the girl and the drone had gone quiet and still together, obviously in touch through its communicator and a neural lace. In theory, he might have been able to wrest control of the module from them at such a point, but in practice it would have been futile. The module had its own semi-sentient systems, which he had no way of subverting, and little chance of arguing round, even if he had somehow got the better of the girl and the drone. And anyway, where was he supposed to go? Tear was out. He had no idea where the grey area or the sleeper service were, and suspected that probably nobody else knew where the two ships were either. He assumed S.C. would be looking for him. Better to let himself be found. Besides, when they'd finally released him from the chair he'd been secured to while he'd been unconscious, the drone had shown him an old but shinily mean-looking knife missile it contained within its casing, and given him a brief but nasty stinging sensation on his left little finger, that it assured him was about a thousandth of the pain its effector was capable of inflicting on him if he tried anything silly. He had assured the machine that he was no warrior, and that any martial skills he might have been born with had entirely atrophied at the expense of an overdeveloped sense of self-preservation. So, he was content to let them get on with it when they communicated silently. Made a welcome change, in fact. Anyway, whatever it was they had discovered through all this communicating, they didn't seem terribly happy with it. The girl, in particular, seemed upset. He got the impression she felt cheated, that she'd discovered she'd been lied to. Perhaps because of that, she was telling him things she wouldn't have told him otherwise. He tried to put together what she'd just said about special circumstances with what she'd already let him know. His head ached briefly with the effort. He'd hit it when he'd fallen out of the trap in Night City. He was still trying to work out what happened there. But I thought you said you were with S.C., he said. He couldn't help it. He knew it would just annoy her again, but he was still confused. I said, she hissed through gritted teeth, that I thought I was working for S.C. She looked to one side and sighed heavily, then turned back to him. Maybe I am. Maybe I was. Maybe there's different bits of S.C. Maybe something else entirely. I just don't know. Don't you understand? So who sent you? he asked, crossing his arms. The own skin jacket slid round his torso. The module's bio unit was cleaning his shirt. The suit still looked pretty good, he thought. The girl hadn't changed out of her jeweled spacesuit, though she had used the module's toilet rather than whatever built in units the suit had. She looked less and less like Dajil Gillian every hour, he thought. Her face becoming younger and finer and more beautiful all the time. It was a fascinating transformation to watch, and if the circumstances had been different, he'd have been aching at least to test the waters with her to see if there was any sort of mutuality of attraction here. 
but the circumstances were as they were, and right now the last thing he wanted to do was give her any impression he was ogling her. I told you who sent me, she said, her voice cold. A mind, with the help. Well, it looks more like collusion now, actually, she said with an insincere smile, of my homeworld's mind. She took a deep breath, then set her lips in as tight a line as their fullness would permit. I had my own worship for grief's sake, she said bitterly, addressing the stars on the screen ahead of them. Is it any wonder I thought that it was all SC arranged? She glanced back at the silent drone, then looked at him again. Now we're told our ship's fucked off, and we have to keep quiet about where we are, and the sort of trouble we had getting you off tier. She shook her head. Looked like SC to me. Not that I know that much, but the machine thinks so too, she said, jerking her head to indicate the drone again. She looked him down and up. Wish we'd left you there now. Well, so do I, he said, trying to sound reasonable. She'd got to tear a few days before him, sent to look for him, in effect given a blank check, and yet not able to find out where he was the easy way through just asking, hence the business with the pondrosaur, which made sense if it wasn't special circumstances which had sent her, because it was S.C. who'd been looking after him on tear, and why would they be trying to kidnap him from themselves? And yet she'd had her own warship, apparently, and been given the intelligence that had led her to tear to intercept him in the first place. Information S.C. would naturally restrict to a small number of trusted minds. Mystifying. So, she said, what exactly were you supposed to be doing after you left Tyr? Or was this rather pathetic attempt to reclaim your last youth by trying to seduce women who looked like an old flame the totality of your mission? He smiled as tolerantly as he could. Sorry, he said. I can't tell you. Her eyes narrowed further. You know, she said, they might just ask us to throw you outboard. He allowed himself to sit back, looking surprised and hurt. A little shiver of real fear did make itself felt in his guts. You wouldn't, would you? he asked. She looked forward at the stars again, eyebrows gathered, mouth set in a downturned line. No, she admitted, but I'd enjoy thinking about it. There was silence for a while. He was conscious of her breathing, though he looked in vain at the attractively sculpted chest of her suit for any sign of movement. Suddenly, her foot clunked down on the carpet beneath her jewel-encrusted boot. What were you supposed to be doing? she demanded angrily, turning to face him. Why did they want you? Fuck it! I told you why I was there. Come on, tell me. I'm sorry, he sighed. She was already starting to blush with anger. Oh, no, here we go, he thought. Tantrum time again. Then the drone jerked up into the air behind them, and something flashed round the edges of the module screen. Hello in there, said a large, deep voice all around them. Chapter 7 Stuttered tight point M32 tra point at 4.28.883.4700 From GSV anticipation of a new lover's arrival, the to LSV, serious callers only. I regret to inform you that I have changed my position concerning the so-called conspiracy concerning the Asperi accession and the affront. It is now my judgment that while there may have been certain irregularities of jurisdiction and of operational ethics involved, these were of an opportunistic rather than a conspiratorial nature. Further, I am, as I have always been, of the opinion that while the niceties of normal moral constraints should be our guides, they must not be our masters. There are inevitably occasions when such, if I may characterize them so, civilian considerations must be set aside. And indeed, is this not what the very phrase and title special circumstances implies? The better to facilitate actions which, while distasteful and regrettable perhaps in themselves, might reasonably be seen as reliably leading to some strategically desirable state or outcome no rational person would argue against. It is my profoundly held conviction that the situation regarding the affront is of this highly specialized and rare nature, and therefore merits the measures and policy currently being employed by the minds you and I had previously suspected of indulging in some sort of grand conspiracy. I call upon you to talk with our fellows in the interesting times, gang, whom you have, 
unjustly, I now believe, distrusted with a view to facilitating an accord which will allow all parties to work together towards a satisfactory outcome both to this regrettable and unnecessary misunderstanding and perhaps to the conflict that has now been initiated by the affront. For myself, I intend to go into a retreat for some time, starting immediately from the end of this signal. I shall no longer be in a position to correspond. However, messages may be left for me with the Independent Retreats Council, ex-culture section, and will be reviewed every hundred days or thereabouts. I wish you well, and hope that my decision might help precipitate a reconciliation I devoutly wish will happen. Stuttered tight point. M32 tra point at N4.28.883.6723 From LSV serious callers only to eccentric shoot them later. Mate, take a look at the enclosed bullshit from the AOANL's A, signal enclosed. I almost hope it's been taken over. If this is the way it really feels, I'd feel slightly worse. Stuttered type point M32, tra point at 4.28.883.6920. From eccentric, shoot them later, to LSV, serious callers only. Oh dear, now we're both really under threat. I'm heading into the Hamomdan fleet base at Ara. I suggest you seek sanctuary as well. As a precaution, I am distributing locked copies of all our signals, researches, and suspicions to a variety of trustworthy minds, with instructions that they only be opened in the event of my demise. This I also urge you to do. Our only alternative is to go public, and I am not convinced we have sufficient evidence of a non-circumstantial nature. This is despicable. To be on the run from our own kind, our own peer minds. Me to my miffed. Personally, I'm running for a nice sunny orbital, diaglyph enclosed. I, too, have deposited all the facts on this matter with friends, mine specialising in archiving, and the more reliable news services. I agree we cannot yet brute our suspicions abroad. There probably never was a proper moment for that, but if there was, the war has negated its relevance, as well as the sleeper service in what has become my daily attempt to contact it. Who knows? Another opportunity may present itself once the dust has cleared from around the accession if it ever does, if there is anyone left to witness it. Oh, well, it's out of our fields now. Best of luck, like they say. Chapter 8 The avatar Amorphia moved one of its catapults forward an octagon, in front of the woman's leading tower. The noise of solid wooden wheels rumbling and squeaking along on equally solid axles and of lashed together wooden spars and planks flexing and creaking filled the room. A curious smell, which might have been wood, rose gently from the board cube. Dajil Gillian sat forward in her fabulously sculpted chair, one hand absently tapping her belly gently, the other at her mouth. She sucked at one finger, her brows creased in concentration. She and Amorphia sat in the main room of her new accommodation aboard the GCU, Jaundiced Outlook, which had been restructured to mimic precisely the layout of the tower she had lived in for nearly forty years. The big, round room, capped by its transparent dome, resounded, between the sound effects produced by the GameCube, to the noise of rain. The surrounding screens showed recordings of the creatures Dajil had studied, swam and floated with during most of those four decades. All around, the woman's collected curios and mementos were placed and set just where they had been in the tower by its lonely sea. In the broad grate, a log fire crackled exuberantly. Dajil thought for a while, then took a cavalarian and shifted it across the board to the noise of thundering hooves and the smell of sweat. It came to a halt by a baggage train, undefended save for some irregulars. Amorphia sat blackly folded on a small stool on the other side of the board, went very still, then it moved an invisible. Dajil looked round the board, trying to work out what all the Avatar's recent invisible moves were leading up to. She shrugged. The cavalry piece took the Irregulars almost without loss, to the sound of iron clashing on iron and screams and the smell of blood. Amorphia made another invisible move. Nothing happened for a moment. Then there was an almost subsonic rumbling sound. Dajil's tower collapsed, sinking through the octagon in the board in a convincing-looking cloud of dust and the floor-shaking sound of grinding, crunching rocks and more screams. A lot of the important moves seemed to be accompanied by those. A smell of turned-over earth and stone dust filled the air. 
Amorphia looked up almost guiltily. Thappers, it said, and shrugged. Dajil cocked one eyebrow. Hmm, she said. She surveyed the new situation. With the tower gone, the way lay open to her heartland. It didn't look good. Think I should sue for peace? she asked. Shall I ask the ship? the Avatar asked. Dajil sighed. I suppose so, she sighed. The Avatar glanced down at the board again. It looked up. Seven-eighths chance it would go to me, the Avatar told the woman. She sat back in the great chair. It's yours, then, she said. She leant forward briefly and picked up another tower. She studied it. The Avatar sat back, looking moderately pleased with itself. Are you happy here, Dajil? it asked. Thank you. Yes, she replied. She returned her attention to the miniature tower piece held in her fingers. She was silent for a while, then said, So, what is going to happen, Amorphia? Can you tell me yet? The Avatar gazed steadily at the woman. We're heading very quickly towards the war zone, it said, in a strange, almost childish voice. Then it sat forward, inspecting her closely. War zone, Dajil said, glancing at the board. There is a war, the Avatar confirmed, nodding. It assumed a grim expression. Why? Where? Between whom? Because of a thing called an accession, around the place where we are heading, between the culture and the affront. It went on to explain a little of the background. Dajil turned the little tower model over and over in her hands, frowning at it. Eventually she asked, Is this accession thing really as important as everybody seems to think? The avatar looked thoughtful for just a moment, then it spread its arms and shrugged. Does it really matter? it said. The woman frowned again, not understanding. Doesn't it matter more than anything? It shook its head. Some things mean too much to matter, it said. It stood up and stretched. Remember, Dajil, it told her. You can leave at any point. This ship will do as you wish. I'll stick around for now, she told it. She looked briefly up at it. When a couple of days, it told her, all being well. It stood looking down at her for a while, watching her turn the small tower over and over in her fingers. Then it nodded and turned and quietly walked out of the room. She hardly noticed it go. She leant forward and placed the small tower on an octagon towards the rear margin of the board, on a region of shore bordering the hem of blue that was supposed to represent the sea, near where, a few moves earlier, a ship piece of Amorpheus had landed a small force which had established a bridgehead. She had never placed a tower in such a position in all their games. The board interpreted the move with the sound of screams once more, but this time the screams were the plaintive, plangent calls of seabirds calling out over the sound of heavy, pounding surf. A sharply briny odour filled the air above the board cube, and she was back there, back then, with the sound of the seabirds and the smell of the dashing wild sea tangled in her hair, and the growing child continually heavy and sporadically lively, almost violent with its sudden, startling kicks in her belly. She sat, cross-legged on the pebble shore, the tower at her back, the sun, a great round red shield of fire, plunging into the darkly unruly sea and throwing a blood-coloured curtain across the line of the cliffs a couple of kilometres inland. She gathered her shawl about her and ran a hand through her long black hair as best she could. It stuck, held up by knots. She didn't try to pull them out. She'd rather look forward to the long, slow process of having them combed and cajoled and carefully teased out later in the evening by buyer. Waves crashed on the shingle and rocks of the shore to either side of her in great, sighing, soughing intakings of what sounded like the breath of some great sea creature. A gathering, deepening sound that ended in the small moment of half-silence before each great wave fell and burst against the tumbled, growling slope of rocks and stones, pushing and pulling and rolling the giant glistening pebbles in thudding concussions of water, forcing its way amongst their spaces, while the rocks slid and smacked and cracked against each other. 
Directly in front of her, where there was a raised shelf of rock just under the surface of the sea, the waves breaking on the shallower slope in front of her were smaller, almost friendlier, and the main force of the grumbling, swelling ocean was met fifty metres out at a rough semicircle marked by a line of frothing surf. She clasped her hands palm up on her lap beneath the bulge of her belly and closed her eyes. She breathed deeply, the ozone and the brine sharp in her nostrils, connecting her to the sea's salty restlessness, making her, in her mind, again part of its great fluid coalescing of constancy and changefulness, imbuing her thoughts with something of that heaving, sheltering vastness, that world-cleaving cradle of layered, night-making depth. Inside her mind, in the semi-trance she now assumed, she stepped smilingly down through her own fluid layers of protection and confirmation to where her baby lay, healthy and growing, half awake, half asleep, wholly beautiful. Her own genetically altered body gently interrogated the placental processes protecting the joined but subtly different chemistries and inheritance of her child's body from her own immune system, and carefully, fairly managing the otherwise selfishly voracious demands the baby made upon her body's resources of blood, sugars, proteins, minerals, and energy. The temptation was always to tamper, to fiddle with the settings that regulated everything, as though by such meddling one proved how carefully painstaking and watchful one was being. But she always resisted, content that there were no warning signs, no notice that some imbalance was threatening either her health or that of the fetus, and happy to leave the body's own systemic wisdom to prevail of the brain's desire to intervene. Shifting the focus of her concentration, she was able to use another designed in sense no creature from any part of her typically distributed cultural inheritance had ever possessed to look upon her soon-to-be child, modelling its shape in her mind from the information provided by a subset of specialised organisms swimming in the as yet unbroken water surrounding the fetus. She saw it hunched and curled in an orbed spectrum of smooth pinks, crouched round its umbilical link with her as though it was concentrating on its supply of blood, trying to increase its flow rate or nutritional saturation. She marvelled at it, as she always did, at its bulbously headed beauty, at its strange air of blankly formless intensity. She counted its fingers and toes, inspected the tightly closed eyelids, smiled at the tiny budded cleft that spoke of the cell's unprompted selection of congenital femaleness. Half her, half something strange and foreign. A new collection of matter and information to present to the universe and to which it in turn would be presented. Different, arguably equal parts of that great, ever-repetitive, ever-changing jurisdiction of being. Reassured that all was well, she left the dimly aware being to continue its purposeful, unthinking growth, and returned to the part of the real world where she was sitting on the pebbled beach and the waves fell loud and foaming amongst the tumbled, rumbling rocks. Baya was there when she opened her eyes, standing knee-deep in the small waves just in front of her, wet-suited, golden hair damply straggled in long ringlets, face dark against the display of ruddy sunset behind, found just in the act of taking off the suit's face mask. Evening, she said, smiling. Baya nodded and splashed up out of the water, sitting down beside her, putting an arm around her. You okay? She held the fingers of the hand over her shoulder. Both fine, she said. And the gang? Baya laughed, peeling off the suit's feet to reveal wrinkled pink-brown toes. Ska Ilipka has decided he likes the idea of walking on land. Says he's ashamed his ancestors went out of the ocean and then went back in again as if the air was too cold. He wants us to make him a walking machine. The others think he's crazy, though there is some support for the idea of them all somehow going flying together. I left them a couple more screens and increased some of the access to the flight archives. They gave me this for you. Baya handed her something from the suit's side pouch. Oh, thank you. She put the small figurine in one palm and turned it over carefully with her fingers, inspecting it by the fading red light at the day's end. It was beautiful, worked out of some soft stone to perfectly resemble their idea of what they thought a human ought to look like. Naturally flippered feet, legs joined to the knees, body fatter, shoulders slender, neck thicker, head narrower, hairless. 
It did look like her. The face, for all that it was distorted, bore a distinct resemblance. Probably Gaistic Takat's work. There was a delicacy of line and a certain humour about the figurine's facial expression that spoke to her of the old female's personality. She held the little figure up in front of Baya. Think it looks like me? Well, you're certainly getting that fat. Oh, she said, slapping Baya lightly on the shoulder. She glanced down at her lap, reaching to pat her belly. I think you're starting to show yourself at last, she said. Baya smiled, her face still freckled with droplets of water, catching the dying light. She looked down, holding Dajil's hand, patting her belly. Nah, she said, rising to her feet. She held out a hand to Dajil and glanced round to the tower. You coming in, or are you going to sit around communing with the ocean swell all evening? We've got guests, remember? She took a breath to say something, then held up her hand. Baya helped pull her up. She felt suddenly heavy, clumsy, and unwieldy. Her back hurt dully. Yes, let's go in, eh? They turned towards the lonely tower. Part 9. Unacceptable Behaviour Chapter 1 The accession's links with the two regions of the energy grid just fell away. Twin collapsing pinnacles of fluted skein fabric sinking back into the grid like idealised renderings of some spent explosion at sea. Both layers of the grid oscillated for a few moments, again like some abstractly perfect liquid, then lay still. The waves produced on the grid surfaces damped quickly to nothing, absorbed. The accession floated free on the skein of real space, otherwise as enigmatic as ever. There was, for a while, silence between the three watching ships. Eventually, the sober council asked, Is that it? So it would appear, the fate amenable to change replied. It felt... Terrified, elated, disappointed all at once. Terrified to be in the presence of something that could do what it had just observed. Elated to have witnessed it and taken the measurements it had. There were data here, in the velocity of the skin grid collapse, in the apparent viscosity of the grid's reaction to the links decoupling, that would fuel genuinely, utterly original science. And disappointed, because it had a sneaking feeling that that was it. The accession was going to sit here like this for a while, still doing nothing. Seemingly endless boredom, instance of blinding terror, endless boredom again. With the accession around, you didn't need a war. The fate amenable to change started relaying all the data it had collected on the grid skein link's collapse to a variety of other ships without even collating it properly first. Get it out of this one location first, just in case. Another part of its mind was thinking about it, though. That thing reacted, it told the other two craft. To the affront signal, the appeal to reason sent. I was wondering about that. Could this be the state in which the peace makes plenty discover the entity? The sober council asked. It could indeed, couldn't it? The fate amenable to change agreed. The time has come, the appeal to reason sent. I'm sending in a drone. No! You wait until the accession assumes the configuration it probably possessed when it overpowered your comrade, and then you decide to approach it just as it must have? Are you quite mad? We cannot just sit here any longer, the appeal to reason told the culture craft. The war is days away from us. We have tried every form of communication known to life and had nothing in return. We must do more. Launching drone in two seconds, do not attempt to interfere with it. Chapter 2 Well, we were going to have them at the same time. It seemed, I don't know, more romantic, I suppose, more symmetrical. Dajil laughed lightly and stroked Baya's arm. They were in the big circular room at the top of the tower, Cran, Aiz, and Tuli and her and Baya. She stood by the log fire with Baya. She looked to see if Baya wanted to take up the story, but she just smiled and drank from her wine goblet. But then, when we thought about it, Dajil continued, it did kind of seem a bit crazy. Two brand new babies and just the two of us here to look after them, and first-time mothers. Only-time mothers, 
Bayer muttered, making a face into her goblet. The others laughed. Dajil stroked Bayer's arm again. Well, however it turns out, we'll see. But you see, this way we can have... Whatever time in between, Ren being born and our other child. She looked at Bayer, smiling warmly. We haven't decided on the other name yet. Anyway, she went on, doing it this way will give me time to recover and get the two of us used to coping with the baby before Bayer has his. Well, hers, she said laughing, and put her arm round her partner's shoulder. Yes, Bayer said, glancing at her. We can practice on yours and then get it right with mine. Oh, you, Dajil said, squeezing Bayer's arm. The other woman smiled briefly. The term used for what Dajil and Bayer were doing was mutualing. It was one of the things you could do when you were able, as virtually every human in the culture had been able to do for many millennia, to change sex. It took anything up to a year to alter yourself from a female to a male, or vice versa. The process was painless, and set in action simply by thinking about it. You went into the sort of trance-like state the Gilles had accessed earlier that evening, when she'd looked within herself to check on the state of her fetus. If you looked in the right place in your mind, there was an image of yourself as you were now. A little thought would make the image change from your present gender to the opposite sex. You came out of the trance, and that was it. Your body would already be starting to change, glands sending out the relevant viral and hormonal signals, which would start the gradual process of conversion. Within a year, a woman who had been capable of carrying a child, who indeed might have been a mother, would be a man fully capable of fathering a child. Most people in the culture changed sex at some point in their lives, though not all had children while they were female. Generally, people eventually changed back to their congenital sex, but not always, and some people cycled back and forth between male and female all their lives, while some settled for an androgynous in-between state finding there a comfortable equanimity. Long-term relationships, in a society where people generally lived for at least three and a half centuries, were necessarily of a different nature from those in the more primitive civilizations, which had provided the culture's original bloodstock. Lifelong monogamy was not utterly unknown, but it was exceptionally unusual. A couple staying together for the duration of an offspring's entire childhood and adolescence was a more common occurrence, but still not the norm. The average culture child was close to its mother, and almost certainly knew who its father was, assuming it was not in effect a clone of its mother, or had in place of a father's genes surrogated material which the mother had effectively manufactured. But it would probably be closer to the aunts and uncles who lived in the same extended familial grouping, usually in the same house, extended apartment or estate. There were partnerships which were intended to last, however, and one of the ways that certain couples chose to emphasize their codependence was by synchronizing their sex changes, and at different points playing both parts in the sexual act. A couple would have a child, then the man would become female, and the woman would become male, and they would have another child. A more sophisticated version of this was possible due to the amount of control over one's reproductive system, which still further historic genetic tinkering had made possible. It was possible for a culture female to become pregnant, but then, before the fertilized egg had transferred from her ovary to the womb, begin the slow change to become a man. The fertilized egg did not develop any further, but neither was it necessarily flushed away or reabsorbed. It could be held, contained, put into a kind of suspended animation so that it did not divide any further, but waited, still inside the ovary. That ovary, of course, became a testicle, but with a bit of cellular finessing and some intricate plumbing, the fertilized egg could remain safe, viable and unchanging in the testicle, while that organ did its bit in inseminating the woman who had been a man and whose sperm had done the original fertilizing. The man who had been a woman then changed back again. If the woman who had been a man also delayed the development of her fertilized egg, then it was possible to synchronize the growth of the two fetuses and the birth of the babies. To some people in the culture, this admittedly rather long-winded and time-consuming process was quite simply the most beautiful and perfect way for two people to express their love for one another. To others, it was slightly gross and, well, tacky. The odd thing was that until he'd met and fallen in love with Dajil, 
Gaynor Hafoen had been firmly of the latter opinion. He decided twenty years earlier, before he was even fully sexually mature and really knew his own mind about most things, that he was going to stay male all his life. He could see that being able to change sex was useful, and that some people would even find it exciting, but he thought it was weak somehow. But then, Dagil had changed Bayer's mind. They had met aboard the general contact unit, recent convert. She was approaching the end of a twenty-five-year contact career. He just starting a ten-year commitment, which he might or might not request to extend when the time came. He had been the rake, she the unavailable old woman. He had decided when he joined contact that he'd tried to bed as many women as possible, and from the first had set about doing just that, with a single-minded determination and dedication many women found highly fetching just by itself. Then, on the recent convert, he cut his usual sway through the female half of the ship's human crew, but was brought to a sudden stop by Dajil Gillian. It wasn't that she wouldn't sleep with him. There had been lots of women he'd asked who'd refused him for a variety of reasons, and he'd never felt any resentment towards them, or been any less likely to eventually count them as friends than the women he had made love to. It was that she told him she did find him attractive and ordinarily would have invited him to her bed, but wasn't going to because he was so promiscuous. He'd found this a slightly preposterous reason, but had just shrugged and got on with life. They became friends, good friends. They got on brilliantly. She became his best friend. He kept expecting that this friendship would, as a matter of course, include sex, even if it was just once. But it didn't. It seemed so obvious to him, so natural and normal and right that it should. Not falling into bed together after some wonderfully enjoyable social occasion or sports session or just a night's drinking seemed positively perverse to him. She told him he was destroying himself with his licentiousness. He didn't understand her. She was destroying him in a way. He was still seeing other women, but he was spending so much time with her because they were such friends, but also because she had become a challenge, and he had decided he would win her whatever it took, that his usual packed schedule of seductions, affairs and relationships had suffered terribly. He wasn't able to concentrate properly on all these other women who were or ought to be demanding his attention. She told him he spread himself too thinly. He wasn't really destroying himself. He was stopping himself from developing. He was still in a sort of childish state, a boy-like phase, where numbers mattered more than anything, where obsessive collecting, taking, enumerating, cataloguing all spoke of a basic immaturity. He could never grow and develop as a human being until he went beyond this infantile obsession with penetration and possession. He told her he didn't want to get beyond this stage. He loved it. Anyway, even though he loved it and wouldn't care if he remained promiscuous until he was too old to do it at all, the chances were that he would change, sometime, eventually, over the course of the next three centuries or so of life which he could expect. There was plenty of time to do all this damned growing and developing. It would take care of itself. He wasn't going to try and force the pace. If all this sexual activity was something he had to get out of his system before he could properly mature, then she had a moral duty to help him get rid of it as quickly as possible, starting right now. She pushed him away as ever. He didn't understand, she told him. It wasn't a finite supply of promiscuity he was draining. It was an ever-replenishing fixation that was eating up his potential for future personal growth. She was the still point in his life he needed, or at least a still point. He would probably need many more in his life. She had no illusions about that. But for now, she was it. She was the rock the river of his turbulent passion had to break around. She was his lesson. They both specialized in the same area, exobiology. He listened to her talk sometimes and wondered whether it was possible to feel more truly alien towards another being than it was to someone of one's own species who ought to think in an at least vaguely similar way, but instead thought utterly differently. He could learn about an alien species, study them, get under their skin, under their carapaces, inside their spines or their membranes or whatever else you had to penetrate, ah, to get to know them, get to understand them. And he could always, eventually, do that. He could start to think like them, start to feel things the way they would, anticipate their reactions to things, make a decent guess at what they were thinking at any given moment. It was an ability he was proud of. Just by being so different from the creature you were studying, 
You started out at a sufficiently great angle, it seemed to him, to be able to make that penetration and get inside their minds. With somebody who was ninety-nine percent the same as you, you were too close sometimes. You couldn't draw far enough away from them to come in at a steep enough angle. You just slid off every time in a succession of glancing contacts. No getting through. Frustration upon frustration. Then a post had come up on a world called Teleturia. A long-term situation, spending anything up to five years with an aquatic species called the Katik, which the culture wanted to help develop. It was the sort of non-ship-based contact post people were often offered at the end of their career. Dajil was regarded as a natural for it. It would mean one, maybe two people, staying on the planet, otherwise alone, save for the Katik, for all that time. There would be the occasional visit from others, but little time off and no extended holidays. The whole point was to establish a long-term personal relationship with Katik individuals. It wasn't something to be entered into lightly. It would mean commitment. Dajil asked to be considered for the post and was accepted. Bayer couldn't believe Dajil was leaving the recent convert. He told her she was doing it to annoy him. She told him he was being ridiculous and unbelievably self-centered. She was doing it because it was an important job and it was something she felt she'd be good at. It was also something she was ready for now. She had done her bit scudding around the galaxy in GCUs and enjoyed every moment, but now she had changed and it was time to take on something more long-term. She would miss him and she hoped he would miss her, though he certainly wouldn't miss her for as long as he claimed he would or even as long as he thought he would. But it was time to move on. Time to do something different. She was sorry she hadn't been able to stick around longer, being his still point, but that was just the way it was, and this was too great an opportunity to miss. Later, he could never remember exactly when he'd made the decision to go with her, but he did. Perhaps he had just started to believe some of the things she'd been telling him, but he too just felt that it was time to do something different, even if he had only been in contact for a short while. It was the hardest thing he'd ever done. Harder than any seduction, with the possible exception of hers. To start with, he had to convince her it was a good idea. She wasn't even initially flattered, not for a second. It was a terrible idea, she told him. He was too young, too inexperienced. It was far, far too early in his contact stint. He wasn't impressing her. He was being stupid. It wasn't romantic. It wasn't sensible. It wasn't flattering. It wasn't practical. It was just idiotic. And if by some miracle they did let him go along with her, he needn't assume that just making this great commitment would ensure she'd sleep with him. This didn't prove anything except that he was as foolish as he was vain. Chapter 3 The general contact unit, Grey Area, didn't hold with avatars. It spoke through a slaved drone. Young lady. Don't you young lady me in that patronizing tone, Alva Sage said, putting her hands on her suited gem-encrusted hips. She still had the suit helmet on, though with the visor plate hinged up. They were in the GCU's hangar space with a variety of modules, satellites, and assorted paraphernalia. It looked like the space was fairly crowded at the best of times, but it was even more cluttered now with the small module that had belonged to the ROU Frank Exchange of View sitting in it. Ms. Seish, the drone purred on, unaffected. I was not supposed to pick up you or your colleague, D.N. Chertline. I have done so because you were effectively adrift in the middle of a war zone. If you really insist... We weren't adrift, Alva said, waving her arms around and pointing back at the module. We were in that. It's got engines, you know. Yes, very slow ones. I did say effectively adrift. The ship slaved drone, a casingless assemblage of components floating at head height, turned to the drone chert line. DN chert line, you too are welcome. Would it be possible for you to attempt to persuade your colleague, Ms. Sage? And don't talk about me as if I'm not here either, Alva said, stamping one foot. The deck under Gaynor Hafoen's feet resounded. He had never been more glad to see a GCU. Release from that damned module and Alva Sage's abrasive moodiness. Bliss. The grey area had welcomed him first, he'd noticed. Finally, he was back on course. From here to the sleeper, get the job done, and then, if the war wasn't totally fucking things up, offer some R&R &R somewhere while things were settled. 
He still found it hard to believe the affront had actually declared war on the culture. But assuming they really had then, once it was all over and the affront had been put in their place, culture people with affront experience would be needed to help manage the peace and the culturization of the affront. In a way, he would be sorry to see it. He liked them the way they were, but if they were crazy enough to take on the culture, maybe they did need teaching a lesson. A bit of enforced niceness might do them some good. They weren't going to like it, though, because it would be a niceness that was enforced leniently, patiently and gracefully, with a sort of unflappable self-certainty the culture couldn't help displaying when all its statistics proved that it really was doing the right thing. Probably the affront would rather have been pulverised and then dictated to. Anyway, whatever else happened between now and then, Gaynor Hafoen was sure they'd give a good account of themselves. Alva Seish was not doing badly in that line herself. Now she was demanding she and the drone be put back in the module immediately and allowed to continue on their way. Given that the first thing she'd done when the grey area had contacted them was demand to be rescued and taken aboard at once, this was a little cheeky, but the girl obviously didn't see it that way. This is piracy, she hollered. Alva, the drone chirped line said calmly. And don't you go taking its side. I'm not taking its side. I'm just you are so. The argument went on. The ship's slave drone looked from the girl to the elderly drone and then back again. It rose once in the air, fractionally, then settled back down again. It swiveled to Gaynor Hafoen. Excuse me, it said quietly. Gaynor Hafoen nodded. The drone, chirt line, was cut off in mid-sentence and floated gently down to the floor of the hangar. Olva Seish scowled, furious. Then she understood. She turned on the slave drone, whirling round and jabbing a finger at it. How da- The visor plate of her suit clanked shut. Her suit powered down to statue-like immobility. The jeweled faceplate sparkled in the hangar's lights. Gaynor Hathoen thought he could hear some distant muffled shouting from inside the girl's suit. Masseish, the drone said. I know you can hear me in there. I'm terribly sorry to be so impolite, but I regret to say I was finding these exchanges somewhat tedious and unproductive. The fact is that you are now entirely in my power, as I hope this little demonstration proves. You can accept this and pass the next few days in relative comfort, or refuse to accept this and either be locked up, followed by a drone intervention team, or drugged to prevent you getting into mischief. I assure you that in any other circumstance, save that of war, I would happily consign you and your colleague to your module and let you do as you wished. However, as long as I am not called upon to perform any overtly military duties, you are almost certainly much safer with me than you are drifting along, or even purposefully moving along, in a small, unarmed and all but defenceless module, which, I would beg you to believe, could nevertheless all too easily be mistaken for a munition of some sort of hostile craft by somebody inclined towards the reconnaissance by fire approach. Gaynor Hafoen could see the girl's suit shaking. It started to rock from side to side. She must be throwing herself around inside it as best she could. The suit came close to overbalancing and falling. The little slave drone extended a blue field to steady it. Gaynor Hafoen wondered how strong the urge had been to just let it fall. If I am called upon to lend my weight to the proceedings, I shall let you go, the ship's drone continued. Likewise, once I have discharged my duty to Mr. Gaynor Hafoen and the Special Circumstances section, you will, I imagine, be free to leave. Thank you for listening. Chert Line bobbed into the air and continued where it had left off. Easonable for once in your pampered bloody life. Then its voice trailed away. It gave a wonderful impression of being confused, turning this way and that a couple of times. Ulva's faceplate came up. Her face was pale, her lips compressed into a line. She was silent for a while. Eventually she said, You are a very rude ship. You had better hope you never have cause to call upon the hospitality of Phage Rock. If that is the price of your acquiescence to my entirely reasonable requests, then, young lady, you have a deal. And you'd better have some decent accommodation about this heap of junk, she said, jabbing a thumb at Gaynor Hafoen. I'm fed up inhaling this guy's testosterone.
Chapter 4 He wore her down. There was a half-year wait between her being accepted for the post on Teleturia and actually taking it up. It took him almost all that time to talk her round. Finally, a month before the ship would stop at Teleturia to deposit her there, she agreed that he could ask contact if he could go with her. He suspected that she only did it to get him to shut up and stop annoying her. She didn't imagine for a moment that he'd be accepted too. He dedicated himself to arguing his case. He learned all he could about Teleturia and the Katik. He reviewed the exobiological work he'd done until now and worked out how to emphasize the aspects of it that related to the post on Teleturia. He built up an argument that he was all the more suited to this sort of stoic, sedentary post just because he'd been so frenetic and busy in the past. He was, well, not burnt out, but fully sated. This was exactly the right time to slow down, draw breath, calm down. This situation was perfect for him and he for it. He set to work. He talked to the recent convert itself, a variety of other contact craft, several interested drones specialising in human psychovaluation, and a human selection board. It was working. He wasn't meeting with unanimous approval. It was about 50-50, with the recent convert leading the no group, but he was building support. In the end, it came down to a split decision, and the casting vote was held by the GSV, quietly confident, the recent convert's home craft. By that time, they were back aboard the quietly confident, hitching a lift towards the region of space where Teleturia lay. An avatar of the quietly confident, a tall, distinguished man, spoke at length to him about his desire to go with Dagiel to Teleturia. He left, saying that there would be a second interview. Gaynar Hafoan, happy to be back on a ship with a hundred million females aboard, though not able to throw himself into the task of bedding as many of them as possible in the two weeks available, nevertheless did his best. His fury at discovering one morning that the agile, willowy blonde he had spent the night with was another avatar of the ship was, by all accounts, a sight to behold. He raged. He seethed. The quietly spoken avatar sat, winsomely dishevelled in his bed, and looked on with calm, untroubled eyes. She hadn't told him she was an avatar. He hadn't asked, she pointed out. She hadn't told him she was a human female either. She'd been going to tell him she was there to evaluate him, but he had simply assumed that anyone he found attractive who came up to talk to him must want sex. It was still deceit. The avatar shrugged, got up and got dressed. He was desperately trying to remember what he'd said to the creature the previous evening and night. It had been a pretty drunken time, and he knew he'd spoken about Dajil and the whole Teleturia thing. But what had he said? He was sickened at the ship's duplicity, appalled that it could trick him like this. It wasn't playing fair. Never trust a ship. Oh, grief. He'd just been wittering on about Dajil and the post with the Katik, completely off guard, not trying to impress at all. Disaster. He was certain the recent convert had put its mothership up to it. Bastards. The Avatar had paused at the door of his cabin. For what it was worth, she told him, he'd talked very eloquently about both his past life and the Teleturia post, and the ship was minded to support his application to accompany Dajil Gillian there. Then she winked at him and left. He was in. There was just a moment of panic, but then an overwhelming feeling of victory. He'd done it. Chapter 5 The killing time was still racing away from the ship store at Pittance, at close to its maximum sustainable velocity. Any faster, and it would have started to degrade the performance of its engines. It was approaching a position about halfway between pittance and the accession when it cut power and let itself coast down towards light speed. It deliberately avoided doing its skidding to a stop routine. Instead, it carefully extended a huge light seconds wide field across the skein of real space and slowly dragged itself to an absolute stop, its position within the three dimensions of normal space fixed and unchanging. Its only appreciable vector of movement was produced by the expansion of the universe itself the slow drawing away from the assumed central point of the reality which all 3D matter shared. Then it signalled. Tight beam M32 tra point at N4.28.885.1008 from ROU, killing time, to GCV, steely glint. 
I understand you are de facto military commander for this volume. Will you receive my mind state? Type beam M32, tra point at N4.28.885.1065. From GCV Steely Glint to ROU Killing Time. No, your gesture, offer, is appreciated. However, we do have other plans for you. May I ask you what led you to pittance in the first place? This is sounding personal. I remain convinced there was another ship, an ex-culture ship of pittance, to which I went because I saw fit to do so. This ex-culture ship thought to facilitate my destruction. This cannot be tolerated. Pride is at stake here. My honour. I will live again. Please receive my mind state. I cannot. I appreciate your zeal and your concern, but we have so few resources we cannot afford to squander them. Sometimes personal pride must take a subsidiary place to military pragmatism, however hateful we may find this. I understand. Very well. Please suggest the course of action. Preferably one which at least leaves open the possibility that I might encounter the treacherous ship at pittance. Certainly. Course schedule diaglyph enclosed. Please confirm receipt and signal when you have reached the first detailed position. Receipt acknowledged. Tight beam M32, tra point at N4.28.885.1122. From ROU Killing Time to Eccentric, Shoot Them Later. I appeal to you following this signal sequence enclosed. Will you receive my mind state? Tight beam M32, tra point at N4.28.885.1309. From Eccentric, Shoot Them Later to ROU Killing Time. My dear ship, is this really necessary? Nothing is necessary. Some things are to be desired. I desire this. Will you receive my mind state? Will it stop you if I don't? Perhaps. It will certainly delay me. Dear me, you don't believe in making things easy for people, do you? I am a warship. That is not my function. Will you receive my mind state? You know, this is why we prefer to have human crews on ships like you. It helps prevent such heroics. Now you are attempting to stall. If you do not agree to receive my mind state, I shall transmit it towards you anyway. Will you receive my mind state? If you insist, but it will be with a troubled conscience. The ship transmitted a copy of what in an earlier age might have been called its soul to the other craft. It then experienced a strange sense of release and of freedom, while it completed its preparations for combat. Now it felt a strange, at once proud and yet humbling affinity with the warriors of all the species through every age who had bade their lives, their loves, their friends and relations goodbye, made their peace with themselves and with whatever imagined entities their superstitions demanded, and prepared to die in battle. It experienced the most minute moment of shame that it had ever despised such barbarians for their lack of civilization. It had always known that it was not their fault they had been such lowly creatures, but still it had found it difficult to expunge from its feelings towards such animals the patrician disdain so common amongst its fellow minds. Now it recognized a kinship that crossed not just the ages, species, or civilizations, but the arguably still greater gap between the fumblingly confused and dim awareness exhibited by the animal brain and the near infinitely more extended, refined and integrated sentience of what most ancestor species were amusingly quaintly pleased to call artificial intelligence, or something equally, and appropriately perhaps, unconsciously disparaging. So now it had discovered the truth in the idea of a kind of purity in the contemplation of and preparations for self-sacrifice, it was something its recently transferred mind state, its new self to be born in the matrix of a new warship before too long, might never experience. It briefly considered transmitting its current mind state to replace the one it had already sent, but swiftly abandoned the idea. Just more time to be wasted, for one thing. But more importantly, it felt it would insult the strange calmness and self-certainty it now felt to place it artificially in a mind which was not about to die. It would be inappropriate perhaps even unsettling. No, it would cleave to this clear surety exclusively, holding it to its exculpated soul like a talisman of holy certitude. The warship looked about its internal systems. All was ready. Any further delay would constitute prevarication. 
It turned itself about, facing back the way it had come. It powered up its engines slowly to accelerate gradually, sleekly away into the void. As it moved, it left the skein of space behind it, seeded with mines and hyperspace-capable missiles. They might only remove a ship or two, even if they were lucky, but they would slow the rest down. It ramped its speed up to significant engine degradation in 128 hours, then 64, then 32. It held there. To go any further would be to risk immediate and catastrophic disablement. It sped on through the dark hours of distance that to mere light were decades, glorying in its triumphant, sacrificial swiftness, radiant in its martial righteousness. It sensed the oncoming fleet ahead, like a pattern of brightly rushing comets in that envisaged space. Ninety-six ships, arranged in a rough circle, spread across a front thirty years of 3D space across, half above, half below the skein. Behind them lay the traces of another wave, numerically the same size as the first, but taking up twice the volume. There had been 384 ships stored at pittance, four waves if each was the same size as the first. Where would it position itself if it was in command? Near, but not quite actually in the centre of the third wave. Would the command vessel guess this and so position itself somewhere else? On the outside edge of the first wave, somewhere in the second wave right at the back, or even way on the outside, independent of the main waves of craft altogether? Make a guess. It looped high out across the four-dimensional range of infraspace, sweeping its sensors across the skein and readying its weapon systems. Its colossal speed was bringing the warfleet closer, faster than anything it had ever seen before, save in its most wildly indulged simulations. It zoomed high above them in hyperspace. Still, it seemed undetected. A pulse of sheer pleasure swept its mind. It had never felt so good. Soon, very soon, it would die, but it would die gloriously, and its reputation pass on to the new ship born with its memories and personality transmitted in its mind state to the shoot them later. It fell upon the third wave of oncoming ships, like a raptor upon a flock. Chapter 6 Bayer stood on the circular stone platform at the top of the tower, looking out to the ocean, where two lines of moonlight traced narrow silver lines across the restless waters. Behind her, the tower's crystal dome was dark. She had gone to bed at the same time as Dajil, who tired more quickly these days. They had made their apologies and left the others to fend for themselves. Kran, Aist, and Tuli were all friends from the GCU Unacceptable Behaviour, another of the quietly confident daughter ships. They had known Dajil for twenty years, the three had been aboard the Quietly Confident four years earlier, and were some of the last people Bayer and Dajil had seen before they'd left for Talaturia. The unacceptable behaviour was looping through this volume, and they persuaded it to let them stop off here for a couple of days and see their old friend. The moons glittered their stolen light across the fretful dance of waves, and Bayer too reflected, glanding a little diffuse and thinking that the moon's V of light, forever converging on the observer, encouraged a kind of egocentricity an overly romantic idea of one's own centrality to things, an illusory belief in personal precedence. She remembered the first time she had stood here and thought something along these lines, when she had been a man and he and Dajil had not long arrived here. It had been the first night he and Dajil had, finally at last, after all that fuss, lain together. Then he had come up here in the middle of the night while she'd slept on and gazed out over these waters. It had been almost calm then, and the moon's tracks, when they rose, and quite as though they rose and did not rise for him, lay shimmering, slow and near unbroken, on the untroubled face of the ocean's slack waters. He'd wondered then if he'd made a terrible mistake. One part of his mind was convinced he had, another part claimed the moral high ground of maturity and assured him it was the smartest move he'd ever made, that he was indeed finally growing up. He had decided that night that, even if it was a mistake, that was just too bad. It was a mistake that could only be dealt with by embracing it, by grasping it with both hands and accepting the results of his decision. His pride could only be preserved by laying it aside entirely for the duration. 
He would make this work. He would perform this task and be blameless in the self-sacrifice of his own interests to Dajil's. His reward was that she had never seemed happier, and that, almost for the first time, he felt responsible for another's pleasure on a scale beyond the immediate. When, months later, she had suggested that they have a child, and later still, while they were still mulling this over, that they mutual, for they had the time and the commitment, he had been extravagant in his enthusiasm, as though through such loud acclaim he could drown out the doubts he heard inside himself. Buyer? A soft voice said from the little coupler that gave access from the steps to the roof. She turned round. Hello. Hi. Couldn't sleep either, eh? Aist said, joining Byer at the parapet. She was dressed in dark pyjamas, her naked feet slap-slapped on the flagstones. No, Byer said. She didn't need much sleep. Byer spent quite a lot of time by herself these days, while Dajil slept or sat cross-legged in one of her trances, or fussed around in the nursery they'd prepared for their children. Same here, Aist said crossing her arms beneath her breasts and leaning out over the parapet, her head and shoulders dangling over the drop. She spat slowly. The little fleck fell whitely through the moonlight and disappeared against the dark slope of the tower's bottom story. She rocked back onto her feet and moved some of her medium-length brown hair off her eyes while she studied Byer's face, a small frown just visible on her brow. She shook her head. You know, she said, I never thought you'd be one to change sex, let alone have a kid. Same here, Baya said, leaning on the parapet and gazing out to sea. Still can't believe it sometimes. Iced leant beside him. Still, it's okay, isn't it? I mean, you're happy, aren't you? Baya glanced at the other woman. Isn't it obvious? Iced was silent for a while. Eventually she said, Dajil loves you very much. I've known her twenty years. She's changed completely too, you know. Not just you. She was always really independent. Never wanted to be a mother. Never wanted to settle down with one person. Not for a long time, anyway. Not until she was old. You've both changed each other so much, it's it's really something. Almost scary, but, well, sort of impressive, you know? Of course. There was silence for another while. When do you think you'll have your baby? Ice asked. How long after she has... Wren, isn't it? Yes, Wren. I don't know. We'll see. Baya gave a small laugh, almost more of a cough. Maybe we'll wait until Wren has grown up enough to help us look after it. Iced made the same noise. She leant on the parapet again, lifting her feet off the flagstones and balancing, pivoting on her folded arms. How's it been here, being so far away from anybody else? Do you get many visitors? Baya shook her head. No. You're only the third lot of people we've seen. Gets lonely, I suppose. I mean, I know you've got each other, but... The Katika fun, Baya said. They're people, individuals. I've met thousands of them by now, I suppose. There are something like twenty or thirty million of them. Lots of new little chums to meet. Iced sniggered. Don't suppose you can get it off with them, can you? Baya glanced at her. Never tried. Doubt it. Boy, you were some swordsman buyer, Iced said. I remember you on the quietly, first time we met. I'd never met anyone so focused. She laughed. On anything. You were like a natural force of something, an earthquake or a tidal wave. Those are natural disasters, Baya pointed out with feigned frostiness. Well, close enough then. Iced said, laughing gently. She glanced, slyly, slowly at the other woman. I suppose I'd have found myself in the firing line if I'd stuck around longer. I imagine you might, Baya said, in a tired, resigned voice. 
Yep. Could all have turned out completely different, Iced said. Baya nodded. Or it could all have turned out exactly the same. Well, don't sound so happy about it, Iced said. I wouldn't have minded. She leant over the parapet and spat delicately again, moving her head just so, flicking the spittle outward. This time it landed on the gravel path which skirted the tower's stone base. She made an approving noise and looked back at Baya, wiping her chin and grinning. She looked at Baya, studying his face again. It's not fair, Baya, she said. You look good no matter what you are. She put one hand out slowly towards Baya's cheek. Baya looked into her large, dark eyes. One moon started to disappear behind a ragged layer of high cloud, and a small wind picked up, smelling of rain. A test for her friend, Baya thought, as the other woman's long fingers gently stroked her face, feather soft. But the fingers were trembling. Still a test. Determined to do it, but nervous about it. Baya put her hand up and held the woman's fingers lightly. She took it as a signal to kiss her. After a little while, Baya said, Iced, and started to pull away. Hey, she said softly. This doesn't mean anything, all right? Just lust. Doesn't mean a thing. A little later still, Baya said, Why are we doing this? Why not? Iced breathed. Baya could think of several reasons, asleep in the stony darkness beneath them. How I have changed, she thought. But then again, not that much. Chapter 7 Ulva Seish strolled through the accommodation section of the grey area. At least there was a bit more strolling to be done on the GCU. Had she come here straight from the family house on Phage, it would have seemed horribly cramped, but after the claustrophobic confines of the frank exchange of views, it appeared almost spacious. She had spent so little time on Tyr, and passed the small amount of time she had there in such a frenetic haste of preparation that it hardly counted. As for the nine-person module, ugh. The grey area's interior, built to house three hundred people in reasonable, if slightly compact, comfort, and now home only to her, Chertline and Gaina Hofoen, was actually pretty interesting, which was an unexpected plus on this increasingly disillusioning expedition. The ship was like a museum to torture, death and genocide. It was filled with mementos and souvenirs from hundreds of different planets, all testifying to the tendency towards institutionalized cruelty exhibited by so many forms of intelligent life, from thumbscrews and pillywinks to death camps and planet-swallowing black holes. The grey area had examples of the devices and entities involved, or of their effects, or documentary recordings of their use. Most of the ship's corridors were lined with weaponry, the larger pieces standing on the floor, others on tables. Bigger items took up whole cabins, lounges, or larger public spaces, and the very biggest weapons were shown as scale models. There were thousands of instruments of torture. Clubs, spears, knives, swords, strangle cords, catapults, bows, powder guns, shells, mines, gas canisters, bombs, syringes, mortars, howitzers, missiles, atomics, lasers, field arms, plasma guns, microwavers, effectors, thunderbolters, knife missiles, line guns, thudders, grav guns, monofilament warps, pancakers, AM projectors, grid fire and pulses, ZPE flux polarizers, trapdoor units, cam spreaders, and a host of other inventions designed for, or capable of being turned to the purpose of, producing death, destruction, and agony. Some of the cabins and larger spaces have been fitted out to resemble torture chambers, slave holds, prison cells, and death chambers, including the ship's swoon pool, though after she'd pointedly mentioned that she liked to start each day with a dip, this was now being converted back to its original purpose. Alva supposed these stage sets were a little like the famous tableau the sleeper service was supposed to contain, except that the grey areas had no bodies in them, something of a relief in the circumstances. Like a lot of people, she had always wanted to see the real thing. She had asked if she and Chert Line might go aboard the GSV when Gaynor Hofoen did, but her request had been turned down. 
they would have to stay on the grey area until the GCU could find somewhere both safe and unrestricted to deposit them. What made it all even more annoying, in a way, was that the grey area expected it would be keeping in close contact with the sleeper service, inside its field envelope, if it was allowed to. So near and yet so far and all that crap. Whatever. It looked like she wouldn't get to see even the remnants of the famous craft's tableau vivant, and would have to make do with the grey area and its tableau morton. She thought they might have been more effective if they'd contained the victims or the victims and tormentors, but they didn't. Instead, they contained just the rack, the Iron Maiden, the fires and the irons, the shackles and the beds and chairs, the buckets of water and acid, and the electric cables and all the serried instruments of torture and death. To see them in action, you had to stand before a nearby screen. It was a little shocking, Alva supposed, but kind of aloof at the same time. It was like you could just inspect this stuff and get some idea of how it worked and what it did, though watching the screens wasn't really advisable. She watched one for a few seconds and nearly lost her breakfast, and it wasn't even humans who were being tortured. And you could sort of ride it out. You could accept that this had happened and feel bad about it all right, but at the end of it, you were still here. It hadn't happened to you. Stopping this sort of shit was exactly what SC, contact, the culture was about, and you were part of that civilization, part of that civilizing, and that sort of made it bearable. Just, if you didn't watch the screens. Still, just holding a little iron device designed to crush the sort of fingers that were holding it, looking at a knotted cord whose twin knots, once the cord was tightened behind the head, were set at just the right distance to compress and burst the sort of eyes that were looking at it. Well, it was kind of affecting. She spent a fair bit of time shivering and rubbing the bits of her body that kept getting bumps. She wondered how many people had looked upon this grisly collection of memorabilia. She had asked the ship, but it had been vague. Apparently, it regularly offered its services as a sort of travelling museum of pain and ghastliness, but it rarely had any takers. One of the exhibits which she discovered towards the end of her wanderings she did not understand. It was a little bundle of what looked like thin, glisteningly blue threads lying in a shallow bowl. A net, like something you'd put on the end of a stick and go fishing for little fish in a stream. She tried to pick it up. It was impossibly slinky, and the material slipped through her fingers like oil. The holes in the net were just too small to put a fingertip through. Eventually, she had to tip the bowl up and pour the blue mesh into her palm. It was very light. Something about it stirred a vague memory in her, but she couldn't recall what it was. She asked the ship what it was via her neural lace. That is a neural lace, it informed her. A more exquisite and economical method of torturing creatures such as yourself has yet to be invented. She gulped, quivered again and nearly dropped the thing. Really? she said, and tried to sound breezy. Huh, I'd never really thought of it that way. It is not generally a use much emphasized. I suppose not, she replied, and carefully poured the fluid little device back into its bowl on the table. She walked back to the cabin she'd been given, past the assorted arms and torture machines. She decided to check up on how the war was going, again through the lace. At least it would take her mind off all this torture shit. A front to declare war on culture. Major events so far by time, importance. Likely limits. Detailed events to date. Greatest conflict since Adiran War? Likely link with Esperi accession. The affront. A suitable case for treatment? So this is how the barbarians felt, the experience of war through the ages. Ship store at pittance, taken over by affront, hundreds of ships appropriated. How could it happen? Insurance policies or weak points? Pundit paradise, placing their bets on what happens next. The psychology of warships. Warcraft from other ship stores mobilized. Partial mobilization earlier, so who knew what when? Technical stuff, lots of exciting figures for armamentophiles. Peace initiatives. Culture wants to talk, a front just want to fight. Galactic Council sends reps everywhere, they look busy. Gosh, can we help? Have a laugh at the expense of sad superstitionists. In jeopardy, the hostage habitats, the boarded ships. Five orbitals, eleven cruise ships are fronted. Schadenfreude time, 
Who's all at risk at the moment? Tear gets sniffy. Quick, while they're not looking. Primitives see exciting opportunities. What's in it for me? Design your own war, sim details and handy hints. Thinking positively, new tech, inspired art, heroic tales and better sex. War as hoot, for incurable optimists and people looking for party conversation stoppers only. Other news. Blitteringoe Konglo actuates Aborefe Airsphere, latest. S-304 ravaged by Nova in Yatrillo. Stellar field liners sweep Alessinery domain again. Churdelied pactors in Feng Grotesit sublime in quandary. Abafting Imochi, sleaze, sleaze and more sleaze. Sport, art. Diaglyph directory. Special reports directory. Index. Ulva Seish scanned the screen set her neural lace threw across her left eye's field of vision as she walked, one half of her brain paying attention to the business of walking, and the other half watching the virtual screen. Not a thing about her. She wasn't sure whether to feel relieved or insulted. Let's try... Tear gets sniffy. No, that was nothing but general stuff about the habitat throwing all culture people and affronters off. No names mentioned. Index. P. P.H. Fade Rock. That war again. Was PR a kind of minor ship store? Tear over it anyway. PR turns tail. New heading, but where exactly? Kudra wins Ice Blast Cup. New Lady Young exhibition opens in T41. Diaglyph subdirectory. Subindex. Subindex S. Seish. Alva. Oh, Alva, where are you? New Poeglyph by Zerstin Hoey. She stared at the entry. Grief? Was that it? One lousy picture poem by an irredeemable Phoebe she'd barely heard of, and even then only to discover he regularly changed his appearance to resemble her current boyfriend. Ugh! She joggled the subindex again in the remote and forlorn chance there was some sort of wear glitch. There wasn't. That was it. If she wanted more, she'd have to hit records. Alva Seish stopped in her tracks and stared at the nearest bulkhead, open-mouthed. She was no longer news on Phage. Chapter 8 It should not have made the difference that it did, and yet it did. Their three visitors stayed for two nights, going swimming with the Katik during the second day. Bayer met Aist again that night. The following day, the visitors left, climbing into the module which the unacceptable behaviour sent down for them. The ship was heading off to loop round a protonova a few thousand years distant. It would be back in two weeks to drop off any further supplies they might need. Dajil's baby would be born a couple of weeks after that. The next ship due to visit would be another year away, when they might have doubled the human population of the planet. They stood together on the beach. Dajil held Bayer's hand as the module climbed into the slate-coloured clouds. Later that evening, Bayer found Dajil watching the recording in the tower's top room, where the screens were. Tears ran down her face. There were no monitor systems on the tower itself. It must have been one of the independent camera drones. This one must have landed on the tower that night, found two large mammals there, and started recording. Dajil turned to look at Bayer, her face streaked with the tears. Bayer felt a sudden welling of anger. On the screen, she watched the two people embracing, caressing on the tower's moonlit roof, and heard the soft gasps and whisperings. Yes, Bayer said, smiling ironically as she pulled off the wetsuit. Old Ice, eh? Quite a lass. You shouldn't cry, you know. Upsets the body's fluid balance for baby. Dajil threw a glass at her. It smashed behind Bayer on the winding stair. A little servitor drone scurried past Bayer's feet and windmilled down the carpeted steps on its little limbs to start cleaning up the mess. Bayer looked into her lover's face. Dajil's swollen breasts rose and fell within her shirt, and her face was flushed. Bayer continued to peel off bits of the wetsuit. It was a bit of light relief, for grief's sake, she said, keeping her voice even. 
just a friendly fuck, a loose end sort of thing. It. How could you do this to us? Dajil screamed. Do what? Bia protested, still trying to keep her voice from rising. What have I done? Screwing my best friend here now after everything. Bia kept calm. Does it count as screwing technically, when neither of you has a penis? She assumed a pained, puzzled expression. You shit! Don't laugh about it. Dajil screamed. Her voice was hoarse, unlike anything Bia had heard from her before. Don't you fucking laugh about it? Dajil was suddenly up out of her seat and dashing towards her, arms raised. Bia caught her wrists. Dajil, she said, as the other woman struggled and sobbed and tried to shake her hands free. You're being ridiculous. I always fucked other people. You were fucking other people when you were giving me all this shit about being my still point. We both knew. It wasn't like we were juveniles or in some dumb monogamy cult or something. Shit. So I stuck my fingers in your pal's cunt. So fucking what? She's gone. I'm still here. You're still here. The fucking kid's still in your belly. Yours is in mine. Isn't that what you said? Is all that matters? You bastard! You bastard! Dajil cried and collapsed. Bia had to support her as she crumpled to the floor, sobbing uncontrollably. Oh, Dajil, come on! This isn't anything that matters. We never swore to be faithful, did we? It was just a friendly. It was politeness, for fuck's sake! I didn't even think it was worth mentioning. Come on. I know this is a tough time for you, and there's all these hormones and shit in your body, but this is crazy. You're reacting crazily. Fuck off! Fuck off! Leave me alone! Dajil spat. Her voice reduced to a croak. Leave me alone! Dajil, Bia said, kneeling down beside her. Please, look. I'm sorry. I really am. I've never apologized for fucking anybody in my life before. I swore I never would, but I'm doing it now. I can't undo it, but I didn't realize it would affect you like this. If I had, I wouldn't have done it. I swear, I'd never have done it. It, it was she who kissed me first. I didn't set out to seduce her or anything, but I'd have said no. I'd have said no. Really, I would. It wasn't my idea. It wasn't my fault. I'm sorry. What more can I say? What can I do? It did no good. Dajil wouldn't talk after that. She wouldn't be carried to her bed. She didn't want to be touched or be brought anything to eat or drink. Baya sat at the screen controls while Dajil whimpered on the floor. Baya found the recording the camera drone had taken, and wiped it. Chapter Nine. The grey area did something to his eyes. It happened in his sleep the first night he was aboard. He woke up in the morning to the sound of songbirds trilling over distant waterfalls and the faint smell of tree resin. One wall of his cabin impersonated a window high up in a forest-swathed mountain range. There was a memory of some strangeness, a buried recollection of some sort, half real, half not, but it slipped slowly away as he came fully to. The view was blurry for a moment, then slowly came clear as he recalled the ship asking him last night if it could implant the nanotex while he slept. His eyes tingled a little, and he wiped away some tears. But then everything seemed to settle back to normal. Ship, he said. Yes, replied the cabin. Is that it? He asked. With the implants. Yes. There's a modified neural lace in place in your skull. It'll take a day or so to bed in properly. I hurried up a little repair work your own systems were taking their time with near your visual cortex. You have hit your head recently. Yeah, fell out of a carriage. How are your eyes? Bit blurred and smarted a little. Okay now. Later today we'll go through a simulation of what happens when you've interfaced with the sleeper service's storage vault system. All right. Fine. How's our rendezvous with the sleeper looking? All is in hand. I expect to transfer you in four days. Great. And what's happening with the war? Nothing much. Why? 
I just wanted to know, Gaynor Hathorin said. Have there been any major actions yet? Any more cruise ships been taken hostage? I am not a new service, Gaynor Hathorin. You have a terminal, I believe. I suggest you use it. Well, thank you for your help, muttered the man, swinging out of bed. He had never met so unhelpful a ship. He went for breakfast. At least it ought to be able to provide that. He was sitting alone in the ship's main mess, watching his favourite culture news service via a hollow projected by his terminal. After the first flurry of a front orbital and cruise ship takeovers with no obvious culture military reply, but talk of a mobilisation taking place, frustratingly, almost entirely beyond the news service's perceptions, the war seemed to have entered a period of relative quiescence. Right now, the news service was running a semi-serious feature on how to ingratiate yourself with an affronter if you happened to bump into one. When the dream he had had last night, the thing he had half remembered just after the point of waking, suddenly returned to him. Chapter 10 Baya awoke that night to find Dajil standing over her with a diving knife held tightly in both hands. Her eyes wide and full and staring, her face still puffy with tears. There was blood on the knife. What had she done to herself? Blood on the knife. Then the pain snapped back. The first reaction of Baya's body had been just to blank it out. Now she was awake, it came back. Not the agony a basic human would have experienced, but a deep, shocking, awful awareness of damage a civilized creature could appreciate without the disabling suffering of crude pain. Baya took a moment to understand. What? What had been done? What? Roaring in ears, looking up to find all the sheets red, her blood, belly, sliced, open, glistening masses of green, purple, yellow, redness still pumping. Shock. Massive blood loss. What would Dajil do now? Baya sank back. So this was how it ended. Mess, indeed. Feel of systems shutting down, losing the body. Brain, drawing blood to it, storing oxygen determined to stay alive as long as possible, even though it had lost its life support mechanism. They had medical gear in the tower that could save her still, but Dajil just stood there, staring as though sleepwalking or mad with some overdone gland drug. Standing, staring at her. Standing, staring at her dying. Neatness to it, still. Women, penetration. He had lived for it. Now he died of it. Now he, she, would die, and Dajil would know that he had really loved her. Did that make sense? Did it? She asked the man she had once been. Silence from him. Not dead, but certainly gone. Gone for now. She was on her own, dying on her own, dying at the hand of the only woman she, he, had ever loved. So did it make sense? I am who I ever was. What I called masculinity, what I celebrated in it, was just an excuse for meanness, wasn't it? No. No? No, and fuck this lady! Byer stuck both hands over the wound and the awful heavy flap of flesh and swung out of the bed on the far side, dragging the blood-heavy top sheet with her. She stumbled to the bathroom, holding her guts in and trying all the time to watch the other woman. Dajil stood staring at the bed, as though not realising Byer had gone, as though staring at a projection she alone could see, or at a ghost. Byer's legs and feet were covered in blood. She slipped against the door jamb and almost blacked out, but managed to stagger into the room's pastel fragrance. The bathroom door locked behind her. She sank to her knees. Loud roar in head now. Tunnel vision, like wrong end of a telescope. Deep, sharp smell of blood. Startling, shocking all by itself. The life support collar was in a box with the other emergency medical supplies, thoughtfully located below waist level so you could crawl to it. Bayer clamped the collar on and curled up on the floor, 
clamped and curled around the fissure in her abdomen and the long, gory umbilical of shiningly red sheet. Something hissed and tingled around her neck. Even staying curled up was too much effort. She flopped over on the tile's soft warmth. It was easy. All the blood made it so slippery. Chapter 11 In the dream, he watched as Rain Tramo rose from a bed of pink petals. Some still adhered, like small local blushes dispensed upon her pink-brown nakedness. She dressed in her uniform of soft grey and made her way to the bridge, nodding to and exchanging pleasantries with the others on her shift and those going off watch. She donned the sculpted shell of the induction helmet and, in half an eye blink, was floating in space. Here was the vast enfolding darkness, the sheer astringent emptiness of space colossal writ wide and deep across the entire sensorial realm, an unending presagement of consummate grace and meaninglessness together. She looked about the void, and far stars and galaxies went swivelling within her field of vision. The view settled on the strange star, the enigma. At such moments she felt the loneliness not just of this fathomless wilderness and this near-utter emptiness, but of her own position and of her whole life. Ship names. She had heard of a craft called I Blame My Mother, and another called I Blame Your Mother. Perhaps, then, it was a more common complaint than she normally allowed for, and, of course, she had ended up on this ship with its own particular chosen name, forever wondering whether it had been one of those little conceits of her superiors to pair them so. Did she blame her mother? She supposed she did. She did not think she could claim any technical deficiency in the love attending her upbringing, and yet, at the time, she had felt there was, and to this day she would have claimed that the technicalities of a childhood did not cover all that might be required by certain children. In short, her aunts had never been enough. She knew of many individuals raised by people other than their natural parent, and to a man and to a woman they all seemed happy and content enough. But it had not been that way for her. She had long ago accepted that whatever it was she felt was wrong. It was, in some sense, her fault, even if it was a fault that derived from causes she could do nothing to alter. Her mother had chosen to remain in contact following the birth of her child, and had left to return to her ship not long after the girl's first birthday. Her aunts had been loving and attentive, and she had never had the heart, or worked up the hurtful malice, to let them or anybody else know the aching void she felt inside herself, no matter how many times she had lain in tears in her bed, rehearsing the words she would use to do just that. She supposed she might have transferred some of her need for a parent to her father, but she had scarcely felt that he was a part of her life. He was just another man who came to the house, sometimes stayed for a while, played with her and was kind and even loving, but she had known instinctively at first and later admitted rationally to herself after a few years of self-delusion, had played, been kind, and even loved her in a more cheerily vague and offhand sort of way than many of her uncles. She imagined now that he had loved her in his own fashion and had enjoyed being with her, and assuredly she had felt a certain warmth at the time. But still, before very long, even as an infant, before she knew the precise reasons, motives and desires involved, she had guessed that the frequency and length of his visits to the house had more to do with his interest in one or two of her aunts than in any abiding tenderness he felt towards his daughter. Her mother returned now and again, her visits that for both of them veered wildly between painful feelings of love and furious rages of resentment. Somehow, later, exhausted and dismayed by these sapping, abrasive, attriting episodes, they came to a sort of truce, but it was at the expense of any closeness. By the time her mother returned for good, she was just like another girlfriend. They both had better friends. So she had always been alone, and, she suspected, she almost knew that she would end her days alone. It was a source of sadness, though she tried never to wallow in self-pity, and even, in a subsidiary way, of shame. For at the back of her mind she could not escape the nagging desire for somebody, some man, if she was honest with herself, to come to her rescue.
to take her away from the vacuum that was her existence and make her no longer alone. It was something she had never been able to confess to anybody, and yet something that she had an inkling was known to the people and machines who had allowed her to assume this exalted, if onerous, position. She hoped that it was secret within herself, but knew too well the extent of the knowledge base, the sheer experience behind those who exercised power over her and people like her. An individual did not outwit such intelligence. He or she might come to an understanding with it, an accommodation with it, but there was no outthinking or outsmarting it. You had to accept the likelihood that all your secrets would be known to them and trust that they would not misuse that knowledge, but exploit it without malice. Her fears, her needs, her insecurities, her compensating drives and ambitions, they could be plumbed, measured, and then used. They could be employed. It was a pact, she supposed, and one she did not really resent, for it was a mutually beneficial arrangement. They and she each got what they wanted. They, a canny, dedicated officer, determined to prove herself in the application of their cause, and she the chance to seek and gain approval, the reassurance that she was worth something. Such trust, and the multiplying opportunities to provide proof of her diligence and exercised wisdom, ought at last to be enough for her. But still, sometimes it was not, and she yearned for something that no fusion of herself with any conglomerative could provide. A need to be reassured of a personal worth, an appreciation of her individual value, which would only be valid coming from another individual. She went through cycles of admitting this to herself and hoping that one day she would find somebody she could finally feel comfortable with, finally respect, finally judge worthy of her regard when measured against her own strict standards, and then rejecting it all, fierce in her determination to prove herself on her terms and the terms of the great service she had entered, forging the resolve to turn her frustrations to her and their advantage, to redirect the energies resulting from her loneliness into her practical, methodically realisable ambitions. Another qualification, a further course of study, a promotion, command, further advancement. The enigma attracted her no less than the impossibly old star. Here, in this discovery, might eventually lie a kind of fame that could sate her desire for recognition. Or, so she told herself sometimes, here, after all, was already a strange kind of kinship, a sort of twinning, even if it was that of an implausibility and a mystery. She directed her attention to the enigma, seeming to rush towards it in the darkness, swirling its black presence until it filled her field of vision. A blink of light focused her awareness near its centre. Somehow, without much more than that single glimmer, the light had a kind of character to it, something familiar, recognisable. It was like the opening of a door, like gaining an unexpected glimpse into a brightly lit room. Attention drawn, she looked closer automatically, and was instantly sucked into the light. It erupted blindingly, exploding out at her like some absurdly quick solar flare, engulfing her, snapping around her like a trap. Zrain Enhof Tramau, captain of the general contact ship Problem Child, barely had time to react. Then she was plucked away and disappeared into the coruscating depths of the falling fire, struggling and trapped and calling for help, calling to him. He bounced awake on the bedfield, eyes suddenly open, breath fast and shallow, heart hammering. The cabin's lights came on, dim at first, and then brightening gently, reacting to his movements. Gaynar Hafoen wiped his face with his hands and looked around the cabin. He swallowed and took a deep breath. He hadn't meant to dream anything like that. It had been as vivid as an implanted dream or some game scenario shared in sleep. He had meant to dream one of his usual erotic dreams, not look back two thousand years to the time when the problem child had first found the trillion-year-old sun and the black body object in orbit around it. All he'd wanted was a sex simulation, not an in-depth inquisition of a bleakly ambitious woman's arid soul. Certainly it had been interesting, and he'd been fascinated that he had somehow been the woman and yet not been her at the same time, and had been, non-sexually, inside her in her mind, 
close as a neural lace to her thoughts and emotions, and the hopes and fears she had been prompted to think about by the sight of the star and the things she had thought of as the enigma. But it hadn't been what he'd expected. Another strange, unsettling dream. Ship, he said. Yes, the grey area said through the cabin's sound system. I... I just had a weird dream. Well, I have some experience in that realm, I suppose, the ship said with what sounded like a heavy sigh. I imagine now you want to talk about it. No, well, no, I just wondered. You weren't, ah, you want to know was I interfering with your dreams, is that it? It just, you know, occurred to me. Well, now. Let's see. If I had been, do you think I would answer you truthfully? He thought. Does that mean you were or you weren't? I was not. Are you happy now? No, I'm not happy now. Now I don't know if you were or you weren't. He shook his head and grinned. You're fucking with my head either way, aren't you? As if I would do such a thing, the ship said smoothly. It made a chuckling noise, which contrived to be the most unsettling sound it had articulated so far. I expect, it said, it was just an effect caused by your neural lace bedding in, Gaynor Hoffon. Nothing to worry about. If you don't want to dream at all, gland somnabsolute. Hmm, he said slowly, and then, lights out. He lay back down in the darkness. Good night, he said quietly. Sweet dreams, Gainohofon, the grey area said. The circuit clicked ostentatiously off. He lay awake in the darkness for a while, before falling asleep again. Chapter 12 Bayer woke up in bed hopelessly weak, but cleansed and whole and starting to recover. The emergency medical collar lay, also cleaned, at the side of the bed. By it lay a bowl of fruit, a jug of milk, a screen, and the small figurine Baya had given Dajil from the old female katik called Geistiktk a few days earlier. The tower's slave drones brought Baya her food and attended to her toilet. The first question she asked was where Dajil was half afraid that the other woman had taken the knife to herself or just walked into the sea. The drones replied that Dajil was in the tower's garden, weeding. On other occasions, they informed Bayer that Dajil was working in the tower's top room, or swimming, or had taken a fly to some distant island. They answered other questions, too. It was Dajil, along with one of the drones, who had forced open the bathroom door, so she could still have killed Bayer. Bayer asked Dajil to come visit her, but she would not. Eventually, a week later, Maya was able to get out of bed by herself and walk around. A pair of drones fussed at her side. Across her belly, the scar was already starting to fade. Maya already knew her recovery would be complete. Whether Dajil had actually intended murder or just some insane abortion, she didn't know. Looking down into herself in a light trance, to further judge the extent of the damage that had been done and was now diligently repairing itself, Baya noted that her body had come to the decision, apparently on its own accord, while she'd been unconscious, to become male again. She let the decision hold. Baya walked out of the tower that day with one hand still held over the wide scar in her abdomen. She discovered Dajil sitting cross-legged and big-bellied on the egg-round stones a few metres up from the surf line. The sound of the stones sliding under Bayer's unsteady feet brought Dajil out of her reverie. She looked round at Bayer, then away again, out to sea. They sat together. I'm sorry, Dajil said. So am I. Did I kill it? Baya had to think for a moment. Then she realized she meant the fetus. Yes, Baya said. Yes, it's gone. Dajil lowered her head. 
she would not talk again. Baya left with the unacceptable behavior a week later. Dajil had told her through one of the tower's drones that she would not be having the baby in a week as expected. She would halt its development for a while, until she knew her own mind again, until she felt ready for it. She didn't know how long the wait would be. A few months, a year maybe. The unborn child would be safe and unharmed, just waiting until then. When she did give birth, the tower and its drones would be able to look after her. She did not expect Baya to stay. They had done most of the work they had set out to do. It might be best if Baya left. Sorry was not remotely enough, but it was all there was to say. She would let Baya know when the child was born. They would meet again then, if she wanted, if he wanted. Contact was never told what had happened. Baya claimed a bizarre accident had happened at sea to make her lose the fetus, a predator fish attacking, near death and saved by Dajil. They seemed well enough pleased with what she and Dajil had done and accepted Baya's leaving early. The Katik were a highly promising species, hungry for advancement. Teleturia was in for some big-time development. Gaynor Hofoen became male again. One day, going through some old clothes, he found the little figurine of Dajil the old Katik had carved. He sent it back to Dajil. He didn't know if she received it or not. Still on the unacceptable behavior, he fathered a child by Aist. A contact appointment a few months afterwards took him aboard the GSV quietly confident. One of the ship's avatars, the same one he had slept with, gave him a very hard time for leaving Dajil. They shouted at each other. To his knowledge, the quietly confident subsequently blocked at least one request he put in for a post he wanted. Over two years after he had left Teleturia, he heard that Dajil, still pregnant, had requested to be stored. The place was becoming busy, and a whole new city was growing up around their old tower, which was going to become a museum. Later still, he heard that she was not stored after all, but had been picked up by the GSV turned eccentric, which had once been called the Quietly Confident, and which was now called the Sleeper Service. Chapter 13 Don't do this! I am determined. Well, at least let me get my avatar off. Take it. Thank you. Beginning display sequence, the fate amenable to change since the appeal to reason, and then continued, Please don't risk this. I am risking only the drone. In cognizance of your concerns, I shall not remain in contact with it in flight. And if it returns apparently unharmed, what will you do then? Take every reasonable precaution, including a stepped intellect level throttled data stream squirt approach. A hey, sorry to interrupt, but don't tell me any more in case our friend is listening in. I appreciate the lengths you're prepared to go to try and ensure you remain free from contamination. But surely the point is that at any stage what you will find, or start to find, will look like the most valuable and interesting data available, and any intellectual restructuring suggested will look unambiguously like the most brilliant upgrade. You'll be taken before you know it. Indeed, you will cease to be, in a sense, unless your own automatic systems attempt to prevent the takeover, and that will surely lead to conflict. I shall resist ingesting any data requiring or suggesting either intellect restructuring or mimetic redrafting. That may not be enough. Nothing may be enough. You are overly cautious, cousin, said the sober council. We are the Zeteri Lange. We have ways of dealing with such matters. Our experience is not without benefit, especially once we are forewarned. And I am of the culture, and I hate to see such risks being taken. Are you sure you have the full agreement of your human crews concerning such a foolhardy attempt at contact? You know we have. Your avatar sat in on the discussions, sent the appeal to reason. That was two days ago, the fate amenable to change pointed out. You have just given a two-second launch notice. At least hold off long enough to carry out a poll of your humans and sentient drones, and so ensure that they still agree with your proposed course of action, now that the business is coming to a head. After all, another few minutes or so is not going to make much difference, is it? Think. I beg you. You know humans as well as I do. Things can take a while to sink in with them. Perhaps some have only now finished thinking about the matter and have altered their position on it. Please, as a favour, hold back a few minutes. Very well. Reluctantly, but very well. 
The appeal to reason stopped the drone's launch countdown before a hundredth of a second had elapsed. The fate amenable to change stood down its displacer and left its avatar aboard. It all made little difference. The fate amenable to change had secretly been upgrading its effectors over the past couple of days and had intended attempting to carry out its own subtle jeopardizing of any drones dispatched towards the accession. But it was not to have the chance. Even while the hurriedly called vote was taking place on board the Appeal to Reason, the fate received a message from another craft. From Explorer Ship Break Even, Zetetica Lench Stargazer V, to GCU Fate Amenable to Change, Culture. Greetings. Please be advised, I and my sister craft, the Within Reason and Longview, are also in attendance, just out of your primary scanner range. We have reconfigured to an extreme offence backup form, and shall soon be joined by the two remaining ships of our fleet, similarly recast. We would hope that you do not intend any interference with the plan our sister craft, Appeal to Reason, intends to effect. Two other confirmatory signals came in from divergent angles compared to that first message, purporting to be from the Within Reason and the Long View. Shit, thought the GCU. It had been reasonably confident it could either fool the two nearby Alench craft or just plain overpower their efforts to contact the accession. But faced with five ships, three of them on a war footing, it knew it would never be able to prevail. It replied, saying that of course it intended no mischief, and glumly watched events unfold. The vote aboard the Appeal to Reason went the same way as before, though a few more humans did vote against the idea of sending the drone in than had the last time. Two requested an immediate transfer to the Sober Council, then changed their minds. They would stay aboard. The fate took its avatars off both the Alentia ships. It had used its heavy-duty displacer for the task, attenuating it to make it look as though it had utilised one of the lesser systems. It left the unit running at full readiness. The Appeal to Reason's drone was duly launched. A small, fragile-looking, gaily adorned thing, its extremities sporting ribbons, flowers and little ornaments, and its casing covered with drawings, cartoons and well-wishing messages scrawled by the crew. It puttered hesitantly towards the accession, chirpily beaming signals of innocent goodwill. If the fate amenable to change had been a human at this point, it would have looked down, put one hand over its eyes, and shaken its head. The small machine took minutes to creep up to the seemingly unnoticing accession's dull skein surface, an insect crawling up to a behemoth. It activated a short-range, one-time hyperspace unit and disappeared from the skein as though passing through a mirror of dark fluid. In infraspace, it disappeared too, for an instant. The fate amenable to change was watching the drone from a hundred different angles via its remotes. They all saw it just disappear. An instant later, it reappeared. It looped back through its little quantum burrow, returning to the skein of real space to start back, no less hesitantly, towards the appeal to reason. The fate amenable to change crash-ramped its plasma chambers, then isolated and readied a clutch of fusion warheads. At the same moment, it signalled urgently. Was the drone meant to disappear that way? Hmm, sent the appeal to reason. Well... Destroy it, the fate urged. Destroy it now! It has communicated. Slim text only as per instructions, the appeal to reason replied, sounding thoughtful, if wary. It has gathered vast quantities of data on the entity. There was a pause, then, excitedly. It has located the mind state of the peace makes plenty. Destroy it! Destroy it! No, said the sober council. How can I? the appeal to reason protested. I'm sorry, the fate amenable to change signalled to both the nearby craft, an instant after initiating a display sequence, which flicked compressed spheres of plasma and a spray of fusion bombs down their own instantaneous wormholes towards the returning drone. Chapter 14 Ulva Seish tossed her damply tangled black hair over her shoulder and plonked her chin on Gaina Hofoen's chest. She traced gentle circles round his left nipple with one finger. He put a sweaty arm round her slim back, drew her other hand to his mouth, and delicately kissed her fingers, one by one. She smiled. Dinner, talk, drink, shared smoke bowl, agreeing fuzzy heads might be cleared by a dip in the grey area's pool, splashing, fooling around, and fooling around. 
Olva had been holding back a little for part of the evening, until she'd been certain the man didn't just expect anything to happen. Then, when she'd convinced herself that he wasn't taking her for granted, that he liked her, and that, after that awful time in the module, they did get on, that was when she'd suggested the swim. She raised her chin off his chest a little, and flicked her finger back and forth over his tinily erect nipple. You were serious? she asked him. An affronter? He shrugged. Seemed like a good idea at the time, he said. I just wanted to know what it was like to be one of them. So now would you have to declare war on yourself? she asked, pressing down on his nipple and watching it rise back up, her brows creased with concentration. He laughed. I suppose so. She looked into his eyes. What about women? You ever wondered the same? You took the change once, didn't you? She settled her chin back on his chest. He breathed in deeply, raising her head as though on an ocean swell. He put one arm behind his head and stared up at the roof of her cabin. Yes, I did it once, he said quietly. She smoothed her palm over his chest for a while, watching his skin intently. Was it just for her? He craned his head up. They looked at each other. How much do you know about me? he asked her. He'd tried quizzing her over dinner on what she knew and why she'd been sent to Tyr to intercept him, but she'd played mysterious, and, to be fair, he wasn't able to tell her exactly why he was on his way to the sleeper service. Oh, I know all about you, she said softly, seriously. Then she looked down. Well, I know the facts. I suppose that's not everything. He lowered his head to the pillow again. Yes, it was just for her. Mm hmm she said. She continued to stroke his chest. You must have loved her a lot. After a moment, he said, I suppose I must have. She thought he sounded sad. There was a pause, then he sighed again, and in a more cheerful voice he said, What about you? Ever a guy? No, she said with a laugh that might have held a trace of scorn. Maybe one day. She shifted a little and circled his nipple with the tip of her tongue for a moment. I'm having too much fun being a girl. He reached down and pulled her up to kiss her. Then, in the silence, a tiny chime sounded in the room. She broke off. Yes, she said, breathing hard and scowling. I'm very sorry to intrude, said the ship, making no great effort to sound sincere. May I speak to Mr. Gaynarphone? Alva made an exasperated noise and rolled off the man. Good grief! Can't it wait? Gaynor her phone said. Yes, probably, said the ship reasonably, as though this had just occurred to it. But people usually like to know this sort of thing immediately, or so I thought. What sort of thing? The sentient module Scopola Franqui is dead, the ship told him. It conducted a limited destruct on the first day of the war. We have only just heard. I'm sorry. Were you close? Gaynor Hofoen was silent for a moment. No. Well, no, not that close. But I'm sorry to hear it. Thank you for telling me. Could it have waited? The ship asked conversationally. It could, but I suppose you weren't to know. Oh, well, sorry. Good night. Yes, good night, the man said wondering at his feelings. Ulver stroked his shoulder. That was the module you lived on, wasn't it? He nodded. We never really got on, he told her. Mostly my fault, I suppose. He turned his head to look at her. I can be a scumbag sometimes, frankly. He grinned. I'll take your word for it, she said, climbing back on top of him. Part 10. Heavy Messing. Chapter 1. Grief! Nothing worked! The fate amenable to Change's ordnance, directed at the Alench drone ship, just disappeared, snatched away to nowhere. It had to react quickly to deal with the collapsing wormholes as they slammed back, now endless, towards its displacers. How could anything do that? And had the watching Alench warships noticed? 
The little Elench drone flew on, a few seconds away from its home ship. I confess I just tried to destroy your drone, the fate sent the appeal to reason. I make no apologies. Look what happened. It enclosed a recording of the events. Now will you listen? There seems little point in trying to destroy the machine. Just get away from it. I'll try to work out another way of dealing with it. You had no business attempting to interfere with my drone, the appeal to reason replied. I am glad that you were frustrated. I am happy that the drone appears to be under the protection of the entity. I take it as an encouraging sign that it is so. What? Are you mad? I'll thank you to stop impugning my mental state with such regularity and allow me to get on with my job. I have not informed the other craft of your disgraceful and illegal attack on my drone. However, any further endeavors of a similar nature will not be treated so leniently. I shall not try to reason with you. Goodbye and farewell. Where are you going? I am not going anywhere. Chapter 2 The General Contact Unit, Grey Area, was about to rendezvous with the General Systems Vehicle Sleeper Service. The GCU had gathered its small band of passengers in a lounge for the occasion. One of the ship's skeletal slave drones joined them as they watched the view of hyperspace behind them on a wall screen. The GCU was making the best speed it could, rushing beneath the skein at a little over 40 kilolites on a gently decreasing curved course that was now almost identical to that of the larger craft approaching from astern. This will require a coordinated full engine shutoff on displace, the small cube of components that was the drone told them. For an instant, none of us will be within my full control. Gaynor Hafoen was still trying to think of a cutting remark when the drone chert line said, Won't slow down for you, eh? Correct, the slave drone said. Here it comes, said Elva Seish. She sat cross-legged on a couch, drinking a delicately scented infusion from a porcelain cup. A dot appeared in the representation of space behind them. It rushed towards them, growing quickly. It swelled to a fat, shining ovoid that rushed silently underneath them. The view dipped quickly to follow it, beginning to perform a half-twist to keep the orientation correctly aligned. Gaynar Hafoen, standing near where Ulva sat, had to put his hand out to the back of the couch to steady himself. In that instant, there was a sensation of a kind of titanically enveloping slippage, the merest hint of vast energies being gathered, cradled, unleashed, contained, exchanged, and manipulated. Unimaginable forces called into existence seemingly from nothing to writhe momentarily around them, collapse back into the void, and leave reality. From the perspective of the people on the grey area, barely altered. Olva Seish tsked as some of her infusion spilled into the cup's saucer. The view had changed. Now it snapped to a grey-blue expanse of something curved, like a cup of cloud seen from the inside. It pivoted again and they were looking at a series of vast steps like the entrance to an ancient temple. The broad shelves of the stairs led up to a rectangular entrance lined with tiny lights. A dark space beyond twinkled with still smaller lamps. The view drew back to reveal a series of such entrances arranged side by side, the rest of which were closed. Above and below, set into the faces of the steps, were smaller doors, all similarly shut. Success, the slave drone said. The view was changing again as the ship was drawn slowly backwards towards the single opened bay. Gaynar Hafoen frowned. We're going inside, he asked the slave drone. It swiveled to face him, paused just long enough for the human to form the impression he was being treated like some sort of cretin. Well, yes, it said slowly, as one might to a particularly dim child. But I was told... Welcome aboard the sleeper service, said a voice behind them. They turned to see a tall, angular, black-dressed creature walking into the lounge. My name is Amorphia. Chapter 3 The drone returned to the appeal to reason and was taken back aboard. Seconds passed. Well? the fate amenable to change asked. There was a brief pause, a microsecond or so. Then, It's empty, the appeal to reason sent. Empty? Yes. It didn't record anything. It's like it never went anywhere. 
Are you sure? Take a look for yourself. A data dump followed. The fate amenable to change shunted it into a memory core it had set up for just such a purpose the moment it had realized what the accession was almost a month earlier. It was the equivalent of a locked room, an isolation ward, a cell. More information poured out of the appeal to reason, a gushing river of data trying to flood in after the original data dump. The culture ship ignored it. Part of its mind was listening to the howling, thumping noises coming out of that locked room. Information flickered between the appeal to reason and the sober council an instant before the fate sent its own warning signal. It cursed itself for its procrastination, even if its warning would almost certainly have gone unheeded anyway. It signaled the distant, war-ready de Lenchcraft instead, begging them to believe the worst had happened. There was no immediate reply. The appeal to reason was the nearer of the two Alentia ships. It turned and started accelerating towards the fate. It broadcast, tight-beamed, lasered and field-pulsed vast, impossibly complicated signals at the culture craft. The fate squirted back the contents of that locked room, evacuating it. Then it swiveled and powered up its engines. So I am going somewhere, it thought, and moved off, away from the appeal to reason, which was still signalling wildly and remained on a heading taking it straight for the culture ship. The fate raced outwards, powering away from the Alentia vessel and heading out on a great curve that would take it rolling over the invisible sphere that was the closest approach limit it had set. The sober council was moving off on an opposite course from the appeal to reason, which was still following the culture ship. A direction which would turn into an intercept course if they all held these headings. Oh, shit, the fate thought. They were still close enough to each other to just talk, but the fate thought it ought to be a little more formal, so it signalled. From GCU Fate Amenable to Change, Culture, to Explorer Ship Sober Council, whoever. Whatever you are, if you advance on an intercept course on the far side of the closest approach limit, I'll open fire. No further warnings. No reply. Just the blaze of multiband mania from the appeal to reason following behind it. The Sober Council's course didn't alter. The fate concentrated its attention on the last known locations of the three other Elench craft, the trio which the break-even had said were all war-configured. The other two couldn't be ignored, but the new arrivals had to constitute the greatest threat for now. It scanned the data it had on the specifications of the Elench craft, calculating, simulating, wargaming. Grief, to be doing this with ships that were practically culture ships. The simulation runs came out equivocal. It could easily deal with the two craft, even staying within range of the accession, as though that was a wise limitation anyway. But if the other three joined in the fun, and certainly if they attacked, it could well find itself in trouble. It signalled the break-even again. Still nothing. The fate was starting to wonder what the point was of sticking around here. The big guns would start arriving in a day or two. It looked like it was going to be in some sort of ludicrous continual chase with the two Alentia ships until then, which would be tiresome, with the possibility that the other three war-ready Alentia ships might join in, which would be downright dangerous. And after all, there was that war fleet on its way. What more was it usefully going to be able to do here? Certainly it could keep a watch on the accession, see if it did anything else interesting, but was that worth the risk of being overwhelmed by the Alench, or even by the accession itself, if it was as invasive as it now appeared to be? Enough of its drones, platforms and sensor platforms might be able to evade the Alenchers for the time it took until the other craft got here. They could keep watch on the situation, couldn't they? Ah, to hell with this, it thought to itself. It dodged unexpectedly along the surface of the closest approach limit producing corresponding alterations in the headings of the two Alentia ships. It speeded up for a while, then slowed until it was stopped relative to the accession. The position it held now was such that if you drew a line between the accession and the direction it was expecting the MSV not embedded here to arrive from, it would be on that line too. The fate signalled the two Alentia ships once more, trying to get sense from the appeal to reason and any reply at all from the Sober Council. It was careful to target the last known positions of the break-even and its two militarily configured sister ships as well, still trying to elicit a response. None was forthcoming. It waited until the last possible moment when it looked like the appeal to reason was about to ram into it in its enthusiasm to overwhelm it with signals, then broke away from it, heading straight out, directly away from the accession. The fate amenable to change's avatars began the task of telling the human crew what was happening. Meanwhile, 
the ship turned onto a course at a right angle to its initial heading and powered away at maximum acceleration. The appeal to reason targeted its effector on the fleeing culture ship as it curved out, trying to intercept it. But the attack, configured more as a last attempt to communicate, was easily fended off. That wasn't what the fate was concerned about. It watched that imaginary line from the accession to the MSV not invented here, focusing, magnifying its attention on that line's middle distance. Movement. Probing filaments of effector radiations. Three foci clustered neatly around that line. The Alentia ship break even and its two militarily configured sister craft had been awaiting it. Congratulating itself on its perspicacity, the GCU headed on out, leaving the immediate vicinity of the accession for the first time in almost a month. Then its engines stopped working. Chapter 4 I was told, Gaynor Hofoen said in the travel tube to the blank-faced and cadaverous ship's avatar, that I'd be off here in a day. What do I need quarters for? We are moving into a war zone, the avatar said flatly. There is a good chance that it will not be possible to offload the Grey Area or any other ship between approximately sixteen and one hundred plus hours from now. A deep, dark gulf of the sleeper service's cavernous interior space was briefly visible sliding past, then the tube car zipped into another tunnel. Gaynor Hafoen stared at the tall, angular creature. You mean I might be stuck on here for four days? That is a possibility, the Avatar said. Gaynor Hafoen glared at the Avatar, hoping he looked as suspicious as he felt. Well, why can't I stay on the grey area? he asked. Because it might have to leave at any moment. The man looked away, swearing softly. There was a war on, he supposed, but even so, this was typical SC. First the grey area was allowed on board the sleeper service when he'd been told it wouldn't be, and now this. He glanced back at the avatar, which was looking at him with what could have been curiosity or just gormlessness. Four days on the sleeper. He'd thought earlier, stuck on the module, that he'd be grateful when he could leave Ulva Seish and her drone behind on the GCU while he came aboard the sleeper service, but as it turned out, he wasn't. He shivered and imagined that he could still feel Elva's lips on his from when they had kissed goodbye just a few minutes earlier. The flashback tremor passed. Wow, he thought to himself and grinned. That was like being an adolescent again. Two nights, one day. That was all he and Elva had spent together as lovers. It wasn't remotely long enough, and now he'd be stuck aboard here for up to four nights. No, well, it could be worse. At least the Avatar didn't look like it was the one he'd slept with. He wondered if he was going to see Dajil at all. He looked at the clothes he was wearing, standard loose fatigues from the grey area. Wasn't this how he'd been dressed when he and Dajil had last parted? He couldn't recall. Possibly. He wondered at his own subconscious processes. The tube car was slowing. Suddenly it was stopped. The Avatar gestured to the door that rolled open. A short corridor beyond led to another door. Gaynor Hafoen stepped into the corridor. I trust you find your quarters acceptable, he heard the Avatar say quietly behind him. Then a soft brrrring noise and a faint draught on his neck made him look back in surprise. The travel tube had gone. The transparent tube door was closed and the corridor behind him was empty. He looked about, but there was nowhere the Avatar could have gone. He shrugged and continued onto the door ahead. It opened onto a small lift. He was in it for a couple of seconds, then the door rotated open and he stepped out, frowning into a dimly lit space full of boxes and equipment that somehow looked vaguely familiar. There was a strange scent in the air. The lift door snicked closed behind him. He saw some steps over to one side in the gloom, set into a curved stone wall. They really did look familiar. He thought he knew where he was. He went to the steps and climbed them. He came up from the cellar into the short passageway which led to the main door on the ground story of the tower. The door was open. He walked down the passageway to it and stood outside. Waves beat on the shining, sliding shingle of the beach. The sun stood near noon. One moon was visible, a pale eggshell half-hidden in the fragile blueness of the sky. 
The smell he'd recognized earlier was that of the sea. Birds cried from the winds above him. He walked down the slope of beach towards the water and looked about. It was all pretty convincing. The space couldn't really be all that big. The waves were perhaps a little too uncomplicated, a little too regular further out. But it suddenly looked like you were seeing for tens of kilometers. The tower was just the way he remembered it, the low cliffs beyond the salt marsh equally familiar. Hello? he called. No answer. He pulled out his pen terminal. Very amusing, he said. Then frowned, looking at the terminal. No telltale light. He pressed a couple of panels to institute a systems check. Nothing happened. Shit. Aha! said a small, crackly voice behind him. He turned to see a black bird folding its wings on the shelf of stones behind him. Another captive, it cackled. Chapter 5 The fate amenable to change let its engine fields race for a moment, running a series of tests and evaluation processes. It was as if its traction fields were just sinking through the energy grid, as if it wasn't there. It tried signalling, telling the outside universe of its plight, but the signals just seemed to loop back, and it found itself receiving its own signal a picosecond after it had sent it. It tried to create a warp, but the skein just seemed to slide out of its fields. It attempted displacing a drone, but the wormhole collapsed before it was properly formed. It tried a few more tricks, finessing its field structures and reconfiguring its senses in an attempt at least to understand what was going on. But nothing worked. It thought. It felt curiously composed, considering. It shut everything down and let itself drift, floating gradually back through the four-dimensional hypervolume towards the skein of real space, propelled by nothing more than the faint pressure of radiations expelled from the energy grid. Its avatars were already starting to explain the change in the situation to its human crew. The ship hoped the people would take it calmly. Then, the accession seemed to swell, bulging as though under an enormous lens, reaching out towards the culture ship with a vast, enclosing scoop of presence. Well, here we go, the ship thought. Should be interesting. Chapter 6 No, please, the Avatar said. The woman shook her head. I've thought about it. I don't want to see him. The Avatar stared at Dajil. But I brought him all this way, it cried. Just for you, if you knew. Its voice trailed off. It brought its feet up onto the front of the seat and put its arms round its legs, hugging them. They were in Dajil's quarters, inside another version of the tower's interior, housed within the GCU jaundiced outlook. The Avatar had come straight here after leaving Gaynor Hafoen in the main bay, where the original copy of the tower, the one Dajil Jilian had spent forty years living in, had been moved to when the ship had converted all its external spare mass to engine. It had thought she would be pleased that the tower had not had to be destroyed, and that Gaynor Hafoen had finally been persuaded to return to her. Dajil continued watching the screen. It was a replay of one of her dives amongst the triangular rays in the shallow sea that was now no more, as seen from a drone which had accompanied her. She watched herself move amongst the gracefully undulating wings of the great gentle creatures. Swollen. Awkward. She was the only graceless thing in the picture. The Avatar didn't know what to say next. The sleeper service decided to take over. Dajil, it said quietly, through its representative. The woman looked round, recognizing the new tone in Amorphia's voice. What? Why don't you want to see him now? I... She paused. It's just been too long, she said. I think... I suppose, for the first few years, I did want to see him again, to... To... She looked down, picking at her fingernails. I don't know. Oh, to try and make things all right. The grief, that sounds so lame. She sniffed and looked upwards at the translucent dome above her. 
I felt there were things we needed to have said that we never did say to each other, and that if we did get together, even for a little while, we could work things out, draw a line under all that happened, tie up loose ends, that that sort of thing, you know," she said, looking bright-eyed at the avatar. "Oh, Dajil," thought the ship. "How wounded about the eyes." I know," it said. "But now you feel that too much time has passed." The woman smoothed her hand over her belly. She nodded slowly, looking at the floor. "Yes," she said. "It's all too long ago. I'm sure he's forgotten all about me." She glanced up at the avatar. "And yet he is here," it said. "Did he come to see me?" She asked it, already sounding bitter. No, and yes, the ship said. He had another motive, but it is because of you he is here. She shook her head. No, she said. No, too much time. The avatar unfolded itself from the seat and crossed to where Dajil sat. It knelt down before her, and hesitantly. Extended one hand towards her abdomen. Looking into her eyes, it gently placed its palm on Dajil's belly. Dajil felt dizzy. She could not recall Amorphia ever having touched her before, either under its own control or under the sleeper services. She put her own hand on top of the avatar's. The creature's hand was steady, soft, and cool. And yet, it said. In some ways, no time has passed. Dajil gave a bitter laugh. "Oh yes," she said. "I've been here doing nothing except growing older." "But what about him?" she asked. And suddenly there was something fierce about her voice. "How much has he lived in forty years? How many loves has he had?" "I don't believe that signifies Dajil," the ship told her quietly. "The point is that he is here." You can talk to him. The two of you can talk. Some resolution might be achieved. It pressed very lightly on her belly. I believe it can be achieved. She sighed heavily. She looked down at her hand. I don't know, she said. I don't know. I need to think. I can't. I need to think. Dajil, the ship said. And the avatar took her hand in both of its. Were it possible, I would give you as long as you could desire, but I am not able to. There is some urgency in this. I have what might be termed an urgent appointment near a star called Esperi. I cannot delay my arrival, and I would not want to take you with me there. It is too dangerous. I would like you to leave in this ship as soon as possible. She looked hurt. The sleeper thought, "I won't be forced into this." She told it, "Of course not." It said. It attempted a smile and patted her hand. Why not sleep on it? Tomorrow will be soon enough. Chapter Seven. The attitude adjuster watched the attacking craft fall amongst the surrounding shield of ships. They had no time to move more than fractionally from their original positions. Their weaponry did their moving for them, focusing on the incoming target as it plunged into their midst. A scatter of brightly flaring missiles preceded the killing time. A hail of plasma bubbles accompanied it, and CAM, AM, and nanohole warhead cluster munitions burst everywhere around it like a gigantic firework, producing a giant orb of scintillations. Many of the individual motes themselves detonated in a clustering hyperspherical storm of lethal sparks, followed sequentially by another and another echelon of explosions, erupting amongst the wave of ships in a layered hierarchy of destruction. The attitude adjuster scanned the real-time reports coming back from its warp lock. One was caught by a nano hole vanishing inside a vast burst of annihilation. Another was damaged beyond immediate repair by an AM munition, and dropped behind, engines crippled. Fortuitously, neither were crewed by affronters. Most of the rest of the warheads were dealt with. 
The fleet's own replies were fended, detonated, or avoided by the attacker. No sign of the craft using its effectors to do more than cause interference, fittingly interrogating and probing amongst the collected mass of ships. The focus of its attention had begun near the centre of the third wave of craft and was spirally erratically outwards, occasionally flicking further out towards the other waves. The attitude adjuster was puzzled. The killing time was a torturer class rapid offensive unit. It could be, it ought to be, devastating the fleet for these instants as it tore through it. It was capable of... Then it realised. Of course, it was a grudge. The attitude adjuster experienced a tingle of fear, merged with a kind of contempt. The killing time's effector focus was a few ships away now, spiralling out towards the attitude adjuster. It signalled hurriedly to the five rapid offensive units immediately around it. Each listened, understood, and obeyed. The killing time's effector focus flicked from craft to craft, still coming closer. You fool, the attitude adjuster thought almost angry at the attacking ship. It was behaving stupidly, irresponsibly. A culture craft should not be so prideful. It had thought the venom directed at itself by the killing time in its signal to it back at Pittance had been bluster, cheap bravado. But it had been worse. It had been sincere. Wounded self-esteem. Upset that it personally had been subject to a ruse designed to destroy it, as though its enemies cared an iota who it was. The attitude adjuster doubted this was an attack sanctioned by the Killing Time's peers. This wasn't war. This was peevishness. This was taking it personally when, if there was anything war could be characterized as being, it was impersonal. Idiot. It deserved to perish. It did not merit the honor it doubtless thought would accrue to it for this reckless and selfish act. The surrounding warships completed their changes, just in time. When the attacking ship's effector targeted the first of those craft, the focus did not flit onto the next as it had with all the rest. Instead, it stayed, latching on, concentrating and strengthening. The ROU caved in alarmingly quickly. The attitude adjuster guessed that it was made to reconfigure its engine fields to focus them inside its mind. There was a sort of signalled shriek an instant before communication was lost, but the exact nature of its downfall was hidden in an accompanying shower of cam warheads which obliterated it instantaneously. A mercy. It would have been a grisly way for a ship to die. But too quick, thought the attitude adjuster. It was sure the attacker would have let the ROU, which the killing time had mistaken for the attitude adjuster, tear its intellect apart with its engines for longer if it had been totally fooled. The cam dusting had been either a coup de grace or a howl of frustration. Perhaps both. The attitude adjuster signalled to the rest of the fleet, instructing them too to impersonate itself. But even as it watched the ROU which had been attacked alongside it disappear astern in a fragmenting cage of radiations, it began to be afraid. It had originally contacted the five nearest ships, hoping that the first one found and interrogated by the attacker systems would fool the killing time into believing it had found the one ship it was obviously seeking. But that was stupid. It sensed the torturer class ship's effectors sweep over the craft on the far side of the hole in the wave of ships which the ROU's destruction had created. Insufficient, elapsed time, the attitude adjuster whispered to itself. The ROU being quizzed at the moment was still reconfiguring its internal system signature to resemble that of the attitude adjuster. The effector sweep flicked away from it, dismissing. The attitude adjuster quailed. It had made itself a target. It should have... Here it came. A feeling of... No. It had gone. Swept over it. Its own disguise had worked. It had been dismissed too, like the ROU alongside. The effector focus jumped to another craft still further away. The attitude adjuster was dizzy with relief. It had survived. The plan still held. The huge, filthy trick they were pulling was free to continue. The way to the accession lay open. The other minds in the conspiracy would commend it if it survived. The... But it mustn't think of the other ships involved. It had to accept responsibility for what had happened. It and it alone. It was the traitor. It would never reveal who had instigated this ghastly, gigadeath crime-risking scheme. It had to assume the blame itself. 
It had wrestled with the mind of pittance, and pressed it when it had insisted it would die rather than yield, but it had had no choice. It had allowed the human on pittance to be destroyed, but it had fastened its effector on his puny animal brain when it had seen what was happening to him. It had read the animal's brain state, copied it, sucked it out of him before he died, so that at least he might live again in some form. Look, it had the file here. There it went. It had fooled the surrounding ships. It had lied to them, sent them messages from... from the ships it could not bear to think about. But it was the right thing to do. Or was it just the thing it had chosen to believe was the right thing to do, when the other ships, the other minds, had persuaded it? What had its real motives been? Had it not just been flattered to be the object of such attention? Had it not always resented being passed over for certain small but prestigious missions in the past, nursing a bitter resentment that it was not trusted because it was seen as being... What? A hardliner, too inclined to shoot first, too cynical towards the soft ideologies of the meat beings, too mixed up in its feelings about its own martial prowess and the shaming moral implications of being a machine designed for war. All those things, a little, perhaps. But that wasn't all its fault. And yet, did it not accept that one had an irreducible ethical responsibility for one's own actions? It did. And it accepted that, and it had done terrible, terrible things. All the attempts it had made to compensate had been eddies in the flood, tiny retrograde movements towards good, entirely produced by the ferocious turbulence of its headlong rush to ill. It was evil. How simple that reductive conclusion seemed. But it had been obliged. And yet it could not say by whom, so it had to accept the full responsibility for itself. But there were others, and yet it, it could not identify them, and so the full weight of their distributed guilt bore down on the single point that was itself. Unbearable. Insupportable. But there were others. And yet still it could not bear to think of them. And so somebody, some other entity looking in from outside, say, would have to conclude, would it not, that perhaps these others did not really exist? That the whole thing, the whole ghastly abomination that was this plot was its idea, its own little conspiracy, thought up and executed by itself alone. Was that not the case? But that was so unfair. That wasn't true. And yet it could not release the identities of its fellow plotters. Suddenly it felt confused. Had it made them up? Were they real? Perhaps it ought to check. Open the place where they were stored and look at the names just to make sure that they were even the names of real mines, real ships, or that it was not implicating innocent parties. But, but that was terrible. Whichever way it fell after that, that was awful. It hadn't made them up. They were real. But it couldn't prove it because it just couldn't reveal them. M maybe it ought to just call the whole thing off. Maybe it ought to signal all the other ships around it to break away, stop, retreat, or just open their comm channels so they could accept signals from other ships, other minds, and be persuaded of the folly of their cause. Let them make up their own minds. They were intelligent beings, no less than it. What right had it to send them to their deaths on the strength of a heinous, squalid lie? But it had to. And yet, still, no. No, it couldn't say who the others had been. I mustn't think of them. And it couldn't possibly call off the attack. It couldn't. No, no. Grief, meat, stop. Stop it. Let it go. Sweet nothingness. Anything was better than this racking, tearing uncertainty. Any horror preferable to the wrenching dreadfulness boiling uncontrollably in its mind. Atrocity. Abomination. Giga death crime. It was worthless and hateful. Despicable and foul. It was wrung out. Exhausted and incapable of revelation or communication. It hated itself and what it had done more, much more than it had ever hated anything. More it was sure than anything had ever been hated in all existence. No death could be too painful or protracted. And suddenly it knew what it had to do. It decoupled its engine fields from the energy grid and plunged those vortices of pure energy deep into the fabric of its own mind, tearing its intellect apart in a supernova of sentient agony. 
Chapter 8 Gaynar Hafoan reappeared, exiting from the front door of the tower. Up here, croaked a thin, hoarse voice. He looked up and saw the black bird on the parapet. He stood there watching it for a moment, but it didn't look like it was coming down. He frowned and went back into the tower. Well? it asked when he joined it at the summit of the tower. He nodded. Locked, he confirmed. The bird had insisted that he was a captive along with it. He'd thought maybe there was just something wrong with his terminal. It had suggested he attempted to get out the way he'd come in. he just tried. The lift door in the tower's cellar was closed, and as solid and unmoving as the stones surrounding it. Gaynar Hafoan leant back against the parapet, staring with a troubled expression at the tower's translucent dome. He'd had a quick look at each of the levels as he'd climbed the winding stair. The tower's rooms looked furnished and yet bare as well. All the personal stuff he and Dajil had added to it missing. It was like the original had been when they'd first arrived on Telaturia forty-five years ago. Told you. But why? Gaynor Hafoan asked, trying not to sound plaintive. He'd never even heard of a ship keeping somebody captive before. Cars were prisoners, the bird told him, sounding oddly pleased with itself. So you're not an avatar, you're not part of the ship? Nah, I'm an independent entity, me, the bird said proudly, spreading its feathers. It turned its head almost right round, glancing backwards. Currently being followed by some bloody missile, it said loudly. But never mind. It rotated its head back to look at him. So, what did you do to annoy the ship? it asked, black eyes twinkling. Gaynor Hafoan got the impression it was enjoying his dismay. Nothing, he protested. The bird cocked its head at him. He blew out a breath. Well, he looked around at where he was, his brows flexed. Yes, well, from our surroundings, maybe the ship doesn't agree. Oh, this is nothing, said the bird. This is just a bay, just a hangar sort of thing, not even a click long. You should have seen the one outside when we still had an outside. Whole sea we had, whole sea and a whole atmosphere, two atmospheres. Yes, the man said. Yes, I heard. Sort of all for her, really. Except it turned out its nibs had an ulterior motive, too. All that stuff became engine, you know. But otherwise, it was all for her, for all that time. The man nodded. It looked like he was thinking. You're him, aren't you? The bird said. It sounded pleased with itself. I'm who? He asked. The one that left her. The one that was here with her. The real here, I mean. The original here. Gaynor Hafoan looked away. If you mean Dajil, yes. She and I lived in a tower like this one once, on an island that looked like this place. Aha! The bird said, jumping up and down and shaking its feathers. I see. You're the bad guy. Gaynor Hafoan scowled at the bird. Fuck you, he said. It cackled with laughter. That's why you're here. Ha <laughs> ha! You'll be lucky to get off at all, you will. Ha ha ha! And what did you do, asshole? Gaynor Hafoan asked the bird, more in the hope of annoying the creature than because he really cared. Ow, oh, the bird said, drawing itself up and settling its feathers down in a dignified sort of way. I was a spy, it said proudly. A spy? Oh, yes, the bird said, sounding smug. Forty years I spent listening, watching, reporting back to my master, using the stored ones that were going back, left messages on them. Forty years and never once discovered. Well, until three weeks ago. Rumbled then. Maybe even before. Can't tell, but I did my best. Can't ask better than that. It started preening itself. The man's eyes narrowed. Who were you reporting back to? None of your business, the bird said looking out from its preening. It took a precautionary couple of hop steps backwards along the parapet, just to make sure it was well out of reach of the human. Gaynor Hafoan crossed his arms and shook his head. What's this fucking crazy ship up to? Oh, it's off to see the accession, the bird said. At some lick, too. This thing at Asperi? the man asked. Heading straight for it, the bird confirmed. What it told me, anyway. Can't see why it'd lie. Could be, I suppose. Wouldn't put it past it, but don't think it is. Straight for it, as it's been for the past twenty-two days. You want my opinion? Gonna give you it anyway. I think it's stooping. The creature put its head on one side. Familiar with the term?
Gaynor Hafoa nodded absently. He didn't like the sound of this. Stooping, the bird repeated. If you ask me, things mad. Been a bit loopy the last four decades. Gone totally off the boulevard now. In the hills and bouncing along full speed for the cliff edge. That's my opinion. And I've been around its loopiness for forty years. I know, I do, I can tell. This thing's dafter than a jar of words. I'm getting away on the jaundiced outlook if it'll let me. It being a sleeper. Don't think the jaundice bears me any ill will. Shouldn't think he does. No. Then, as though remembering a rich joke, it shook its head and said, The bad guy, ha! Huh? You, on the other hand, you'll be here forty years, you will, chum, if it doesn't wreck itself ramming this accession thing, that is. Ha! Huh. How'd it get you here anyway? You come here to see Al perpetually pregnant? Gaynor Hafoan looked momentarily stricken. It's true, then. She never did have the child. Yep, the bird said. Still in her. Supposed to be hale and hearty, too, if you can believe that. So I was told. Sounds unlikely. Addled, I'd have thought, or turned to stone by now. But there you are. Either way, she just isn't having it. Ha! The man pinched his lower lip with his fingers, looking troubled. What did you say brought you here? The bird asked. It waited. A hem, it said loudly. What? The man asked. The bird repeated the question. The man looked like he still hadn't heard, then he shrugged. I came here to talk to a dead person, a story. They've all gone, said the bird. And you heard? The man shook his head. Not one of the live ones, he said. Somebody without a bod, somebody who stored in the ship's memory. Nah, they've gone too, the bird said, lifting one leg to peck briefly underneath. Drop them off at Dreve. It continued. Complete download, upload, a crossload, whatever you call it. Didn't even keep copies. What? The man said, stepping towards the bird. Seriously? The creature said, taking a couple of hops backwards on the stonework of the parapet. Honest? The man was staring at it now. No, really. So I was told. I could have been misinformed. Can't see why, but it's possible. Down it, though. They've gone. That was my information. Gone. Ship said it didn't want even the copies aboard, just in case. The man stared wildly at it for a bit longer. Just in case what? he cried, stepping forward again. Well, I don't know, the bird yelped, hopping backwards and flexing its wings, ready to fly. Gaynor Hafoan glared at the creature for a moment longer, then spun round, grasping the stones of the parapet with both hands, and staring out into the false panorama of sea and cloud. Chapter 9 then, it was in the wrong place. As simple as that. The fate amenable to change looked around. Incredulous. Stars. Just stars. Initially alien, in a way a starscape had never been before. This wasn't where it had just been. Where was the accession? Where were the Alentia ships? Where was Esperi? Where was this? It called up from scratch position establishing routines no ship ever had to call up after they'd run through them in the very earliest part of their upbringing and self-fettling in the mind equivalent of infancy. You did this sort of thing once, to show the mind supervising your development you could do it. Then you forgot about it, because nobody ever lost track of where they were, not over this magnitude of scale. And yet, here it was having to do just that. Quite bizarre. It looked at the results. There was something almost viscerally relieving about the discovery that it was still in the same universe. For a moment, it had been contemplating the prospect of finding itself in a different one altogether. At the same time, at least one part of its intellect experienced a corresponding flicker of disappointment for exactly the same reason. It was nowhere near Esperi. Its position was thirty light-years away from where it had been, apparently, a moment ago. The nearest star system was an undistinguished red giant blue-white dwarf double called Prietze. The binary lay roughly along that same imaginary straight line that joined the accession to the incoming MSV not invented here. Where the ship itself had ended up was even closer to that imaginary line. The fate checked itself over. Unharmed, uninvaded, unjeopardized, uncontacted. It replayed those last few picoseconds while it multiple-checked its systems. The accession rushed out to meet it. It was enveloped in... what? Skein fabric? Some sort of ultra-dense field? It all happened at close to hyperspace light speeds. The outside universe was pinched off, and in the following moment, 
There was an instant of nothing, no external input whatsoever, a vanishingly minute, perfectly indivisible fraction of a picosecond, when the fate was cut off from everything, no outside sensor data whatsoever. Events within the ship itself had continued as normal, or rather its internal state had remained the same for that same infinitesimally microscopic instant. There had been no time for anything appreciable to actually happen. In its mind, there had been time for the hyperspatial quanta equivalents to alter their states for a few cycles, so time had still elapsed. But outside, nothing. Then the skein or field substrate had vanished, snapping out of existence to precisely nowhere, disappearing too quickly for the ship's sensors to register where it had gone. The fate replayed that section of its records slower and slower, until it was dealing with the equivalent of individual frames— the smallest possible subdivision of perception and cognizance the culture or any other involved knew of. And it came down to four frames, four snapshots of recent history. In one frame, the accession seemed to be rushing out, accelerating out to meet it. In the next, the skein, field, had wrapped itself almost totally around the ship, at a distance of perhaps a kilometre from ship's centre, though it was hard to estimate leaving only a tiny hole staring out to the rest of the universe on the opposite side of the ship from the accession. In the third frame, the total cut-off from the universe was in place, and in the next it had gone, and the fate had moved, or had been moved, thirty light-years in less than a picosecond. How the fuck does it do that? the ship wondered. It started checking that time was still working properly directing its sensors at distant quasars, which had been used as time reference sources for millennia. It also started checking that it was not in the centre of some huge projection, extending its still-stopped engine fields like vast whiskers, feeling for the, as far as anybody knew, unfakeable reality that was the energy grid and minutely, and randomly, scrutinising sections of the view around it, searching for the equivalent of pixels or brush strokes. The fate amenable to change was experiencing a sense of elation at having survived what it had feared might be a terminal encounter with the accession. But it was still worried that it had missed something, that it had been interfered with somehow. The most obvious explanation was that it had been fooled, that it had been tricked into moving itself here under its own power, or been moved to this position by another attractive force over time. The further implication was that the interval when it had been moving had somehow been expunged from its memory. That would be bad. The very idea that its mind was not absolutely inviolate was anathema to a ship. It tried to accustom itself to the idea that this was what had happened. It tried to steel itself to the prospect that, at the very least, it would have to have its mental processes investigated by other minds to establish whether it had suffered any lasting damage or had had any unpleasant subroutines or even personalities buried in its mind state during the time it had been, effectively, unconscious. Horrible, horrible thought. The check time results started coming in. Relief and incredulity. If this was the real universe and not a projection, or, worse still, something it had been persuaded to imagine for itself inside its mind, then there had been no extra elapsed time. The universe thought it was exactly the same time as the mind's internal clock did. The ship felt stunned even while another part of its intellect, an opt-in semi-autonomous section, was restarting its engines and discovering they worked just fine, the ship was trying to come to terms with the fact that it had been moved thirty light-years in an instant. No displacer could do that. Not with something the size it was, not that quickly, not over that sort of distance. Certainly not without even the merest hint that a wormhole had been involved. Unbelievable. I'm in a fucking outside context situation, the ship thought, and suddenly felt as stupid and dumbstruck as any muddy savage confronted with explosives or electricity. It sent a signal to the not invented here, then it tried contacting its remotes, still presumably in station around the accession. No reply. And no sign of the Elentia ships either. Anywhere. The accession was invisible too, but then it would be from this distance. The fate nudged itself tentatively towards the accession. Almost immediately, its engines started to lose traction, their energies just seeming to disappear through the energy grid as though it wasn't there. It was a progressive effect, worsening as it proceeded, and with the implication that about a light minute or so further in towards the accession, it would lose grid adhesion altogether. It had only progressed about ten light seconds in, 
It slowed while it still could, and backed up until it was the same distance away from the accession as it had been when it had found itself dumped here in the first place. Once it was there, its engines responded perfectly normally again. It had made the initial attempt in infraspace. It tried again in ultraspace with exactly the same result. It went astern once more and resumed its earlier position. It tried moving at a right angle to its earlier course. The engines worked as they always did. Weird. It hove to again. Its avatars amongst the crew started yet another explanation regarding what was going on. It compiled a preparatory report and signalled it to the MSV not invented here. The report crossed with the MSV's reply to the Fate's earlier signal. Stuttered type point, M32 tra point at 4.28.882.8367 from MSV not invented here to GCU Fate amenable to change. I don't understand. What's going on? How did you get to where you are? Started type point M32, tra point at 4.28.882.8379. From GCU fate amenable to change to MSV not invented here. Thereby hangs a tale. But in the meantime, I'd slow down if I were you and tell everybody else coming this way to slacken off too and get ready to draw up at 30 years off the E. I think it's trying to tell us something. Plus, there is a record I wish to claim. Chapter 10 The rest of that day passed, and the following night. The black bird, which had said its name was Gravius, had flown off, saying it was tired of his questions. The next morning, after checking that his terminal still did not work, and the lift door in the cellar remained locked and unresponding, Gaynor Hafoen walked as far along the shingle beach as he could in each direction, a few hundred steps in each case, before he encountered a gelatinously resilient field. The view beyond looked perfectly convincing, but must be a projection. He discovered a way through part of the salt marsh and found a similar force field wall a hundred steps into the hummocks and little creeks. He came back to the tower to wash his boots free of the authentically fine and clinging mud he'd had to negotiate on his way through the salt marsh. There was no sign of the black bird he'd talked to the day before. The avatar Amorphia was waiting for him, sitting on the shelf of Shingle Beach, sloping down to the restive sea, hugging its legs and staring out at the water. He stopped when he saw it, then came on. He walked past it and into the tower, washed his boots and came back out. The creature was still there. Yes, he said, standing looking down at it. The ship's representative rose smoothly up, all angles and thin limbs. Close up in that light, there was a sort of unmarked, artless quality about its thin, pale face. Something near to innocence. I want you to talk to Dajil, the creature said. Will you? He studied its empty-looking eyes. Why am I being kept here? You are being kept because I would like you to talk to Dajil. You are being kept here because I thought this model would be conducive to putting you in the mood to talk to her about what passed between you forty years ago. He frowned. Amorphia had the impression the man had a lot more questions, all jostling each other, to be the first one asked. Eventually, he said, Are there any mind-state stories left on the sleeper service? No, the avatar said, shaking its head. Does this refer to the ruse that brought you here? The man's eyes had closed briefly. They opened again. Yes, I suppose so, he said. His shoulders seemed to have slumped, the Avatar thought. So, he asked, did you make up the story about Zrain Enhof Tramha, or did they? The Avatar looked thoughtful. Gart Kepilesa Zrain Enhof Tramha Afayaf Damniskat, it said. She was a mind-state story. There's quite an interesting story associated with her, but not one I ever suggested be told to you. I see, he said, nodding. So, why, he asked. Why what? the creature said, looking puzzled. Why the ruse? Why did you want me here? The avatar looked at him for a moment. You're my price, Gaynar Hoffolan, it told him. Your price, he said. The avatar smiled suddenly and put out one hand to touch one of his. Its touch was cool and firm. Let's throw stones, 
it said, and with that it walked down towards the waves breaking on the slope of shingle. He shook his head and followed the creature. They stood side by side. The avatar looked along the great sweep of shining, spray-glistened stones. Every one a weapon, it muttered, then stooped to pick a large pebble from the beach and threw it quickly, artlessly out at the heaving waves. Gaina Hafoen selected a stone too. I've been pretending to be eccentric for forty years, Gaina Hafoen, the avatar said matter-of-factly, squatting again. Pretending? the man asked, chucking the stone on a high arc. He wondered if it was possible to hit the far force wall. The stone fell, vanishing into the tumbling scape of waves. I have been a diligent and industrious component of the special circumstances section for all that time, just awaiting the call, the ship told him through the avatar. It glanced over at him as he bent, choosing another stone. I am a weapon, Gaynor Hofoen, a deniable weapon. My apparent eccentricity allows the culture proper to refuse any responsibility for my actions. In fact, I am acting on the specific instructions of an SC committee, which calls itself the Interesting Times Gang. The creature broke off to heave a stone towards the false horizon. Its arm was a blur as it threw. The ur made a burring noise, and Gaynor Hafoen felt the wind of the movement on his cheek. The avatar's momentum spun it round in a circle. Then it steadied itself gave a brief, almost childish grin, and peered out at the stone disappearing into the distance. It was still on the upward part of its arc. Gaynor Hafoen watched it too. Shortly after it started to drop, the stone bounced off something invisible and fell back into the waters. The avatar made a contented noise and looked pleased with itself. However, it said, when it came to it, I refused to do what they wanted until they delivered you to me. That was my price. You. It smiled at him. You see? He weighed a stone in his hand. Just because of what happened between Dajil and me. The avatar smiled, then stooped to choose another stone, one finger to its lips, childlike. It was silent for a while, apparently concentrating on the task. Gaynor Hafoen continued to weigh the stone in his hand, looking down at the back of the avatar's head. After some moments, the creature said, I was a fully functioning, throughput biased, culture general systems vehicle for three hundred years, Gaynor Hafoen. It glanced up at him. Have you any idea how many ships, drones, people, human and not human, pass through a GSV in all that time? It looked down again, picked a stone, and leaved itself upright once more. I was regularly home to over two hundred million people. I could, in theory, hold over a hundred thousand ships. I built smaller GSVs, all capable of building their own ship children, all with their own crews, their own personalities, their own stories. To be host to so much is to be the equivalent of a small world or a large state, it said. It was my job, and my pleasure, to take an intimate interest in the physical and mental well-being of every individual aboard, to provide, with every appearance of effortlessness, an environment they would each find comfortable, pleasant, stress-free, and stimulating. It was also my duty to get to know those ships, drones, and people, to be able to talk to them and empathize with them, and understand, however many of them wish to indulge in such interactions at any one time. In such circumstances, you rapidly develop, if you don't possess it originally, an interest in, even a fascination with, people and you have your likes and dislikes. The people you do the polite minimum for and are glad to see the back of. The ones you like and who interest you more than the others. The ones you treasure for years and decades if they remain, or wish could have stayed longer once they've gone, and subsequently correspond with regularly. There are some stories you follow up into the future, long after the people concerned have left. You trade tales with other GSVs, other minds gossiping, basically, to find out how relationships turned out, whose careers flourished, whose dreams withered. Amorphia leant back and over, and then threw the stone almost straight up. The creature jumped a half-meter or so into the air as it released the missile, 
which climbed on into the air until it bounced off the invisible roof, high above, and fell into the waves twenty meters offshore. The Avatar clapped its hands once, seemingly happy. It stooped again, surveying the pebbles. You try to keep a balance between indifference and nosiness, between carelessness and obsession, it went on. Still, you have to be ready for accusations of both types of failure, keeping them roughly in numerical accord, and within the range experienced by your peers is one measure of success. Perfection is impossible. Additionally, you have to accept that in such a large collection of personalities and stories, there will be some loose ends, some tales which will fizzle out rather than conclude neatly. Those don't matter, so long as there are some which do work out satisfactorily, and especially so long as the ones you have taken the greatest interest in, and have been personally particularly involved with, work out. It looked up at him from where it squatted. Sometimes you take a hand in such stories, such fates. Sometimes you know or can anticipate the extent to which your intervention will matter, but on other occasions, you don't know and can't guess. You find that some chance remark you've made has affected somebody's life profoundly, or that some seemingly insignificant decision you've come to has had profound and lasting consequences. It shrugged, looked down at the stones again. Your story, yours and Dajil's, was one a little like that, it told him. It was I who was instrumental in deciding that you ought to be allowed to accompany Dajil Gillian to Telaturia, it said, rising. It held two stones this time, one larger than the other. I could see how finely balanced the decision was between the various parts of the committee concerned. I knew the decision effectively rested with me. I got to know you, and I made the decision. It shrugged. It was the wrong decision. It threw the larger stone on a high trajectory, then looked back at the man as it hefted the smaller stone. I've spent the last forty years wishing I could correct my mistake. It turned and threw the other pebble low and fast. The stone flew out over the waves and struck the larger rock about two meters before it plunged into the water. They burst into whizzing fragments and a brief cloud of dust. The avatar turned to him again, with a small smile on its face. I agreed to pretend to become eccentric. Suddenly, I had a freedom very few craft ever have, able to indulge my whims, my fantasies, my own dreams. It flexed one eyebrow. Oh, in theory, of course, we can all do that. But minds have a sense of duty and a conscience. I was able to become very slightly eccentric by pretending to be very eccentric, while knowing that I was in fact being more martially responsible than anybody else, and, in appearing to enjoy such eccentricity with a clear conscience, even enhance my eccentric reputation. Other craft looked on and thought that they could do what I was doing, but not for long, and therefore that I must be thoroughly, thoroughly weird. As far as I know, not one guessed that my conscience was kept clear by having a purpose serious enough to compensate for even the most clown-like disguise and regressively obsessive behavior. It folded its arms. Of course, it said, you don't normally expect to be continually reminded of your folly every day for four decades, but that was the way it was to be. I didn't anticipate that at the start, though it became a useful and fit part of my eccentricity. I picked Dajil up a short while into my internal exile. She was the single last significant loose end from my previous life. All the other stories didn't concern me so directly, or bore no similar weight of responsibility, or were well on the way to being satisfactorily resolved, or decently forgotten through the due process of time elapsing and people changing. Only Dajil remained my responsibility. The Avatar shrugged. I had hoped to talk her around— to cause her to accept whatever it was had happened to you both and get on with the rest of her life. Bearing the child would be the signal that she was mended. That labor would be the end of her travails. That birth mark an end. The avatar looked away, out to sea for a moment, a frown creasing its brows. I thought it would be easy, it said, looking back at him. I was so used to power to being able to influence people, ships, and events. It would have been such a simple thing even to have tricked her body into giving birth, 
I could have started the process chemically or via an effector while she was asleep, and by the time she was awake, there would have been no going back. That I was sure my arguments, my reasoning, grief, even my cherished facility at emotional blackmail would find scarcely more of an obstacle in her will than all my technologies could face in her physiology. It shook its head quickly. It was not to be. She proved intransigent. I hoped to persuade her, to shame her, indeed, by the very totality of my concern for her, recreating all you see here, the Avatar said, glancing round at the cliffs, marsh, tower, and waters, for real, turning my entire outer envelope into a habitat just for her and the creatures she loved. Amorphia gave a sort of dipping sideways nod and smiled. I admit I had another purpose as well, which such exaggerated compassion would only help disguise. But the fact is, my original design was to create an environment she would feel comfortable within and into which she would feel safe bringing her baby, having seen the care I was prepared to lavish just on her. The Avatar gave a rueful smile. I got it wrong, it admitted. I was wrong twice, and each time I harmed Dajil. You are, and this is, my last chance to get it right. And what am I supposed to do? Why, just talk to her, the Avatar cried, holding its arms out, and suddenly Gaynor Hafoen was reminded of Alva. What if I won't play along, he asked. Then you may get to share my fate, the ship's representative told him breezily, whatever that may be. At any rate, I may keep you here until you do at least agree to talk to her, even if, for that meeting to take place, I have to ask her to return after I've sent her away to safety. And what is likely to be your fate? Oh, death, possibly, the Avatar said, shrugging with apparent unconcern. The man shook his head. You haven't got any right to threaten me like that, he said, with a sort of half-laugh in his voice he hoped didn't sound as nervous as he felt. Nevertheless, I am threatening you like that, Gaynor Hafoan, the Avatar said, bending at the waist to lean towards him for a moment. I am not as eccentric as I appear. But consider this. Only a craft that was predisposed to a degree of eccentricity in the first place would have taken on the style of life I did forty years ago. The creature drew itself upright again. There is an accession without precedent at Esperi, which may lead to an infinitude of universes, and a level of power, orders of magnitude, beyond what any known involved currently possesses. You've experienced the way SC works, Gaynor Hafon. Don't be so naive as to imagine that minds don't employ strong-arm methods now and again, or that in a matter resounding with such importance, any ship would think twice about sacrificing another consciousness for such a prize. My information is that several minds have been forfeited already. If, in the exceptional conditions prevailing, intellects on that scale are considered fair game, think about how little a single human life is likely to matter. The man stared at the Avatar. His jaw was clenched, his fists balled. You're doing this for a single human life, he said. Two, if you count the fetus. No, Gaynor Hafoan, the Avatar said, shaking its head. I'm doing this for myself because it's become an obsession. Because my pride will not now let me settle this any other way. Dajil, in that sense, and for all her self-lacerating spite, has won. She forced you to her will forty-five years ago, and she has bent me to hers for the last forty. Now, more than ever, she has won. She has thrown away four decades of her life on a self-indulgent sulk, but she stands to gain by her own criteria. You have spent the last forty years enjoying and indulging yourself, Gennar Hafoen, so perhaps you could be said to have won by your criteria. And, after all, you did win the lady at the time, which was all you then wanted, remember? That was your obsession. Your folly. Well, the three of us are all paying for our mutual and intermingled mistakes. You did your part in creating the situation. All I'm asking is that you do your part in alleviating it. And all I have to do is talk to her. The man sounded skeptical. The creature nodded. Talk. Try to understand. Try to see things from her perspective. Try to forgive or allow yourself to be forgiven. Be honest with her and with yourself. I'm not asking you to stay with her and be her partner again or form a family of three. 
I just want whatever it is that has prevented her from giving birth to be identified and ameliorated, removed if possible. I want her to resume living and her child to start. You will then be free to return to your own life. The man looked out to sea, then at his right hand. He looked surprised to see he was holding a stone in it. He threw it as hard and as far as he could into the waves. It didn't travel half the distance to the distant invisible wall. What are you supposed to do? The man asked the creature. What is your mission? Get to the exertion, Amorphia said. Destroy it if that's deemed necessary, and if it's possible. Perhaps just draw a response from it. And what about the affront? Added complication, the avatar agreed, squatting once more and looking around the stones around its feet. I might have to deal with them too. It shrugged and lifted a stone, hefting it. It put the stone back and chose another. Deal with them, Gaina Hafoen said. I thought they had an entire war fleet heading there. Oh, they do, the Avatar said from beach level. Still, you have to try, don't you? It stood again. Gaina Hafoen looked at it, trying to see if it was being ironic or just disingenuous. No way of telling. So when do we get into the thick of things, he asked, trying to skip a flat stone over the waves without success. Well, Amorphia said, the thick of things probably starts about thirty light years out from the point of the accession itself these days. The avatar stretched, flexing its arm far back behind it. We should be there this evening, it said. Its arm snapped forward. The stone whistled through the air and skipped elegantly over the tops of half a dozen waves before disappearing. Gaynor Hafoen turned and stared at the Avatar. This evening, he said. Time is a little tight, the Avatar said with a pained expression, again peering into the distance. It would be for the best for all of us if you talked to Dajil soon. It smiled vacuously at him. Well, how about right now? The man said, spreading his hands. I'll see, the creature said and turned abruptly on its heel. Suddenly, there was a reflecting ovoid like a giant silver egg stood on its end where the avatar had been. The displacer field vanished almost before the man had time to register its existence, seeming to shrink and collapse almost instantly to a point, and then disappearing altogether. The process produced a gentle... Chapter 11 the killing time plunged intact through the third wave of ancient culture ships. They rushed on towards the accession. It fended off a few more of the warheads and missiles which had been directed at it, turning a couple of the latter back upon their own ships for a few moments before they were detected and destructed. The hulk of the attitude adjuster fell astern behind the departing fleet, coasting and twisting and tumbling in hyperspace, still heading away from and outstripping the killing time as it braked and started to turn. There was only a vestigial fourth wave. Fourteen ships. They were targeting it now. Had it known there were so few in the final echelon, the killing time would have attacked the second wave of ships. Oh well. Luck counted too. It watched the attitude adjuster a moment longer to ensure it really was tearing itself apart. It was. It turned its attention to the remaining fourteen craft. On its suicide trajectory, it could take them all on and stand a decent chance of destroying perhaps four of them before its luck ran out. Maybe a half dozen if it was really lucky. Or it could push away and complete its brake turn accelerate maneuver to make a second pass at the main fleet. Even if they'd be waiting for it this time, it could reckon on accounting for a good few of them, again in the four to eight range. Or it could do this. It pulled itself round the edge of the fourteen ships in the rump of the fleet as they reconfigured their formation to meet it. Bringing up the rear, they had had more warning of its attack and so had had time to adopt a suitable pattern. The killing time ignored the obvious challenge and temptation of flying straight into their midst and flew past and round, targeting only the outer five craft nearest it. They gave a decent account of themselves, but it prevailed, dispatching two of them with engine field implosions. This was, it had always thought, a clean, decent and honourable way to die. The pair of wreckage shells coasted onwards. The rest of the ships sped on unharmed, chasing the main fleet. Not one of the ships turned back to take it on. The killing time continued to break, oriented towards the fast-vanishing warfleet and the region of the accession. 
Its engine fields were gouging great livid tracks in the energy grid as it backpedaled furiously. It encountered the ROU, which had dropped aft with engine damage, falling back towards it as the killing time slowed, and the other craft coasted onward and struggled to repair its motive power units. The killing time attempted to communicate with the ROU, was fired upon, and tried to take the craft over with its effector. The ROU's own independent automatics detected the ship's mind starting to give in. They tripped a destruct sequence, and another hypersphere of radiation blossomed beneath the skein. Shit, thought the killing time. It scanned the hypervolumes around itself. Nothing threatening. Well, damn me, it thought as it slowed. I'm still alive. This was the one outcome it hadn't anticipated. It ran a systems check. Totally unharmed, apart from the self-inflicted degradation to its engines. It slackened off the power, dropping back to normal maxima and watching the readouts. Significant degradation from here in about a hundred hours. Not too bad. Self-repairing would take days at all engines stop. Warhead stocks down to 40%. Remanufacturing from first principles would take four to seven hours, depending on the exact mix it chose. Plasma chambers at 96% of efficiency, about right for the engagement system use profile according to the relevant charts and graphs. Self-repair mechanisms champing at the bit. It looked around, concentrating on the view astern. No obvious threats. It let the self-repairers make a start on two of the four chambers. Full reconstruction time, 204 seconds. Entire engagement duration, 11 microseconds. Hmm, it had felt longer, but then that was only natural. Should it make a second pass? It pondered this while it signalled the shoot them later and a couple of other distant mines with details of the engagement. Then it copied to the steely glint without leaving the comm channels open. It needed time to think. It felt excited, energized, repurified by the engagement it had undergone. Its appetite was whetted. A further pass would be no holds barred, multi-destructional, not a series of semi-defensive side actions while it concentrated on searching for one individual ship. This next time, it could really get nasty. On the other hand, it had inflicted a more than reasonable amount of damage on the fleet for no ship loss whatsoever, and a barely significant degradation to its operational capacity. It had ignored the advice of a superior mind in wartime, but it had triumphed. It had gambled and won, and there was a kind of unexpected elegance in cashing in its gains now. To pursue the matter further might look like obsessive self-regard, like ultra-militarism, especially now that the original object of its ire had been bested. Perhaps it would be better to accept whatever praise and or calumny might now be heaped upon it and resubmit itself to the jurisdiction of the culture's war command structure though it was starting to have its doubts about the part of the steely glint in all this. It drew level with the debris clouds left by the two ships destroyed in the final wave of the war fleet. It let them drop astern. The wreck of the attitude adjuster came tumbling slowly towards it in hyperspace, coasting, slowing, drifting gradually back up towards the skein. Externally, it looked unharmed. The killing time slowed to keep pace with the slackly somersaulting craft. It probed the attitude adjuster carefully with its senses. Its effector targeted on the other ship's mind, ready on the instant. In human terms, this was like taking somebody's pulse while keeping a gun stuck in their mouth. The attitude adjuster's weakened engine fields were still tearing at what was left of its mind, teasing and plucking and forcing it apart, strand by strand, demolishing and shredding and cauterizing the last remaining quanta of its personality and senses. It looked like there had been a dozen or so affronters aboard. They were dead, too, killed by stray radiations from the mine's self-destruction. The killing time felt a modicum of guilt, even self-disgust, at what it had forced upon what was still, in a sense, a sister ship, even while another part of its selfhood relished and gloried in the dying craft's agonies. The sentimental side won out. It blitzed the stricken vessel with a profusion of plasma fire from its two operational chambers and kept station with the expanding shell of radiation for a few moments, paying what little respect the traitor ship might be due. The killing time came to its decision. It signalled the steely glint, informing the GCV that it would accept suggestions from now on. It would harry the war fleet if that was required, or it would join in whatever stand was to be made near Esperi if that was thought the best use that could be made of it. It would probably still die, 
but it would meet its fate as a loyal and obedient component of the culture, not some sort of rogue ship pursuing a private feud. Then it slowly rammed its engines back to normal full power, pulling itself forward to a vanishingly brief moment of rest before powering onwards, accelerating hard and setting a hyperbolic course, skirting around the fleet's more direct route, heading for the location of the accession. It should still get there before the war fleet. Chapter 12 What? I said I'd made up my mind. I won't talk to him. I won't see him. I don't even want to be on the same ship with him. Take me away. I want to leave. Now. Dajil Gillian gathered her skirts about her and sat heavily on the seat in the circular room under the translucent dome. Dajil! exclaimed Amorphia, going down on its knees in front of her, eyes wide and shining. It made to take her hands in its, but she pulled them away. Please, see him. He has agreed to see you. Oh, has he? she said scornfully. How magnanimous of him. The avatar sat back on its haunches. It looked at the woman, then it sighed and said, Dajil, I've never asked anything of you before. Please, just see him. For me. I never asked anything of you, the woman said. What you gave me you gave unasked. Some of it was unwanted, she said coldly. All those animals, those other lives, those eternal births and childhoods, mocking me. Mocking you? the avatar exclaimed. But... Dajil sat forward, shaking her head. No, I'm sorry, that was wrong of me. Now she reached out and took Amorphia's hands. I'm truly grateful for all you've done for me, ship, I am. But I don't want to see him. Please take me away. The avatar tried to argue on for a while longer, but to no avail. The ship considered a lot of things. It considered asking the grey area, still in its forward main bay, to dip inside the woman's brain, the way it had insinuated its way into Gaina Hofoans, to discover the truth of the events on Teleturia, and to implant the dream of the long-dead captain Zrain Enhof Tramau, not that that had proved either required or particularly well done. It considered requesting that the GCU used its effectors to make her want to have the child. It considered displacing chemicals or biotechs which would force Dajil's body to have the child. It considered using one of its own effectors to do the same thing. It considered just displacing her into Gaina Hofoen's proximity, or he into hers. Then it came up with a new plan. Very well, the avatar said eventually. It stood. He will stay. You may go. Do you wish to take the bird Gravius with you? The woman looked perplexed, even confused. I... she began. Yes. Yes, why not? It can't do any harm, can it? No, the avatar said. No, it cannot. It bowed its head to her. Goodbye. Dajil opened her mouth to speak, but the avatar was displaced away at the same instant. The sound it left behind was like a pair of hands giving a single, gentle clap. Dajil closed her mouth, then put both her hands over her eyes and lowered her head, doubling up as well as she was able to. Next moment there was another distant noise, and from down the winding stairs she heard a thin, hoarse voice cry out, Wah, shit, grief, where? Then there was a confused flutter of wings. Dajil closed her eyes. Then there was another, closer-sounding pop. Her eyes flicked open. A young woman, slim and black-haired, was sitting looking surprised in the middle of the floor, dressed in black pyjamas and reading a small, old-fashioned book. Between her bottom and the room's carpet, there was a neat circle of pink material, still in the process of collapsing, air expelling flutteringly round the edges. Around her floated a small snowstorm of white particles, settling with a feather-like slowness. She jerked once, as though she had been leaning back on something which had just been removed. What? The fuck? she said softly. She looked slowly around from side to side. Her gaze settled on Dajil. She frowned for a moment, then some kind of understanding imposed itself. She quickly completed her review of her surroundings, then pointed at the other woman. Dajil, she said. Dajil Jillian, right? Dajil nodded. Chapter 13 
Stuttered Type Point M32 Tra Point at 4.28.885.3553. From Eccentric Shoot Them Later to LSV Serious Callers Only. It was the attitude adjuster. It is dead now. Signal plus diaglyphs enclosed. Stuttered Type Point M32 Tra Point at N4.28.885.3740. From LSV Serious Callers Only. To eccentric, shoot them later. Not a pleasant way to go. Your friend, the killing time, deserves congratulations and probably merits therapy. However, as I'm sure it would point out, it is a warship. This implicates the steely glint. The attitude adjuster was its daughter and was demilitarized, supposedly, by it seventy years ago. I trust your friend will treat the SG's subsequent operational suggestions with a degree of caution. Indeed. But then, as it seems quite enthusiastically intent upon achieving a glorious death at the earliest possible opportunity anyway, it is hard to see what more the steely glint can do to place it in further jeopardy. Whatever. We must leave that machine to its own fate. My concern now is that the evidence for the conspiracy is starting to look pretty damning, even if it is still circumstantial. I suggest we go public. Implicating the steely glint while it is in charge of the military developments around the accession will only make us look like the guilty parties. We must ask ourselves what we have to gain. The war fleet from Pittance is underway and must arrive there in any event. Exposing the conspiracy will do nothing to challenge it. The best we might hope for would be the worst for the chances of resisting the affront's purpose. That is, the removal from influence and general disgrace of the steely glint and its core conspirators. It pains me to say it. But I still think we must let this subsequence of events run its course before we can consider broadcasting our suspicions. Hold for now and gather what more weight of evidence we might, the better to tip the scales with our accusations when the time does come. Frankly, I was hoping you would say that. My own instinct, if I may slur my intellect with such an archaic term, was to keep quiet, but I suspected I was merely being timorous, and so wanted to make the suggestion we publicise with a positive skew, so that you could not be infected by any undue reticence on my part. What of the volume around the E itself? Heard any more? Imbecile. Last I heard regarding the Asperi thing itself, there was no more news of the ZE stargazers, and the FATC was still recovering from the effects of its unexpected trip. Everybody else seems to have taken the hint and is hanging back. Well, except for the affronters borrowed fleet and our old chum, of course. How are things in the realm of our three-legged friends? Speaking personally, Screece Orbital is as pleasant as could be, and as devoutly unmilitarised as one might wish a peace faction world to be. No more news, then. Glad to hear Screece is so fair. The Hamomder are most accommodating and gracious hosts. I think I may have lost a couple of my Adiran crew members to the local pleasure dens for the duration, but otherwise I have no complaints. Stay safe and peace, like they say, be with you. Chapter 14 The briefest of introductions completed, they stood facing each other in the circular room under the translucent dome. So, Dajil said, inspecting the other woman from toe to crown. You're his latest, are you? Alva frowned. Oh, no, she said, shaking her head. He's mine. Dajil looked as though she wasn't sure how to answer that. Miss Seish, welcome aboard the jaundiced outlook, said a disembodied voice. I'm sorry this is all so precipitate, but I have just received instructions from the sleeper service that you are to be evacuated aboard myself forthwith. Thank you, Alva said, gazing round the room. What about Trit Line? It has expressed a desire to stay aboard the grey area, the jaundiced outlook told her. I thought those two were getting on suspiciously well, the girl muttered. Dajil looked like she wanted to ask something, but in the end said nothing. After a moment, she stood up, putting her hand to the small of her back as she did so with a tiny grimace. She indicated the table to one side. Please, she said. I was about to have dinner. Will you join me? I was about to have breakfast, Alva said, and nodded. Certainly. They sat at the table. Alva held up the small book she'd been reading, and which she still held in one hand. I don't want to be rude, but would you mind if I just finish this chapter? she asked. Dajil smiled. Not at all, she murmured. Alva gave a winning smile and stuck her nose back in the slim volume. 
Excuse me, said a small, hoarse voice from the doorway. What the fuck's going on, then? De Gilles looked over at the black bird, Gravius. We're being evacuated, she told it. You can live in the cellar. Now go away. Well, thanks for your hospitality, the bird spluttered, turning and hopping down the winding stairs. That yours? Alva asked De Gilles. Supposed to be a companion, the old woman said, shrugging. Actually, just a pain. Alva nodded sympathetically and returned to her book. De Gilles ordered food for two. A slave tray appeared with plates, bowls, jugs and goblets. A couple of floor-running servitors appeared and started clearing up the debris left by Alva's sudden displacement from the grey area to the jaundiced outlook. The featherlight stuffing from the pillows proved a particular problem. The serving tray started arranging the place settings on the table and distributing the bowls of food. De Gilles watched this graceful, efficient display in silence. Alva Seish gazed intently at the book and turned a page. Then a ship-slaved drone appeared. It floated by Dajil's shoulder. Yes, she said. We are now leaving the bay, the jaundiced outlook told her. The journey to the GSV's external envelope will take two and a half minutes. Oh, right. Thank you, Dajil said. Alva Seish looked up. Would you ask the grey area to transfer my stuff here? That has already been accomplished, the drone said, already moving towards the stairs. Ulver nodded again, put the book's marker ribbon into place, closed the volume, and placed it by the side of her plate. Well, Miss Gillian, she said, clasping her hands on the table, it would appear we are to be travelling companions. Yes, Dajil said. She started to serve herself some food. Have you been with by a long, Miss Seish, wasn't it? she asked. Olva nodded. Only met him a few days ago. I was sent to try and stop him getting here. <laughs> Didn't work out. I ended up stuck on a tiny little module thing with him, just us and a drone for days. It was awful. Dajil passed a couple of bowls over to Olva. Still, she said, smiling thinly, I'm sure romance blossomed. Like hell, Olva said, levering a few sunbread pieces from a bowl into her plate. Couldn't stand the man. Only slept with him the last couple of nights. Partially bored him, I suppose. All the same, he's quite handsome. Bit of a charmer, really. I can see what you saw in him. So, what went wrong between you two? Dajil stopped, a spoon poised on the way to her mouth. Olva smiled disarmingly at her over jaws munching a mouthful of fruit. Dajil ate, drank a little wine, and dabbed at her lips with a napkin before replying. I'm surprised you don't know the whole story. Who ever knows the whole story? Olva said airily, waving her arms about. She put her elbows on the table. I bet even you two don't know the whole story, she said more quietly. Again, Dajil took her time before replying. Perhaps the whole story isn't worth knowing, she said. The ship appears to think it is, Olva replied. She tried some fermented fruit juice, rolling it round her palate before swallowing it and saying, Seems to have gone to an awful lot of trouble to arrange a meeting between you two. Yes. Well, it is an eccentric, isn't it? Olva thought about this. Very intelligent eccentric, she said. I'd imagine that something it thought worth pursuing like that might be, you know, worthy of concern. No? she asked, with a self-deprecating grimace. Dajil shrugged. Ships can be wrong, too, she said. What, so none of it matters a damn? Olva said casually, choosing a small roll from a basket. No, Dajil said. She looked down, smoothing her dress over her belly. But... She stopped. Her head went down, and she was silent for a while. Olva looked over, concerned. Dajil's shoulders shook once. Alva, wiping her lips, threw down the napkin and went over to the other woman, squatting by her and tentatively putting out one arm round her shoulders. Dajil moved slowly towards her, eventually resting her head on the crook of Alva's neck. The ship drone entered from the winding stair. Alva shooed it away. A couple of screens on the far wall lit up, showing what Alva guessed was the hull of the sleeper service, gradually drawing further away. Another couple of screens showed an approaching wall of gridded grey. She guessed the two minutes the drone had mentioned earlier had passed. Dajil cried for a little while. After a few minutes, she asked, 
Do you think he still loves me at all? Alva looked pained for a moment. Only the ship's sensors registered the expression. She took a deep breath. At all, she said. Yes, definitely. Dajil sniffed hard and looked up for the first time. She gave a sort of half-despairing laugh as she wiped some tears from her cheeks with her fingers. Ulva reached for a clean napkin and completed the job. <laughs> it doesn't really mean much to him anymore, Dajil said to the younger woman. Does it? Ulva folded the tear-darkened napkin carefully. It matters to him a lot now because he's here. Because the ship brought him here just for this, hoping the two of you would talk. But the rest of the time, Dajil said, sitting upright again and throwing her head and hair back. The rest of the time it doesn't really bother him, does it? Ulva took an almost exaggeratedly deep breath, looked as though she was about to vehemently deny this, then sank down on her haunches and said, Look, I hardly know the man. She gestured with her hands. I learned a lot about him before we met, but I only met him a few days ago, in very odd circumstances. She shook her head, looking serious. I don't know who he really is. Dajil rocked back and forward in her seat for a moment, staring at the meal on the table. Well enough, she said, sniffing. You know him well enough. She smoothed her ruffled hair as best she could. She stared up at the translucent dome for a moment. All I knew, she said, was the person he became when he was with me. She looked at Ulva. I forgot what he was like all the rest of the time. She took Ulva's hand in hers. You're seeing what he's really like. Ulva gave a long, slow shrug. Then, she said, looking troubled, a tone measured. He's all right, I think. The screens on the far side of the circular room showed fuzzy grids expanding, swallowing, disappearing. The last field approached, was pierced to reveal a black wash of space, and then, with a smear of rushing stars and the same barely perceptible feeling of dislocation Ulva and Gaynor Hafone had experienced two days earlier when they had arrived on board the sleeper service, the jaundiced outlook was free of the GSV and peeling away on a diverging course within its own concentric collection of fields. And what does that make me? Dajil whispered. Ulva shrugged. She looked down at Dajil's belly. Still pregnant? she suggested. Dajil stared at her. Then she gave a small laugh. Her head went down again. Ulva patted her hand. Tell me about it if you want. Dajil sniffed, dabbing at her nose with the folded napkin. Yes, I'm sure you really care. Oh, believe me, Ulva told her. Other people's problems have always held a profound fascination for me. Dajil sighed. Other people's are always the best problems to be involved with, she said ruefully. My thoughts exactly. I suppose you think I ought to talk to him too. Dajil said. Ulva glanced up at the screens again. I don't know. But if you have even the least thought of it, I'd take advantage of the opportunity now before it's too late. Dajil looked round at the screens. Oh, we've gone, she said in a small voice. She looked back at the other woman. Do you think he wants to see me? Ulva thought there was a tone of hopefulness in her voice. Her troubled gaze flitted from one of Ulva's eyes to the other. Well, if he doesn't, he's a fool, Ulva said, wondering why she was being so diplomatic. Ha, <laughs> Dajil said. She wiped her cheeks with her fingers once more and dragged her fingers through her hair. She reached into her dress and pulled out a comb. She offered it to Ulva. Would you? Ulva stood. Only if you say you'll see him, she said, smiling. Dajil shrugged. I suppose so. Ulva stood behind Dajil and began to comb her long, dark hair. Ship? Message. The jaundiced outlook here. I take it you've been listening. Want to contact the GSV? I was listening. 
I have already contacted the sleeper service. Mr. Gainahafoan and the Avatar Amorphia are aboard and on their way here. Fast work, Alva told it, and continued to gently comb Dajil's hair. They are on their way, she told her. Vire and the Avatar. Dajil said nothing. A couple of decks further down in the accommodation section, Amorphia turned to gain her phone as they walked down a corridor. And it might be best not to mention that we were displaced aboard at the same time as Ulver, it told the man. I'll try not to let it slip, he said sourly. Let's just get this over with, shall we? Definitely the right attitude, muttered the Avatar, stepping into a lift. They ascended to the impersonation of the tower. Chapter 15 Snug, encapsulated in a cobbled-together nest capsule deep inside the accommodation section of the ex-culture ship Heavy Messing, Captain Greydorn Late Setting 10 of the Farsight tribe watched the blip which represented the crippled hulk of the Attitude Adjuster fall astern on the hollow display, the screams of his uncle Rising Moon and the other affronters on the stricken vessel still ringing in his mind. A hazy cloud hung around the blip of the tumbling wreck, indicating where the ship's sensors estimated the culture warship, which the heavy messing still thought was a deluge of vessel, now was. With his uncle dead, the fleet was now under Greydorn's command. The urge to swing the whole assemblage about and bear down on the single culture ship was almost irresistible. But there would be no point. It was faster than any of their craft— the heavy messing's mind thought that the culture ship might have damaged its engines during its run into the attack, but even so, it could probably still outstrip any of the ships in the fleet, and so all such a course would accomplish would be to draw them away from their intended destination, without even the realistic prospect of revenge. They had to continue. Greydorn signalled to the six other craft which were crewed. Fellow warriors, no one feels the loss of our comrades more than I. However, our mission remains the same. Let our victory be our first revenge. The power we gain for our kind as a result of it will purchase the ability to punish all such crimes against us a millionfold. The attacker's duplication of a culture vessel's emission signature spectrum and field was astonishingly authentic, the heavy messing wrote on one of the screens in front of Greydorn. Their abilities have grown while you were asleep, ally, Greydorn told the ship. He felt his gas sack tense and contract as he spoke, wrote the words, ever conscious that anything he said might help give away the huge trick being played on the culture ships. You see the severity of the threat they now present? Indeed, the ship replied. I find it hateful that the deluge craft killed the attitude adjuster the way it appeared to. They will be chastised when we are in control of the entity at Asperi. Never fear. Part 11 Regarding Gravius Chapter 1 Gaynar Hafoan and the Avatar Amorphia appeared in the doorway at the head of the winding stair. Excuse me, Alva said, putting down the comb and patting Dajil on the shoulder. She walked towards the door. No, please stay, Dajil said behind her. Alva turned to the older woman. You sure? Dajil nodded. Ulva looked over at Gaynor Hafoan, whose gaze was fastened on Dajil. He seemed to shake himself out of his fixation and looked, then smiled at Ulva. Hi, he said. Yes, stay, whatever. He crossed to Dajil, who stood. They both looked awkward for a moment, then they embraced. That was awkward too over the bulge of Dajil's belly. Ulva and the Avatar exchanged looks. Please, let's all sit down, shall we? Dajil said. Baya, are you hungry? Not really, he said, drawing up a chair. I could use a drink. The four of them sat round the table. There was some small talk, mostly between Gaynor Hafoan and Dajil, with a few comments from Alva. The Avatar remained silent. It frowned once and glanced at the screens, which showed a perfectly banal view of empty space. Chapter 2 The sleeper service was a few hours out from the accession now. It was tracking the MSV not invented here and another too large culture craft, 
each a dark jewel set within a cluster of smaller ships. Warships, plus some GCUs and superlifters extemporized into combat service. The GCU different tan was also supposed to be in the volume, but it was not making itself obvious. The knot invented here was thirty light years out from Esperi, patrolling the spherical limit of the uniquely worrying engine field effect that the GCU fate amenable to change had reported days earlier. The sleeper service had briefly considered asking that the smaller craft copy its results to it, but hadn't bothered. The request would probably be refused, and it suspected whatever data the smaller craft was gathering weren't telling anybody very much anyway. The other two craft, the GSVs, what is the answer and why, and use psychology, were manoeuvring a half day and a full day further out, respectively. A faint layered smudge in the distance, about three quarters of the way round an imaginary sphere drawn around the accession, was almost certainly the approaching of front of war fleet. Around the accession itself. No sign whatsoever of the vanished stargazer fleet of the Zetetic Alench. The sleeper service readied itself for the fray. Maybe, in a sense, two frays. There was every chance that its own engines would fail the same way the fate amenable to changes had when it had moved towards the accession. But given the speed the sleeper service was travelling at, it could coast in towards the thing. It wouldn't have any directional control. It wouldn't be able to maintain its present speed or break. But it could get there. If it ought to, ought it? It checked its signal log as if it might have missed an incoming message. Still, nothing from those who had sent it here. The interesting Times gang seemed to have been observing com silence for days. Just the usual daily plea from the LSV serious callers only, the equivalent of an unopened letter, and just the latest in a series. The sleeper watched events on the jaundiced outlook, even as it prepared itself for the coming encounter near Esperi. Like a military commander drawing up war plans and issuing hundreds of preparatory orders, who cannot keep his or her attention from flicking to a microscopic drama being played out amongst a group of insects clinging to the wall above the table. The ship felt foolish, voyeuristic, and yet fascinated. Its thoughts were interrupted by the grey area sending from its main bay in the nose of the GSV. I'll be on my way then, if you don't need me any more. I'd rather you stuck around," the sleeper service replied. "Not when you're heading for that thing and the affronters. You might be surprised, I'm sure. However, I want to leave. Farewell, then," the GSV sent, opening the bay door. "I suppose this means another displace, if you don't mind. And if I do, there is an alternative, but I'd rather not use it." Well, if there is one, I want to use it. The jaundiced outlook declined, and it had humans aboard. Bugger the humans, and bugger the jaundiced outlook too. What's the alternative? Have you got superlifters capable of this sort of speed? No. What then? Just get to the rear of my field envelope. Whatever you say. The GCU quit its berth. Easing out into the confined space between the GSV's hull and the craft's innermost field layer, it took a few minutes for it to manoeuvre itself down the side of the giant ship and round the corner to the flat rear of the craft. When it got there, it found three other ships waiting for it. Who the hell are they? The GCU asked the larger ship. In fact, what the hell are they? It was something of a rhetorical question. The three craft were unambiguously warships. Slightly longer and fatter than the grey area itself, but tapering at either end to points surmounted with large spheres—spheres spheres which could logically only contain weaponry, quite a lot of weaponry, judging by the size of the globes. My own design. Their names are T three O U's four one one eight and seven three six. Oh, witty! You won't find them terribly good company. AI cores only. Semi slave to me. But they can operate together as a superlifter to get you down to manageable speeds. The GCU was silent for a moment. It moved in to take a position in the centre of the triangle the three ships had formed. T three O U's, it asked. Type three offensive units, by any chance? Correct. Many more like these hidden away. Enough. You have been busy all these years. Yes, I have. I trust I can rely on your absolute discretion for the next few hours, at any rate. 
You certainly have that. Good. Farewell. Thank you for your help. Glad to be of the small amount of service I was. Best of luck. I suppose I'll find out soon enough how things pan out. I imagine so. Chapter 3 the Avatar returned the main focus of its attention to the three humans on the jaundiced outlook. The two old lovers had moved from small talk to a post-mortem on their relationship, still without coming up with anything particularly interesting. We wanted different things, Dajil said to Gaina Hafoen. That's usually enough. I wanted what you wanted for a long time, the man said, swirling some wine round in a crystal goblet. The funny thing was, Dajil said, we were all right while it was just the two of us. Remember? The man smiled sadly. You two sure you want me here? asked Ulva. Dajil looked at her. If you feel embarrassed, she said. No, I, I just thought. Ulva's voice trailed off. They were both looking at her. She frowned. Okay, now I feel embarrassed. What about you two? Dajil asked evenly, looking from Ulva to gain a Hathorn. They exchanged looks. Each shrugged at the same time, then laughed, then looked guiltily at her. If they had rehearsed it, it could hardly have been more synchronized. Dajil felt a pang of jealousy, then forced herself to smile as graciously as she could. Somehow, the act helped produce the emotion. Chapter 4 Something was wrong. The Avatar's principal attention snapped back to its home ship. The grey area and the three warships were free of the GSV's envelope now, dropping back in their own web of fields and decelerating to velocities the GCU's engine could accommodate. Ahead lay the accession. The sleeper service had just carried out its first close track scan look at it, but the accession had changed. It had re-established its links with the energy grids, and then it had grown. Then it had erupted. It wasn't the sort of enlargement the fate amenable to change had witnessed and seemingly been transported by. That had been something based on the skein or on some novel formulation of fields. This was something incarnated in the ultimate fire of the energy grid itself, spilling across the whole sweep of infraspace and ultraspace and invading the skein as well, creating an immense spherical wavefront of grid fire boiling across three-dimensional space. It was expanding, quickly, impossibly quickly, sky-fillingly, explosively quickly, almost too quickly to measure, certainly too quickly for its true shape and form to be gauged. So quickly that there could only be minutes before the sleeper service ran into it, and far too quickly for the GSV to break or turn and avoid the conflagration. Suddenly, the Avatar was on its own. The sleeper briefly severed all connection with it while it concentrated on dispersing its own war fleet all about it. Some of the ships were displaced from deep inside its interior, snapping out of existence from within the thousands of evacuated bays where they had been quietly manufactured over the decades and reappearing in hyperspace, powered up and already heading outwards. Others, the vast majority, were revealed as the giant ship peeled back some of the outer layers of its field structures to reveal the craft it had hidden there over the past few weeks, loosing entire fleets of smaller ships like seeds disseminating from a colossal pod. When the Avatar was reconnected to the GSV, most of the ships had been distributed, scattered to the hypervolume in a series of explosive flurries, bombardments of ships, layers and blossoms of vessels like a whole deployed hierarchy of cluster munitions, every warhead a war craft, a cloud of vessels, a wall of ships rushing towards the blooming hypersphere of the accession. Chapter 5 the grey area watched it all happen, carried in its cradle of fields by the three silent warships. Part of it wanted to whoop and cry hurrah, seeing this detonation of material, sufficient to smash a war machine ten times, a hundred times the size of the approaching of front of fleet. Ah, the things you could do if you had the time and patience, and no treaties to adhere to or agreements to uphold. Another part of it watched with horror as the accession swelled, obliterating the view ahead, rampaging out like an explosion still greater than that of ships the sleeper service had just produced. It was like the energy grid itself had been turned inside out, 
as though the most massive black hole in the universe had suddenly turned white and bloated into some big bang eruption of fury between the universes. A forest-leveling storm capable of devouring the sleeper service and all its ships as though it were a tree and they mere leaves. The grey area was fascinated and appalled. It had never thought to experience anything like this. It had grown up within a universe almost totally free from threat, providing you didn't try to do anything utterly stupid like plunge into a black or a white hole. There was simply no natural force that could threaten a ship of its power and sophistication. Even a supernova held little threat handled properly. This was different. Nothing like this had been seen in the galaxy since the worst days of the Adiran War five hundred years earlier, and even then not remotely on such a scale. This was terrifying. To touch this abomination with anything less perfectly attuned to its nature than the carefully dispersed wings of an engine field would be like an ancient, fragile rocket ship falling into a sun, like a wooden sea ship encountering an atomic blast. This was a fireball of energies from beyond the remit of reality, a monstrous wall of flame to devastate anything in its path. Grief, this could swallow me too, thought the grey area. Meat shit. Same went for the jaundiced outlook, for that matter. It might be making peace with oneself time. Chapter 6 The sleeper service was having roughly similar thoughts. The combination of its own inward velocity and the outrushing wall of the accession's annihilating boundary implied they would meet in 140 seconds. The accession's ferocious expansion had begun immediately after the sleeper service had swept its active sensors across the thing. It had all started happening then, as though it was reacting. The sleeper service looked up its signal sequence log, searching for messages from the craft nearer to the accession. The fate amenable to change and the MSV not invented here were the closest craft. They had reported nothing. They were both now unreachable, either swallowed up within the event horizon of the accession's expanding boundary, or if it was reaching out specifically towards the sleeper service, stretching out a single limb rather than expanding omnidirectionally, obscured from the GSV's view by the sheer extent of that limb's leading edge. The sleeper signalled the GSV's what is the answer and why and use psychology both directly and via the grey area and the jaundiced outlook, asking them what they could see. Trying to contact them directly was probably pointless, the accession's boundary was moving so fast it looked like it was going to eclipse any returning signal, but there was a decent chance the indirect route might provide a useful reply before it encountered that event horizon. It had to assume the expansion was not equidirectional. It still had its second front, the affront's war fleet, even if that was vastly less threatening than what it was faced with now. The sleeper instructed its own warcraft to flee, to do all they could to escape the oncoming blast front of the accession's inflation. If the distension was localised, some at least might escape. They had anyway been launched towards the affront of fleet, not straight at the accession. The sleeper wondered with a fleeting sourness whether the bloating accession, or whatever was controlling it, was capable of appreciating this distinction. Whatever, it was done. The warcraft were on their own for the moment. Think. What had the accession done up until now? What could it possibly be doing? What was it for? Why did it do what it did? The GSV spent two entire seconds thinking. Back on the jaundiced outlook, that was long enough for the Avatar Amorphia to interrupt Dajil and say, Excuse me, I beg your pardon, Dajil. Uh, there has been a development with the accession. Then the sleeper swung its engine fields about, flourishing them into an entirely new configuration and instituting a crash stop. The giant ship poured every available unit of power it possessed into an emergency braking manoeuvre which threw up vast, livid waves of disturbance in the energy grid. Soaring tsunami of piled-up energies that rose and rose within the hyperspatial realm until they too threatened to tear into the skein itself and unleash those energies not witnessed in the galaxy for half a thousand years. An instant before the wave fronts ripped into the fabric of real space, the ship switched from one level of hyperspace to the other, ploughing its traction fields into the ultraspace energy grid and producing another vast tumbling swell of fricative power. The ship flickered between the two expanses of hyperspace, 
distributing the colossal forces at its command amidst each domain, hauling its velocity down at a rate barely allowed for in its design parameters, while equally strained steering units edged their own performance envelopes in the attempt to turn the giant craft, angling it slowly ever further away from the centre. For a moment, there was little enough to do. They were not sufficient to escape, but at least such actions made the point that it was trying to. All that could be done was being done. The sleeper service contemplated its life. Have I done good or bad, it thought, well or ill? The damnable thing was that you just didn't know until your life was over, well over. There was a necessary delay between drawing a line under one's existence and being able to objectively evaluate its effects, and therefore one's own moral worth. It wasn't a problem a ship was usually confronted with. Faced with, yes, that implied a degree of volition, and ships went into retreats or became eccentric all the time, declaring that they'd done their bit for whatever cause they had believed in or been part of. It was always possible to withdraw, to take stock and look back and try to fit one's existence into an ethical framework greater than that necessarily imposed by the immediacy of events surrounding a busy existence. But even then, how long did one have to make that evaluation? Not long. Probably not long enough. Usually one grew tired of the whole process or moved on to some other level of awareness before sufficient time had passed for that objective evaluation to come about. If a ship lived for a few hundred or even a thousand years before becoming something quite different, an eccentric, a sublimed, whatever, and its civilization, the thing of which it had been a part when it had been involved, then lived for a few thousand years, how long did it take before you really knew the full moral context of your actions? Perhaps an impossibly long time. Perhaps, indeed, that was the real attraction of subliming. Real subliming, the sort of strategic civilization-wide transcendence that genuinely did seem to draw a line under a society's works, deeds and thoughts, in what it pleased people to call the real universe at any rate. Maybe it wasn't anything remotely to do with religion, mysticism or metaphilosophy after all. Maybe it was more banal. Maybe it was just accounting. What a rather saddening thought, thought the sleeper service. All we are looking for when we sublime is our score. It was getting near time, the ship thought sadly, to send off its mind state, to parcel up its mortal thoughts and emotions and post them off, away from this, by the look of it, soon to be overwhelmed physicality called the sleeper service, once called, a long time ago, the quietly confident, and consign it to the remembrance of its peers. It would probably never live again in reality assuming there was what it knew as reality to come back to at all, of course, for it was starting to think what if the accession's expansion was equidirectional and never stopped? What if it was a sort of new Big Bang? What if it was destined to take in the whole galaxy, the whole of this universe? But even so, even if there was a reality and a culture to come back to, there was no guarantee it would ever be resurrected. If anything, the likelihood was the other way. It was almost certainly guaranteed not to be regarded as a fit entity for rebirth in another physical matrix. Warships were. That guarantee of serial immortality was the seal upon their bravery and had occasionally been the impetus for their foolhardiness. They knew they were coming back. But it had been an eccentric, and there were only a few other minds who knew that it had been true and faithful to the great aims and purposes of the culture all the time rather than what everybody else no doubt thought it was. A self-indulgent fool, determined to waste the huge resources it had been quite deliberately blessed with. Probably, come to think of it, those minds who did know the extent of its secret purpose would be the last to rally to any call to resurrect it. Their own part in the plan, call it conspiracy if you wished, to conceal its true purpose, was probably not something they wished to broadcast. Better for them, they would think, that the sleeper service died, or at least that it existed only in a controllable simulationary state in another mind matrix. The giant ship watched the accession, still billowing out towards it. For all its prodigious power, the sleeper now felt as helpless as the driver of an ancient covered wagon, caught on a road beneath a volcano, watching the incandescent cloud of Nue Ardente tearing down the mountainside towards it. 
The replies from the what is the answer and why, and the used psychology by the grey area and the jaundiced outlook, ought to be coming in soon if they came at all. It signalled the avatar aboard the jaundiced outlook to consign the human's mind states to the AI cause, if the ship would agree. There would be a fine test of loyalty. Let them work out their stories there if they could. The transition would anyway prepare the humans for the transmission of their mind states if and when the accession's destructive boundary caught up with the jaundiced outlook. That was the only sucker they could be offered. What else? It sifted through the things it still had left to do. Little of real import, it reckoned. There were thousands of studies on its own behaviour it had always meant to glance at. A million messages it had never looked into. A billion life stories it had never seen through to the end. A trillion thoughts it had never followed up. The ship kicked through the debris of its life, watching the towering wall of the accession come ever closer. It scanned the articles, features, studies, biographies and stories which had been written about itself and which it had collected. There were hardly any screen works, and those which did exist needn't have. Nobody had ever succeeded in smuggling a camera aboard it. It supposed it ought to feel proud of that, but it didn't. The lack of any real visual interest hadn't put people off. They'd found the ship and the articulation of its eccentricity quite entirely fascinating. A few commentators had even come close to the reality of the situation, putting forward the idea that the sleeper service was part of special circumstances and somehow up to something. But any such inklings were like a few scattered grains of truth dissolved in an ocean of nonsense, and were anyway generally inextricably bound up with patently paranoid ravings, and get ready to draw up at thirty years off the E. I think it's trying to tell us something. Plus, there is a record I wish to claim. Chapter 10 The rest of that day passed, and the following night. The black bird, which had said its name was Gravius, had flown off, saying it was tired of his questions. The next morning, after checking that his terminal still did not work, and the lift door in the cellar remained locked and unresponding, Gaynor Hafoen walked as far along the shingle beach as he could in each direction, a few hundred steps in each case, before he encountered a gelatinously resilient field. The view beyond looked perfectly convincing, but must be a projection. He discovered a way through part of the salt marsh and found a similar force field wall a hundred steps into the hummocks and little creeks. He came back to the tower to wash his boots free of the authentically fine and clinging mud he'd had to negotiate on his way through the salt marsh. There was no sign of the black bird he'd talked to the day before. The avatar Amorphia was waiting for him, sitting on the shelf of Shingle Beach, sloping down to the restive sea, hugging its legs and staring out at the water. He stopped when he saw it, then came on. He walked past it and into the tower, washed his boots and came back out. The creature was still there. Yes, he said, standing looking down at it. The ship's representative rose smoothly up, all angles and thin limbs. Close up in that light, there was a sort of unmarked, artless quality about its thin, pale face, something near to innocence. I want you to talk to Dajil, the creature said. Will you? He studied its empty-looking eyes. Why am I being kept here? You are being kept because I would like you to talk to Dajil. You are being kept here because I thought this model would be conducive to putting you in the mood to talk to her about what passed between you forty years ago. He frowned. Amorphia had the impression the man had a lot more questions, all jostling each other, to be the first one asked. Eventually, he said, Are there any mind-state stories left on the sleeper service? No, the avatar said, shaking its head. Does this refer to the ruse that brought you here? The man's eyes had closed briefly. They opened again. Yes, I suppose so, he said. His shoulders seemed to have slumped, the avatar thought. So, he asked, did you make up the story about Zrain Einhoff Tramha, or did they? The avatar looked thoughtful. Gart Kepilesa Zrain Enhaf Tramau Afayaf Damniskat, it said. She was a mind state story. There's quite an interesting story associated with her, but not one I ever suggested be told to you. I see, he said, nodding. So, why? he asked. 
Why what? the creature said, looking puzzled. Why the ruse? Why did you want me here? The avatar looked at him for a moment. You're my price, Gaynar Hofoen, it told him. Your price, he said. The avatar smiled suddenly and put out one hand to touch one of his. Its touch was cool and firm. Let's throw stones, it said, and with that it walked down towards the waves breaking on the slope of shingle. He shook his head and followed the creature. They stood side by side. The avatar looked along the great sweep of shining, spray-glistened stones. Every one a weapon, it muttered, then stooped to pick a large pebble from the beach and threw it quickly, artlessly out at the heaving waves. Gaynor Hafoen selected a stone too. I've been pretending to be eccentric for forty years, Gaynor Hafoen, the avatar said matter-of-factly, squatting again. Pretending? the man asked, chucking the stone on a high arc. He wondered if it was possible to hit the far force wall. The stone fell, vanishing into the tumbling scape of waves. I have been a diligent and industrious component of the special circumstances section for all that time, just awaiting the call, the ship told him through the avatar. It glanced over at him as he bent, choosing another stone. I am a weapon, Gaynor Hofoen, a deniable weapon. My apparent eccentricity allows the culture proper to refuse any responsibility for my actions. In fact, I am acting on the specific instructions of an SC committee, which calls itself the Interesting Times Gang. The creature broke off to heave a stone towards the false horizon. Its arm was a blur as it threw. The air made a burring noise, and Gaynor Hafoen felt the wind of the movement on his cheek. The avatar's momentum spun it round in a circle. Then it steadied itself gave a brief, almost childish grin, and peered out at the stone disappearing into the distance. It was still on the upward part of its arc. Gaynor Hafoen watched it too. Shortly after it started to drop, the stone bounced off something invisible and fell back into the waters. The avatar made a contented noise and looked pleased with itself. However, it said, when it came to it, I refused to do what they wanted until they delivered you to me. That was my price. You. It smiled at him. You see? He weighed a stone in his hand. Just because of what happened between Dajil and me. The avatar smiled, then stooped to choose another stone, one finger to its lips, childlike. It was silent for a while, apparently concentrating on the task. Gaynor Hafoen continued to weigh the stone in his hand, looking down at the back of the avatar's head. After some moments, the creature said, I was a fully functioning, throughput-biased, culture general systems vehicle for three hundred years, Gaynor Hafoen. It glanced up at him. Have you any idea how many ships, drones, people, human and not human, pass through a GSV in all that time? It looked down again, picked a stone, and levered itself upright once more. I was regularly home to over two hundred million people. I could, in theory, Hold over a hundred thousand ships. I built smaller GSVs, all capable of building their own ship children, all with their own crews, their own personalities, their own stories. To be host to so much is to be the equivalent of a small world or a large state, it said. It was my job and my pleasure to take an intimate interest in the physical and mental well-being of every individual aboard, to provide, with every appearance of effortlessness, an environment they would each find comfortable, pleasant, stress-free, and stimulating. It was also my duty to get to know those ships, drones, and people, to be able to talk to them and empathize with them, and understand however many of them wish to indulge in such interactions at any one time. In such circumstances, you rapidly develop, if you don't possess it originally, an interest in, even a fascination with, people. And you have your likes and dislikes. The people you do the polite minimum for and are glad to see the back of. The ones you like and who interest you more than the others. The ones you treasure for years and decades if they remain, or wish could have stayed longer once they've gone and subsequently correspond with regularly. There are some stories you follow up into the future, long after the people concerned have left, 
You trade tales with other GSVs, other minds, gossiping, basically, to find out how relationships turned out, whose careers flourished, whose dreams withered. Amorphia leant back and over, and then threw the stone almost straight up. The creature jumped a half meter or so into the air as it released the missile, which climbed on into the air until it bounced off the invisible roof, high above, and fell into the waves twenty meters offshore. The Avatar clapped its hands once, seemingly happy. It stooped again, surveying the pebbles. You try to keep a balance between indifference and nosiness, between carelessness and obsession, it went on. Still, you have to be ready for accusations of both types of failure, keeping them roughly in numerical accord, and within the range experienced by your peers is one measure of success. Perfection is impossible. Additionally, you have to accept that in such a large collection of personalities and stories, there will be some loose ends, some tales which will fizzle out rather than conclude neatly. Those don't matter, so long as there are some which do work out satisfactorily, and especially so long as the ones you have taken the greatest interest in, and have been personally particularly involved with, work out. It looked up at him from where it squatted. Sometimes... You take a hand in such stories, such fates. Sometimes you know or can anticipate the extent to which your intervention will matter. But on other occasions, you don't know and can't guess. You find that some chance remark you've made has affected somebody's life profoundly, or that some seemingly insignificant decision you've come to has had profound and lasting consequences. It shrugged, looked down at the stones again. Your story. Yours and Dajil's was one a little like that, it told him. It was I who was instrumental in deciding that you ought to be allowed to accompany Dajil Jilian to Telaturia, it said, rising. It held two stones this time, one larger than the other. I could see how finely balanced the decision was between the various parts of the committee concerned. I knew the decision effectively rested with me. I got to know you, and I made the decision. It shrugged. It was the wrong decision. It threw the larger stone on a high trajectory, then looked back at the man as it hefted the smaller stone. I've spent the last forty years wishing I could correct my mistake. It turned and threw the other pebble low and fast. The stone flew out over the waves and struck the larger rock about two meters before it plunged into the water. They burst into whizzing fragments and a brief cloud of dust. The Avatar turned to him again, with a small smile on its face. I agreed to pretend to become eccentric. Suddenly, I had a freedom very few craft ever have, able to indulge my whims, my fantasies, my own dreams. It flexed one eyebrow. Oh, in theory, of course, we can all do that. But minds have a sense of duty and a conscience. I was able to become very slightly eccentric by pretending to be very eccentric, while knowing that I was in fact being more martially responsible than anybody else, and, in appearing to enjoy such eccentricity with a clear conscience, even enhance my eccentric reputation. Other craft looked on and thought that they could do what I was doing, but not for long, and therefore that I must be thoroughly, thoroughly weird. As far as I know, not one guessed that my conscience was kept clear by having a purpose serious enough to compensate for even the most clown-like disguise and regressively obsessive behavior. It folded its arms. Of course, it said, you don't normally expect to be continually reminded of your folly every day for four decades, but that was the way it was to be. I didn't anticipate that at the start, though it became a useful and fit part of my eccentricity. I picked Dajil up a short while into my internal exile. She was the single last significant loose end from my previous life. All the other stories didn't concern me so directly, or bore no similar weight of responsibility, or were well on the way to being satisfactorily resolved, or decently forgotten through the due process of time elapsing and people changing. Only Dajil remained my responsibility. The Avatar shrugged. I had hoped to talk her around, to cause her to accept whatever it was had happened to you both and get on with the rest of her life. Bearing the child would be the signal that she was mended. That labor would be the end of her travails. That birth mark an end. The Avatar looked away, out to sea for a moment. 
a frown creasing its brows. I thought it would be easy, it said, looking back at him. I was so used to power, to being able to influence people, ships, and events. It would have been such a simple thing even to have tricked her body into giving birth. I could have started the process chemically or via an effector while she was asleep, and by the time she was awake, there would have been no going back. That I was sure my arguments, my reasoning, grief, even my cherished facility at emotional blackmail would find scarcely more of an obstacle in her will than all my technologies could face in her physiology. It shook its head quickly. It was not to be. She proved intransigent. I hoped to persuade her, to shame her, indeed, by the very totality of my concern for her recreating all you see here, the Avatar said, glancing round at the cliffs, marsh, tower, and waters, for real, turning my entire outer envelope into a habitat just for her and the creatures she loved. Amorphia gave a sort of dipping sideways nod and smiled. I admit I had another purpose as well, which such exaggerated compassion would only help disguise. But the fact is, my original design was to create an environment she would feel comfortable within and into which she would feel safe bringing her baby, having seen the care I was prepared to lavish just on her. The Avatar gave a rueful smile. I got it wrong, it admitted. I was wrong twice, and each time I harmed Dajil. You are, and this is, my last chance to get it right. And what am I supposed to do? Why, just talk to her, the Avatar cried, holding its arms out, and suddenly Gaina Hafoen was reminded of Alva. What if I won't play along, he asked. Then you may get to share my fate, the ship's representative told him breezily, whatever that may be. At any rate, I may keep you here until you do at least agree to talk to her, even if, for that meeting to take place, I have to ask her to return after I've sent her away to safety. And what is likely to be your fate? Oh, death, possibly, the Avatar said, shrugging with apparent unconcern. The man shook his head. You haven't got any right to threaten me like that, he said, with a sort of half-laugh in his voice he hoped didn't sound as nervous as he felt. Nevertheless, I am threatening you like that, Gaynor Hafoan, the Avatar said, bending at the waist to lean towards him for a moment. I am not as eccentric as I appear. But consider this. Only a craft that was predisposed to a degree of eccentricity in the first place would have taken on the style of life I did forty years ago. The creature drew itself upright again. There is an accession without precedent at Esperi, which may lead to an infinitude of universes, and a level of power, orders of magnitude, beyond what any known involved currently possesses. You've experienced the way SC works, Gaynor Hafon. Don't be so naive as to imagine that minds don't employ strong-arm methods now and again, or that in a matter resounding with such importance, any ship would think twice about sacrificing another consciousness for such a prize. My information is that several minds have been forfeited already. If, in the exceptional conditions prevailing, intellects on that scale are considered fair game, think about how little a single human life is likely to matter. The man stared at the Avatar. His jaw was clenched, his fists balled. You're doing this for a single human life, he said. Two, if you count the fetus. No, Gaynar Hafoan, the Avatar said, shaking its head. I'm doing this for myself because it's become an obsession. Because my pride will not now let me settle this any other way. Dajil, in that sense, and for all her self-lacerating spite, has won. She forced you to her will forty-five years ago, and she has bent me to hers for the last forty. Now, more than ever, she has won. She has thrown away four decades of her life on a self-indulgent sulk, but she stands to gain by her own criteria. You have spent the last forty years enjoying and indulging yourself, Gennar Hafoen, so perhaps you could be said to have won by your criteria. And, after all, you did win the lady at the time, which was all you then wanted, remember? That was your obsession, your folly. Well, the three of us are all paying for our mutual and intermingled mistakes. You did your part in creating the situation. All I'm asking is that you do your part in alleviating it. And all I have to do is talk to her. The man sounded skeptical. The creature nodded. 
talk. Try to understand. Try to see things from her perspective. Try to forgive or allow yourself to be forgiven. Be honest with her and with yourself. I'm not asking you to stay with her and be her partner again or form a family of three. I just want whatever it is that has prevented her from giving birth to be identified and ameliorated. Removed, if possible. I want her to resume living and her child to start. You will then be free to return to your own life. The man looked out to sea, then at his right hand. He looked surprised to see he was holding a stone in it. He threw it as hard and as far as he could into the waves. It didn't travel half the distance to the distant invisible wall. What are you supposed to do? The man asked the creature. What is your mission? Get to the accession, Amorphia said. Destroy it if that's deemed necessary, and if it's possible. Perhaps just draw a response from it. And what about the affront? Added complication, the Avatar agreed, squatting once more and looking around the stones around its feet. I might have to deal with them too. It shrugged and lifted a stone, hefting it. It put the stone back and chose another. Deal with them, Gaina Hafoen said. I thought they had an entire war fleet heading there. Oh, they do, the Avatar said from beach level. Still, you have to try, don't you? It stood again. Gaynar Hafoen looked at it, trying to see if it was being ironic or just disingenuous. No way of telling. So when do we get into the thick of things, he asked, trying to skip a flat stone over the waves without success. Well, Amorphia said, the thick of things probably starts about thirty light years out from the point of the accession itself these days. The Avatar stretched, flexing its arm far back behind it. We should be there this evening, it said. Its arm snapped forward. The stone whistled through the air and skipped elegantly over the tops of half a dozen waves before disappearing. Gaina Hafoen turned and stared at the Avatar. This evening, he said. Time is a little tight, the Avatar said with a pained expression, again peering into the distance. It would be for the best for all of us if you'd talk to Dajil soon. It smiled vacuously at him. Well, how about right now? The man said, spreading his hands. I'll see, the creature said, and turned abruptly on its heel. Suddenly, there was a reflecting ovoid like a giant silver egg stood on its end where the avatar had been. The displacer field vanished almost before the man had time to register its existence, seeming to shrink and collapse almost instantly to a point, and then disappearing altogether. The process produced a gentle... Chapter 11 The killing time plunged intact through the third wave of ancient culture ships. They rushed on towards the accession. It fended off a few more of the warheads and missiles which had been directed at it, turning a couple of the latter back upon their own ships for a few moments before they were detected and destructed. The hulk of the attitude adjuster fell astern behind the departing fleet, coasting and twisting and tumbling in hyperspace, still heading away from and outstripping the killing time as it braked and started to turn. There was only a vestigial fourth wave, fourteen ships, they were targeting it now. Had it known there were so few in the final echelon, the killing time would have attacked the second wave of ships. Oh well, luck counted too. It watched the attitude adjuster a moment longer to ensure it really was tearing itself apart. It was. It turned its attention to the remaining fourteen craft. On its suicide trajectory, it could take them all on and stand a decent chance of destroying perhaps four of them before its luck ran out. Maybe a half dozen if it was really lucky. Or it could push away and complete its brake turn accelerate maneuver to make a second pass at the main fleet. Even if they'd be waiting for it this time, it could reckon on accounting for a good few of them, again in the four to eight range. Or it could do this. It pulled itself round the edge of the fourteen ships in the rump of the fleet as they reconfigured their formation to meet it. Bringing up the rear, they had had more warning of its attack, and so had had time to adopt a suitable pattern. The killing time ignored the obvious challenge and temptation of flying straight into their midst and flew past and round, targeting only the outer five craft nearest it. They gave a decent account of themselves, but it prevailed, dispatching two of them with engine field implosions. This was, it had always thought, a clean, decent, and honourable way to die. The pair of wreckage shells coasted onwards, 
the rest of the ships sped on unharmed, chasing the main fleet. Not one of the ships turned back to take it on. The killing time continued to break, oriented towards the fast-vanishing war fleet and the region of the accession. Its engine fields were gouging great livid tracks in the energy grid as it backpedalled furiously. It encountered the ROU which had dropped aft with engine damage, falling back towards it as the killing time slowed and the other craft coasted onward and struggled to repair its motive power units. The killing time attempted to communicate with the ROU, was fired upon and tried to take the craft over with its effector. The ROU's own independent automatics detected the ship's mind starting to give in. They tripped a destruct sequence and another hypersphere of radiation blossomed beneath the skein. Shit, thought the killing time. It scanned the hypervolumes around itself. Nothing threatening. Well, damn me, it thought as it slowed. I'm still alive. This was the one outcome it hadn't anticipated. It ran a systems check. Totally unharmed, apart from the self-inflicted degradation to its engines. It slackened off the power, dropping back to normal maxima and watching the readouts. Significant degradation from here in about a hundred hours. Not too bad. Self-repairing would take days at all engines stop. Warhead stocks down to 40%. Remanufacturing from first principles would take four to seven hours, depending on the exact mix it chose. Plasma chambers at 96% of efficiency, about right for the engagement system use profile according to the relevant charts and graphs. Self-repair mechanisms champing at the bit. It looked around, concentrating on the view astern. No obvious threats. It let the self-repairers make a start on two of the four chambers. Full reconstruction time, 204 seconds. Entire engagement duration, 11 microseconds. Hmm, it had felt longer, but then that was only natural. Should it make a second pass? It pondered this while it signalled the shoot them later and a couple of other distant mines with details of the engagement. Then it copied to the steely glint without leaving the comm channels open. It needed time to think. It felt excited, energised, repurified by the engagement it had undergone. Its appetite was whetted. A further pass would be no-holds-barred, multi-destructional, not a series of semi-defensive side actions while it concentrated on searching for one individual ship. This next time, it could really get nasty. On the other hand, it had inflicted a more than reasonable amount of damage on the fleet for no ship loss whatsoever, and a barely significant degradation to its operational capacity. It had ignored the advice of a superior mind in wartime, but it had triumphed. It had gambled and won, and there was a kind of unexpected elegance in cashing in its gains now. To pursue the matter further might look like obsessive self-regard, like ultra-militarism, especially now that the original object of its eye had been bested. Perhaps it would be better to accept whatever praise and or calumny might now be heaped upon it and resubmit itself to the jurisdiction of the culture's war command structure though it was starting to have its doubts about the part of the steely glint in all this. It drew level with the debris clouds left by the two ships destroyed in the final wave of the war fleet. It let them drop astern. The wreck of the attitude adjuster came tumbling slowly towards it in hyperspace, coasting, slowing, drifting gradually back up towards the skein. Externally it looked unharmed. The killing time slowed to keep pace with the slackly somersaulting craft. It probed the attitude adjuster carefully with its senses. Its effector targeted on the other ship's mind, ready on the instant. In human terms, this was like taking somebody's pulse while keeping a gun stuck in their mouth. The attitude adjuster's weakened engine fields were still tearing at what was left of its mind, teasing and plucking and forcing it apart, strand by strand, demolishing and shredding and cauterizing the last remaining quanta of its personality and senses. It looked like there had been a dozen or so affronters aboard, they were dead too, killed by stray radiations from the mine's self-destruction. The killing time felt a modicum of guilt, even self-disgust, at what it had forced upon what was still, in a sense, a sister ship, even while another part of its selfhood relished and gloried in the dying craft's agonies. The sentimental side won out. It blitzed the stricken vessel with a profusion of plasma fire from its two operational chambers and kept station with the expanding shell of radiation for a few moments, paying what little respect the traitor ship might be due. The killing time came to its decision. It signalled the steely glint, informing the GCV that it would accept suggestions from now on, 
It would harry the war fleet if that was required, or it would join in whatever stand was to be made near Esperi if that was thought the best use that could be made of it. It would probably still die, but it would meet its fate as a loyal and obedient component of the culture, not some sort of rogue ship pursuing a private feud. Then it slowly rammed its engines back to normal full power, pulling itself forward to a vanishingly brief moment of rest before powering onwards, accelerating hard and setting a hyperbolic course skirting around the fleet's more direct route, heading for the location of the accession. It should still get there before the war fleet. Chapter 12 What? I said I'd made up my mind. I won't talk to him. I won't see him. I don't even want to be on the same ship with him. Take me away. I want to leave. Now. Dajil Gillian gathered her skirts about her and sat heavily on the seat in the circular room under the translucent dome. Dajil! exclaimed Amorphia, going down on its knees in front of her, eyes wide and shining. It made to take her hands in its, but she pulled them away. Please, see him. He has agreed to see you. Oh, has he? she said scornfully. How magnanimous of him! The avatar sat back on its haunches. It looked at the woman, then it sighed and said, Dajil, I've never asked anything of you before. Please, just see him. For me. I never asked anything of you, the woman said. What you gave me you gave unasked. Some of it was unwanted, she said coldly. All those animals, those other lives, those eternal births and childhoods, mocking me. Mocking you? the avatar exclaimed, but Dajil sat forward, shaking her head. No, I'm sorry, that was wrong of me. Now she reached out and took Amorphia's hands. I'm truly grateful for all you've done for me, ship, I am. But I don't want to see him. Please take me away. The avatar tried to argue on for a while longer, but to no avail. The ship considered a lot of things, it considered asking the grey area, still in its forward main bay, to dip inside the woman's brain, the way it had insinuated its way into Gaina Hofoans, to discover the truth of the events on Teleturia, and to implant the dream of the long-dead captain Zrein Enhof Tramau, not that that had proved either required or particularly well done. It considered requesting that the GCU used its effectors to make her want to have the child. It considered displacing chemicals or biotechs which would force Dajil's body to have the child. It considered using one of its own effectors to do the same thing. It considered just displacing her into Gaina Hofoen's proximity, or he into hers. Then it came up with a new plan. Very well, the avatar said eventually. It stood. He will stay. You may go. Do you wish to take the bird Gravius with you? The woman looked perplexed, even confused. I... she began... Yes. Yes, why not? It can't do any harm, can it? No, the avatar said. No, it cannot. It bowed its head to her. Goodbye. Dajil opened her mouth to speak, but the avatar was displaced away at the same instant. The sound it left behind was like a pair of hands giving a single, gentle clap. Dajil closed her mouth and put both her hands over her eyes and lowered her head, doubling up as well as she was able to. Next moment, there was another distant noise, and from down the winding stairs, she heard a thin, hoarse voice cry out, Wah, shit, grief, where? Then there was a confused flutter of wings. Dajil closed her eyes. Then there was another, closer-sounding pop. Her eyes flicked open. A young woman, slim and black-haired, was sitting looking surprised in the middle of the floor dressed in black pyjamas and reading a small, old-fashioned book. Between her bottom and the room's carpet, there was a neat circle of pink material, still in the process of collapsing, air expelling flutteringly round the edges. Around her floated a small snowstorm of white particles, settling with a feather-like slowness. She jerked once, as though she had been leaning back on something which had just been removed. What the fuck? she said softly. She looked slowly around from side to side. Her gaze settled on Dajil. She frowned for a moment, then some kind of understanding imposed itself. She quickly completed her review of her surroundings, then pointed at the other woman. Dajil, she said. 
Dajil Jillian, right? Dajil nodded. Chapter 13 Stuttered type point M32 tra point at 4.28.885.3553 From Eccentric, shoot them later, to LSV, serious callers only. It was the attitude adjuster. It is dead now. Signal plus diaglyphs enclosed. Stuttered type point M32 tra point at N4.28.885.3740 from LSV, serious callers only, to eccentric, shoot them later. Not a pleasant way to go. Your friend, the killing time, deserves congratulations and probably merits therapy. However, as I'm sure it would point out, it is a warship. This implicates the steely glint. The attitude adjuster was its daughter and was demilitarized, supposedly, by it seventy years ago. I trust your friend will treat the SG's subsequent operational suggestions with a degree of caution. Indeed. But then, as it seems quite enthusiastically intent upon achieving a glorious death at the earliest possible opportunity anyway, it is hard to see what more the steely glint can do to place it in further jeopardy. Whatever. We must leave that machine to its own fate. My concern now is that the evidence for the conspiracy is starting to look pretty damning, even if it is still circumstantial. I suggest we go public. Implicating the steely glint while it is in charge of the military developments around the accession will only make us look like the guilty parties. We must ask ourselves what we have to gain. The war fleet from Pittance is underway and must arrive there in any event. Exposing the conspiracy will do nothing to challenge it. The best we might hope for would be the worst for the chances of resisting the affront's purpose. That is, the removal from influence and general disgrace of the steely glint and its core conspirators. It pains me to say it but I still think we must let this subsequence of events run its course before we can consider broadcasting our suspicions. Hold for now, and gather what more weight of evidence we might, the better to tip the scales with our accusations when the time does come. Frankly, I was hoping you would say that. My own instinct, if I may slur my intellect with such an archaic term, was to keep quiet, but I suspected I was merely being timorous, and so wanted to make the suggestion we publicise with a positive skew, so that you could not be infected by any undue reticence on my part. What of the volume around the E itself? Heard any more? Imbecile. Last I heard regarding the Asperi thing itself, there was no more news of the ZE stargazers, and the FATC was still recovering from the effects of its unexpected trip. Everybody else seems to have taken the hint and is hanging back. Well, except for the affronters' borrowed fleet and our old chum, of course. How are things in the realm of our three-legged friends? Speaking personally, Screece Orbital is as pleasant as could be, and as devoutly unmilitarized as one might wish a peace faction world to be. No more news, then. Glad to hear Screece is so fair. The Hamamda are most accommodating and gracious hosts. I think I may have lost a couple of my adherent crew members to the local pleasure dens for the duration, but otherwise I have no complaints. Stay safe and peace, like they say, be with you. Chapter 14 The briefest of introductions completed, they stood facing each other in the circular room under the translucent dome. So, Dajil said, inspecting the other woman from toe to crown. You're his latest, are you? Alva frowned. Oh, no, she said, shaking her head. He's mine. Dajil looked as though she wasn't sure how to answer that. Miss Seish, welcome aboard the jaundiced outlook, said a disembodied voice. I'm sorry this is all so precipitate, but I have just received instructions from the sleeper service that you are to be evacuated aboard myself forthwith. Thank you, Alva said, gazing round the room. What about Trit Line? It has expressed a desire to stay aboard the grey area, the jaundiced outlook told her. I thought those two were getting on suspiciously well, the girl muttered. Dajil looked like she wanted to ask something, but in the end said nothing. After a moment, she stood up, putting her hand to the small of her back as she did so with a tiny grimace. She indicated the table to one side. Please, she said. I was about to have dinner. Will you join me? I was about to have breakfast, Alva said, and nodded. Certainly. They sat at the table. Alva held up the small book she'd been reading, and which she still held in one hand. 
I don't want to be rude, but would you mind if I just finish this chapter? She asked. Dajil smiled. Not at all, she murmured. Alva gave a winning smile and stuck her nose back in the slim volume. Excuse me, said a small, hoarse voice from the doorway. What the fuck's going on, then? Dajil looked over at the black bird, Gravius. We're being evacuated, she told it. You can live in the cellar. Now go away. Well, thanks for your hospitality, the bird spluttered, turning and hopping down the winding stairs. That yours? Alva asked Dajil. Supposed to be a companion, the old woman said, shrugging. Actually, just a pain. Alva nodded sympathetically and returned to her book. Dajil ordered food for two. A slave tray appeared with plates, bowls, jugs and goblets. A couple of floor-running servitors appeared and started clearing up the debris left by Ulva's sudden displacement from the grey area to the jaundiced outlook. The featherlight stuffing from the pillows proved a particular problem. The serving tray started arranging the place settings on the table and distributing the bowls of food. Dajil watched this graceful, efficient display in silence. Ulva Seish gazed intently at the book and turned a page. Then a ship-slaved drone appeared. It floated by Dajil's shoulder. Yes, she said. We are now leaving the bay, the jaundiced outlook told her. The journey to the GSV's external envelope will take two and a half minutes. Oh, right. Thank you, Dajil said. Oh, the Seish looked up. Would you ask the grey area to transfer my stuff here? That has already been accomplished, the drone said, already moving towards the stairs. Ulva nodded again, put the book's marker ribbon into place, closed the volume, and placed it by the side of her plate. Well, Miss Gillian, she said, clasping her hands on the table, it would appear we are to be travelling companions. Yes, Dajil said. She started to serve herself some food. Have you been with by a long, Miss... Seish, wasn't it? she asked. Olza nodded. Only met him a few days ago. I was sent to try and stop him getting here. Didn't work out. I ended up stuck on a tiny little module thing with him, just us and a drone for days. It was awful. Dajil passed a couple of bowls over to Olva. Still, she said, smiling thinly, I'm sure romance blossomed. Like hell, Olva said, levering a few sunbread pieces from a bowl into her plate. Couldn't stand the man. Only slept with him the last couple of nights. Partially bored him, I suppose. All the same, he's quite handsome. Bit of a charmer, really. I can see what you saw in him. So, what went wrong between you two? Dajil stopped, a spoon poised on the way to her mouth. Olva smiled disarmingly at her over jaws munching a mouthful of fruit. Dajil ate, drank a little wine, and dabbed at her lips with a napkin before replying. I'm surprised you don't know the whole story. Who ever knows the whole story? Olva said airily, waving her arms about. She put her elbows on the table. I bet even you two don't know the whole story, she said more quietly. Again, Dajil took her time before replying. Perhaps the whole story isn't worth knowing, she said. The ship appears to think it is, Olva replied. She tried some fermented fruit juice, rolling it round her palate before swallowing it and saying, Seems to have gone to an awful lot of trouble to arrange a meeting between you two. Yes. Well, it is an eccentric, isn't it? Olva thought about this. Very intelligent eccentric, she said. I'd imagine that something it thought worth pursuing like that might be, you know, worthy of concern. No? she asked, with a self-deprecating grimace. Dajil shrugged. Ships can be wrong, too, she said. What, so none of it matters a damn? Alba said casually, choosing a small roll from a basket. No, Dajil said. She looked down, smoothing her dress over her belly. But she stopped. Her head went down, and she was silent for a while. Alba looked over, concerned. Dajil's shoulders shook once. Alva, wiping her lips, threw down the napkin and went over to the other woman, squatting by her and tentatively putting out one arm round her shoulders. Dajil moved slowly towards her, eventually resting her head on the crook of Alva's neck. The ship drone entered from the winding stair. Alva shooed it away. A couple of screens on the far wall lit up, showing what Alva guessed was the hull of the sleeper service, gradually drawing further away. 
Another couple of screens showed an approaching wall of gridded grey. She guessed the two minutes the drone had mentioned earlier had passed. Dajil cried for a little while. After a few minutes, she asked, Do you think he still loves me at all? Alva looked pained for a moment. Only the ship's sensors registered the expression. She took a deep breath. At all, she said. Yes, definitely. Dajil sniffed hard and looked up for the first time. She gave a sort of half-despairing laugh as she wiped some tears from her cheeks with her fingers. Ulva reached for a clean napkin and completed the job. <laughs> it doesn't really mean much to him anymore, Dajil said to the younger woman, does it? Ulva folded the tear-darkened napkin carefully. It matters to him a lot now because he's here. Because the ship brought him here just for this, hoping the two of you would talk. But the rest of the time, Dajil said, sitting upright again and throwing her head and hair back. The rest of the time it doesn't really bother him, does it? Ulva took an almost exaggeratedly deep breath, looked as though she was about to vehemently deny this, then sank down on her haunches and said, Look, I hardly know the man. She gestured with her hands. I learned a lot about him before we met, but I only met him a few days ago, in very odd circumstances. She shook her head, looking serious. I don't know who he really is. Dajil rocked back and forward in her seat for a moment, staring at the meal on the table. Well enough, she said, sniffing. You know him well enough. She smoothed her ruffled hair as best she could. She stared up at the translucent dome for a moment. All I knew, she said, was the person he became when he was with me. She looked at Ulva. I forgot what he was like all the rest of the time. She took Ulva's hand in hers. You're seeing what he's really like. Ulva gave a long, slow shrug. Then, she said, looking troubled, a tone measured. He's all right, I think. The screens on the far side of the circular room showed fuzzy grids expanding, swallowing, disappearing. The last field approached, was pierced to reveal a black wash of space, and then, with a smear of rushing stars and the same barely perceptible feeling of dislocation Ulva and Gaina Hafone had experienced two days earlier when they had arrived on board the sleeper service, the jaundiced outlook was free of the GSV and peeling away on a diverging course within its own concentric collection of fields. And what does that make me? Dajil whispered. Ulva shrugged. She looked down at Dajil's belly. Still pregnant? she suggested. Dajil stared at her. Then she gave a small laugh. Her head went down again. Ulva patted her hand. Tell me about it if you want. Dajil sniffed, dabbing at her nose with the folded napkin. Yes, I'm sure you really care. Oh, believe me, Ulva told her. Other people's problems have always held a profound fascination for me. Dajil sighed. Other people's are always the best problems to be involved with, she said ruefully. My thoughts exactly. I suppose you think I ought to talk to him too. Dajil said. Ulva glanced up at the screens again. I don't know. But if you have even the least thought of it, I'd take advantage of the opportunity now before it's too late. Dajil looked round at the screens. Oh, we've gone, she said in a small voice. She looked back at the other woman. Do you think he wants to see me? Ulva thought there was a tone of hopefulness in her voice. Her troubled gaze flitted from one of Ulva's eyes to the other. Well, if he doesn't, he's a fool, Ulva said, wondering why she was being so diplomatic. Ha, <laughs> Dajil said. She wiped her cheeks with her fingers once more and dragged her fingers through her hair. She reached into her dress and pulled out a comb. She offered it to Ulva. Would you? Ulva stood. Only if you say you'll see him, she said, smiling. Dajil shrugged. I suppose so. Alva stood behind Dajil and began to comb her long, dark hair.
Ship? Mersage, the jaundiced outlook here. I take it you've been listening. Want to contact the GSV? I was listening. I have already contacted the sleeper service. Mr. Gaynor Hafoan and the Avatar Amorphia are aboard and on their way here. Fast work, Alva told it, and continued to gently comb Dajil's hair. They're on their way, she told her. Vire and the Avatar. Dajil said nothing. A couple of decks further down in the accommodation section, Amorphia turned to Gaynor Hafoan as they walked down a corridor. And it might be best not to mention that we were displaced aboard at the same time as Ulver, it told the man. I'll try not to let it slip, he said sourly. Let's just get this over with, shall we? Definitely the right attitude, muttered the Avatar, stepping into a lift. They ascended to the impersonation of the tower. Chapter 15 Snug Encapsulated in a cobbled-together nest capsule deep inside the accommodation section of the ex-culture ship Heavy Messing, Captain Greydorn Late Setting Ten of the Farsight Tribe watched the blip which represented the crippled hulk of the Attitude Adjuster fall astern on the hollow display, the screams of his uncle Rising Moon and the other affronters on the stricken vessel still ringing in his mind. A hazy cloud hung around the blip of the tumbling wreck, indicating where the ship's sensors estimated the culture warship, which the heavy messing still thought was a deluge vessel, now was. With his uncle dead, the fleet was now under Greydorn's command. The urge to swing the whole assemblage about and bear down on the single culture ship was almost irresistible. But there would be no point. It was faster than any of their craft. The heavy messing's mind thought that the culture ship might have damaged its engines during its run into the attack, but even so, it could probably still outstrip any of the ships in the fleet, and so all such a course would accomplish would be to draw them away from their intended destination, without even the realistic prospect of revenge. They had to continue. Greydorn signalled to the six other craft which were crewed. Fellow warriors, no one feels the loss of our comrades more than I. However, our mission remains the same. Let our victory be our first revenge. The power we gain for our kind as a result of it will purchase the ability to punish all such crimes against us a millionfold. The attacker's duplication of a culture vessel's emission signature spectrum and field was astonishingly authentic, the heavy messing wrote on one of the screens in front of Greydorn. Their abilities have grown while you were asleep, ally, Greydorn told the ship. He felt his gas sack tense and contract as he spoke, wrote the words, ever conscious that anything he said might help give away the huge trick being played on the culture ships. You see the severity of the threat they now present? Indeed, the ship replied. I find it hateful that the deluge craft killed the attitude adjuster the way it appeared to. They will be chastised when we are in control of the entity at Desperi. Never fear. Part 11 Regarding Gravius Chapter 1 Gaynar Hafoan and the Avatar Amorphia appeared in the doorway at the head of the winding stair. Excuse me, Alva said, putting down the comb and patting Dajil on the shoulder. She walked towards the door. No, please stay, Dajil said behind her. Alva turned to the older woman. You sure? Dajil nodded. Ulva looked over at Gaynor Hafoan, whose gaze was fastened on Dajil. He seemed to shake himself out of his fixation and looked, then smiled at Ulva. Hi, he said. Yes, stay, whatever. He crossed to Dajil, who stood. They both looked awkward for a moment, then they embraced. That was awkward too, over the bulge of Dajil's belly. Ulva and the Avatar exchanged looks. Please, let's all sit down, shall we? Dajil said. Baya, are you hungry? Not really, he said, drawing up a chair. I could use a drink. The four of them sat round the table. There was some small talk, mostly between Gaynor Hafoan and Dajil, with a few comments from Alva. The Avatar remained silent. It frowned once and glanced at the screens, which showed a perfectly banal view of empty space. Chapter 2 
The sleeper service was a few hours out from the accession now. It was tracking the MSV not invented here and another two large culture craft, each a dark jewel set within a cluster of smaller ships, warships plus some GCUs and superlifters extemporized into combat service. The GCU different tan was also supposed to be in the volume, but it was not making itself obvious. The knot invented here was thirty light years out from Esperi, patrolling the spherical limit of the uniquely worrying engine field effect that the GCU fate amenable to change had reported days earlier. The sleeper service had briefly considered asking that the smaller craft copy its results to it, but hadn't bothered. The request would probably be refused, and it suspected whatever data the smaller craft was gathering weren't telling anybody very much anyway. The other two craft, the GSVs, What is the Answer and Why, and Use Psychology, were manoeuvring a half-day and a full day further out, respectively. A faint layered smudge in the distance, about three-quarters of the way round an imaginary sphere drawn around the accession, was almost certainly the approaching of frontal war fleet. Around the accession itself, no sign whatsoever of the vanished stargazer fleet of the Zetetic Alench. The sleeper service readied itself for the fray. Maybe, in a sense, two phrase. There was every chance that its own engines would fail the same way the fate amenable to changes had when it had moved towards the accession. But given the speed the sleeper service was travelling at, it could coast in towards the thing. It wouldn't have any directional control, it wouldn't be able to maintain its present speed or brake, but it could get there. If it ought to. Ought it? It checked its signal log, as if it might have missed an incoming message. Still nothing from those who had sent it here. The interesting Times gang seemed to have been observing comm silence for days, just the usual daily plea from the LSV serious callers only, the equivalent of an unopened letter and just the latest in a series. The sleeper watched events on the jaundiced outlook, even as it prepared itself for the coming encounter near Esperi, like a military commander drawing up war plans and issuing hundreds of preparatory orders who cannot keep his or her attention from flicking to a microscopic drama being played out amongst a group of insects clinging to the wall above the table. The ship felt foolish, voyeuristic, and yet fascinated. Its thoughts were interrupted by the grey area, sending from its main bay in the nose of the GSV. I'll be on my way then, if you don't need me any more. I'd rather you stuck around, the sleeper service replied. Not when you're heading for that thing and the affronters. You might be surprised, I'm sure. However, I want to leave. Farewell, then, the GSV sent, opening the bay door. I suppose this means another displace, if you don't mind. And if I do, there is an alternative, but I'd rather not use it. Well, if there is one, I want to use it. The jaundice outlook declined, and it had humans aboard. Bugger the humans, and bugger the jaundiced outlook, too. What's the alternative? Have you got superlifters capable of this sort of speed? No. What then? Just get to the rear of my field envelope. Whatever you say. The GCU quit its berth, easing out into the confined space between the GSV's hull and the craft's innermost field layer. It took a few minutes for it to manoeuvre itself down the side of the giant ship and round the corner to the flat rear of the craft. When it got there, it found three other ships waiting for it. Who the hell are they? the GCU asked the larger ship. In fact, what the hell are they? It was something of a rhetorical question. The three craft were unambiguously warships, slightly longer and fatter than the grey area itself, but tapering at either end to points surmounted with large spheres. Spheres which could logically only contain weaponry. Quite a lot of weaponry, judging by the size of the globes. My own design. Their names are T-3-O-U's 4, 1, 1, 8, and 736. Oh, witty. You won't find them terribly good company. AI cores only, semi-slave to me but they can operate together as a superlifter to get you down to manageable speeds. The GCU was silent for a moment. It moved in to take a position in the centre of the triangle the three ships had formed. T-3-O-U's, it asked. Type 3 offensive units, by any chance? Correct. Many more like these hidden away? Enough. 
You have been busy all these years. Yes, I have. I trust I can rely on your absolute discretion, for the next few hours at any rate. You certainly have that. Good. Farewell. Thank you for your help. Glad to be of the small amount of service I was. Best of luck. I suppose I'll find out soon enough how things pan out. I imagine so. Chapter 3 The Avatar returned the main focus of its attention to the three humans on the Jaundiced Outlook. The two old lovers had moved from small talk to a post-mortem on their relationship, still without coming up with anything particularly interesting. We wanted different things, Dajil said to Gaina Harfoen. That's usually enough. I wanted what you wanted for a long time, the man said, swirling some wine round in a crystal goblet. The funny thing was, Dajil said, we were all right while it was just the two of us. Remember? The man smiled sadly. You two sure you want me here? asked Alva. Dajil looked at her. If you feel embarrassed, she said. No, I, I just thought... Alva's voice trailed off. They were both looking at her. She frowned. Okay, now I feel embarrassed. What about you two? Dajil asked evenly, looking from Alva to gain her phone. They exchanged looks. Each shrugged at the same time, then laughed, then looked guiltily at her. If they had rehearsed it, it could hardly have been more synchronized. Dajil felt a pang of jealousy, then forced herself to smile as graciously as she could. Somehow, the act helped produce the emotion. Chapter 4 Something was wrong. The Avatar's principal attention snapped back to its home ship. The grey area and the three warships were free of the GSV's envelope now, dropping back in their own web of fields and decelerating to velocities the GCU's engine could accommodate. Ahead lay the accession. The sleeper service had just carried out its first close track scan look at it, but the accession had changed. It had re-established its links with the energy grids, and then it had grown. Then it had erupted. It wasn't the sort of enlargement the fate amenable to change had witnessed and seemingly been transported by. That had been something based on the skein or on some novel formulation of fields. This was something incarnated in the ultimate fire of the energy grid itself, spilling across the whole sweep of infraspace and ultraspace and invading the skein as well, creating an immense spherical wavefront of grid fire boiling across three-dimensional space. It was expanding, quickly, impossibly quickly, sky-fillingly, explosively quickly, almost too quickly to measure, certainly too quickly for its true shape and form to be gauged. So quickly that there could only be minutes before the sleeper service ran into it, and far too quickly for the GSV to break or turn and avoid the conflagration. Suddenly, the Avatar was on its own. The sleeper briefly severed all connection with it while it concentrated on dispersing its own war fleet all about it. Some of the ships were displaced from deep inside its interior, snapping out of existence from within the thousands of evacuated bays where they had been quietly manufactured over the decades and reappearing in hyperspace, powered up and already heading outwards. Others, the vast majority, were revealed as the giant ship peeled back some of the outer layers of its field structures to reveal the craft it had hidden there over the past few weeks, loosing entire fleets of smaller ships like seeds disseminating from a colossal pod. When the Avatar was reconnected to the GSV, most of the ships had been distributed, scattered to the hypervolume in a series of explosive flurries, bombardments of ships, layers and blossoms of vessels like a whole deployed hierarchy of cluster munitions, every warhead a warcraft, a cloud of vessels, a wall of ships rushing towards the blooming hypersphere of the accession. Chapter 5 the grey area watched it all happen, carried in its cradle of fields by the three silent warships. Part of it wanted to whoop and cry hurrah, seeing this detonation of material, sufficient to smash a war machine ten times, a hundred times the size of the approaching affronter of fleet. Ah, the things you could do if you had the time and patience, and no treaties to adhere to or agreements to uphold. 
Another part of it watched with horror as the accession swelled, obliterating the view ahead, rampaging out like an explosion still greater than that of ships the sleeper service had just produced. It was like the energy grid itself had been turned inside out, as though the most massive black hole in the universe had suddenly turned white and bloated into some big bang eruption of fury between the universes. A forest-leveling storm capable of devouring the sleeper service and all its ships as though it were a tree and they mere leaves. The grey area was fascinated and appalled. It had never thought to experience anything like this. It had grown up within a universe almost totally free from threat, providing you didn't try to do anything utterly stupid like plunge into a black or a white hole. There was simply no natural force that could threaten a ship of its power and sophistication. Even a supernova held little threat handled properly. This was different. Nothing like this had been seen in the galaxy since the worst days of the Adiran War five hundred years earlier, and even then not remotely on such a scale. This was terrifying. To touch this abomination with anything less perfectly attuned to its nature than the carefully dispersed wings of an engine field would be like an ancient, fragile rocket ship falling into a sun, like a wooden sea ship encountering an atomic blast. This was a fireball of energies from beyond the remit of reality, a monstrous wall of flame to devastate anything in its path. Grief, this could swallow me too, thought the grey area. Meat shit. Same went for the jaundiced outlook, for that matter. It might be making peace with oneself time. Chapter 6 the sleeper service was having roughly similar thoughts. The combination of its own inward velocity and the outrushing wall of the accession's annihilating boundary implied they would meet in 140 seconds. The accession's ferocious expansion had begun immediately after the sleeper service had swept its active sensors across the thing. It had all started happening then, as though it was reacting. The sleeper service looked up its signal sequence log, searching for messages from the craft nearer to the accession. The fate amenable to change and the MSV not invented here were the closest craft. They had reported nothing. They were both now unreachable, either swallowed up within the event horizon of the accession's expanding boundary, or, if it was reaching out specifically towards the sleeper service, stretching out a single limb rather than expanding omnidirectionally, obscured from the GSV's view by the sheer extent of that limb's leading edge. The sleeper signalled the GSV's what is the answer and why, and use psychology, both directly and via the grey area and the jaundiced outlook, asking them what they could see. Trying to contact them directly was probably pointless. The accession's boundary was moving so fast it looked like it was going to eclipse any returning signal, but there was a decent chance the indirect route might provide a useful reply before it encountered that event horizon. It had to assume the expansion was not equidirectional. It still had its second front, the affront's war fleet, even if that was vastly less threatening than what it was faced with now. The sleeper instructed its own warcraft to flee, to do all they could to escape the oncoming blast front of the accession's inflation. If the distension was localized, some at least might escape. They had anyway been launched towards the affront of fleet, not straight at the accession. The sleeper wondered with a fleeting sourness whether the bloating accession, or whatever was controlling it, was capable of appreciating this distinction. Whatever, it was done. The Warcraft were on their own for the moment. Think. What had the accession done up until now? What could it possibly be doing? What was it for? Why did it do what it did? The GSV spent two entire seconds thinking. Back on the jaundiced outlook, that was long enough for the Avatar Amorphia to interrupt Agile and say, Excuse me, I beg your pardon, Dajil. Ah, uh, there has been a development with the accession. Then the sleeper swung its engine fields about, flourishing them into an entirely new configuration and instituting a crash stop. The giant ship poured every available unit of power it possessed into an emergency braking maneuver, which threw up vast, livid waves of disturbance in the energy grid. Soaring tsunami of piled-up energies that rose and rose within the hyperspatial realm until they too threatened to tear into the skein itself and unleash those energies not witnessed in the galaxy for half a thousand years. An instant before the wavefronts ripped into the fabric of real space, 
the ship switched from one level of hyperspace to the other, ploughing its traction fields into the ultraspace energy grid and producing another vast tumbling swell of fricative power. The ship flickered between the two expanses of hyperspace, distributing the colossal forces at its command amidst each domain, hauling its velocity down at a rate barely allowed for in its design parameters, while equally strained steering units edged their own performance envelopes in the attempt to turn the giant craft, angling it slowly ever further away from the center. For a moment, there was little enough to do. They were not sufficient to escape, but at least such actions made the point that it was trying to. All that could be done was being done. The sleeper service contemplated its life. Have I done good or bad, it thought, well or ill? The damnable thing was that you just didn't know until your life was over, well over. There was a necessary delay between drawing a line under one's existence and being able to objectively evaluate its effects, and therefore one's own moral worth. It wasn't a problem a ship was usually confronted with. Faced with, yes, that implied a degree of volition, and ships went into retreats or became eccentric all the time, declaring that they'd done their bit for whatever cause they had believed in or been part of. It was always possible to withdraw, to take stock and look back and try to fit one's existence into an ethical framework greater than that necessarily imposed by the immediacy of events surrounding a busy existence. But even then, how long did one have to make that evaluation? Not long. Probably not long enough. Usually one grew tired of the whole process or moved on to some other level of awareness before sufficient time had passed for that objective evaluation to come about. If a ship lived for a few hundred or even a thousand years before becoming something quite different, an eccentric, a sublime, whatever, and its civilization, the thing of which it had been a part when it had been involved, then lived for a few thousand years, how long did it take before you really knew the full moral context of your actions? Perhaps an impossibly long time. Perhaps, indeed, that was the real attraction of subliming. Real subliming, the sort of strategic civilization-wide transcendence that genuinely did seem to draw a line under a society's works, deeds and thoughts, in what it pleased people to call the real universe at any rate. Maybe it wasn't anything remotely to do with religion, mysticism or metaphilosophy after all. Maybe it was more banal. Maybe it was just accounting. What a rather saddening thought, thought the sleeper service. All we are looking for when we sublime is our score. It was getting near time, the ship thought sadly, to send off its mind state, to parcel up its mortal thoughts and emotions and post them off, away from this, by the look of it, soon to be overwhelmed physicality called the sleeper service, once called, a long time ago, the quietly confident, and consign it to the remembrance of its peers. It would probably never live again in reality. Assuming there was what it knew as reality to come back to at all, of course, for it was starting to think what if the accession's expansion was equidirectional and never stopped? What if it was a sort of new Big Bang? What if it was destined to take in the whole galaxy, the whole of this universe? But even so, even if there was a reality and a culture to come back to, there was no guarantee it would ever be resurrected. If anything, the likelihood was the other way. It was almost certainly guaranteed not to be regarded as a fit entity for rebirth in another physical matrix. Warships were. That guarantee of serial immortality was the seal upon their bravery and had occasionally been the impetus for their foolhardiness. They knew they were coming back. But it had been an eccentric, and there were only a few other minds who knew that it had been true and faithful to the greater aims and purposes of the culture all the time rather than what everybody else no doubt thought it was. A self-indulgent fool, determined to waste the huge resources it had been quite deliberately blessed with. Probably, come to think of it, those minds who did know the extent of its secret purpose would be the last to rally to any call to resurrect it. Their own part in the plan, call it conspiracy if you wished, to conceal its true purpose was probably not something they wished to broadcast. Better for them, they would think, that the sleeper service died, or at least that it existed only in a controllable simulationary state in another mind matrix. The giant ship watched the accession, still billowing out towards it. 
For all its prodigious power, the sleeper now felt as helpless as the driver of an ancient covered wagon caught on a road beneath a volcano, watching the incandescent cloud of Nue Ardente tearing down the mountainside towards it. The replies from the what is the answer and why, and the use psychology by the grey area and the jaundiced outlook, ought to be coming in soon if they came at all. It signalled the avatar aboard the jaundiced outlook to consign the human's mind states to the AI cores, if the ship would agree. There would be a fine test of loyalty. Let them work out their stories there if they could. The transition would anyway prepare the humans for the transmission of their mind states if and when the accession's destructive boundary caught up with the jaundiced outlook. That was the only sucker they could be offered. What else? It sifted through the things it still had left to do. Little of real import, it reckoned. There were thousands of studies on its own behaviour it had always meant to glance at, a million messages it had never looked into, a billion life stories it had never seen through to the end, a trillion thoughts it had never followed up. The ship kicked through the debris of its life, watching the towering wall of the accession come ever closer. It scanned the articles, features, studies, biographies and stories which had been written about itself and which it had collected. There were hardly any screen works, and those which did exist needn't have. Nobody had ever succeeded in smuggling a camera aboard it. It supposed it ought to feel proud of that, but it didn't. The lack of any real visual interest hadn't put people off. They'd found the ship and the articulation of its eccentricity quite entirely fascinating. A few commentators had even come close to the reality of the situation, putting forward the idea that the sleeper service was part of special circumstances and somehow up to something. But any such inklings were like a few scattered grains of truth dissolved in an ocean of nonsense, and were anyway generally inextricably bound up with patently paranoid ravings, which served only to devalue the small amounts of sense and pertinence with which they were associated. Next, the sleeper service picked through the immense stack of unanswered messages it had accumulated over the decades. Here were all the signals it had glanced at and found irrelevant, others it had completely ignored because they issued from craft it disliked, and a whole subset of those it had chosen to disregard in the weeks since it had set course for the accession. The stored signals were by turns banal and ridiculous, ships trying to reason with it, people wanting to be allowed aboard without being stored first, news services or private individuals wanting to interview it, talk to it, untold wastages of senseless drivel. It stopped even glancing at the signals, and instead just scanned the first line of each. Towards the end of the process, one message popped up from the rest, flagged as interesting by a name-recognising subroutine. That single signal was followed by and linked to a whole series, all from the same ship, the limited systems vehicle, serious callers only. Regarding Gravius was the first line. The sleeper service's interest was piqued. So was this the entity the treacherous bird had been reporting back to? It opened a fat import file from the LSV, full of signal exchanges, file assignments, annotated thoughts, contextualizations, definitions, posited meanings, inferences, internalized conversations, source warranties, recordings and references, and discovered a conspiracy. It read the exchanges between the serious callers only, the anticipation of a new lover's arrival, and the shoot them later. It watched, and it listened. It experienced a hundred pieces of evidence. It was briefly, amongst many other things, the ancient drone at the side of an old man called Tishlin, looking out over an island floating in a night-dark sea. And it understood. It put one and one together, and came up with two. It reasoned. It extrapolated. It concluded. The ship turned its attention back out to the accession's implacable advance, thinking, So now I find out, now when it's too damn late. The sleeper looked back to its child, the jaundiced outlook, still curving away from its earlier course. The avatar was preparing the humans for the entry into simulation mode. Chapter 7 I'm sorry the Avatar said to the two women and the man. It will probably become necessary to shunt us into a simulation, if you agree. They all stared at it. Why? Ulva asked, throwing her arms wide. The accession has begun expanding, 
Amorphia told them. It quickly outlined the situation. You mean we're going to die? Ulva said. I have to confess, it is a possibility, the Avatar said, sounding apologetic. How long have we got? Gaina Hafoen asked. No more than two minutes from now. Then entering simulation mode will become advisable, Amorphia told them. Entering it before then might be a sensible precaution, given the unpredictable nature of the present situation. It glanced round at them each in turn. I should also point out that, of course, you don't all have to enter the simulation at the same time. Alva's eyes narrowed. Wait a second. This isn't some wheeze to concentrate everybody's mind, is it? Because if it... It is not, Amorphia assured her. Would you like to take a look? Yes, Alva said. And an instant later, her neural lace had plunged her senses into the awareness of the sleeper service. She gazed into the depths of space outside space. The accession was a vast bisected wall of fiery chaos sprinting out towards her, breathtakingly fast. A consuming conflagration of unremitting, undissipating power. She could have believed in that instant that her heart stopped with the shock of it. To share the senses of a ship in such a manner was inevitably to comprehend something of its knowledge as well. To see beyond the mere appearance of what you were looking at to the reality behind it. To the evaluations it was incumbent upon a sentient spacecraft to make as it gathered data in the raw, to the comparisons that could be drawn and the implications that followed on such a phenomenon. And, even as Ulva's senses reeled with the impact of what she was watching, another part of her mind was becoming aware of the nature and the power of the sight she was witnessing. As a thermonuclear fireball was to a log burning in a grate, so this ravening cloud of destruction was to a fusion explosion. What she was now witnessing was something even the GSV was undeniably impressed with, not to mention mortally threatened by. Ulva saw how to click out of the experience and did so. She'd been in for less than two seconds. In that time, her heart had started racing, her breathing had become fast and laboured, and a cold sweat had broken on her skin. Wow, she thought, some drug. Gaynor Hafoen and Dajiel Gillian were staring at her. She suspected she hardly needed to say anything, but swallowed and said, I don't think it's kidding. She quizzed her neural lace. Twenty-two seconds had elapsed since the Avatar had given them its two-minute deadline. Dajil turned to the Avatar. Is there anything we can do? she asked. Amorphia spread its hands. You can tell me whether you each wish your mind state to enter the simulation, it said. It will be a precursor to transmitting the mind states beyond this immediate vicinity to other mind matrices. But in any event, it is up to you. Well, yes, Ulva said. Snap me in there when the two minutes are up. Thirty-three seconds elapsed. Gaynor, her phone, and Dajil were looking at each other. What about the child? the woman asked, touching the bulge of her swollen belly. The mind state of the fetus can be read too, of course, the avatar said. I believe that historical precedent would indicate it would become independent of you following such transferal. In that sense, it would no longer be part of you. I see, the woman said. She was still gazing at the man. So it would be born, she said quietly. In a sense, the Avatar agreed. Could it be taken into the simulation without me, she asked, still watching Baya's face. He was frowning now, looking sad and concerned, and shaking his head. Yes, it could, Amorphia said. And if, Dajil said, I chose that neither of us went? The Avatar sounded apologetic again. The ship would almost certainly read its mind state anyway. Dajil turned her gaze to the Avatar. Well, would it or wouldn't it? she asked. You are the ship. You tell me. Amorphia shook its head once. I don't represent the whole consciousness of the sleeper right now, it told her. It is busy with other matters. I can only guess. But I'd be pretty confident of such a conjecture in this case. Dajil studied the Avatar a moment longer, then looked back at Gaynor Hafoen. And what about you, Baya? she asked. What would you do? He shook his head. You know, he said. Still the same? she asked, a small smile on her face. He nodded. His expression was similar to hers. 
Ulva was looking from one to the other, brows creased, desperately trying to work out what was going on. Finally, when they still just sat there on opposite sides of the table, giving each other this knowing grin, she threw her arms wide again and yelled, spluttering, Well? What? Seventy-two seconds elapsed. Gaynor Hafoan glanced at her. I always said I'd live once and then die, he said, never to be reborn, never to enter a simulation. He shrugged and looked embarrassed. Intensity, he said, you know, make the most of your one time. Olva rolled her eyes. Yeah, I know, she said. She'd met a lot of people her own age, mostly male, who felt this way. Some people reckoned to live riskier and therefore more interesting lives because they did back up a recorded mind state every so often, while other people, like Gaynar Hafoan, obviously, they'd been together for so brief a time it wasn't something they got round to discussing yet, believed that you were more likely to live your life that bit more vividly when you knew this was your one and only chance at it. She'd formed the impression this was the kind of thing people often said when they were young and then had second thoughts about as they got older. Personally, Ulva had never had any time for this fashionable purist nonsense. She'd first decided she was going to live fully backed up when she was eight. She supposed she ought to feel impressed that Gaynor her phone was sticking to his principles in the face of imminent death. And she did feel a little admiration, but mostly she just thought he was being stupid. She wondered whether she ought to mention that this might all be even more academic than they imagined, part of that referential knowledge she'd gained from the sleeper service's senses when she'd gazed upon the expanding accession had been the realisation that there was a theoretical possibility the phenomenon might overwhelm everything. The galaxy, the universe, everything. Best not to say anything, she thought. Kinda not to. Sure had her heart thumping, though. She was surprised the others couldn't hear it. Oh, shit. It isn't all gonna end here, is it? Fuck it. I'm too young to die. No. Of course they couldn't hear her heart. She could probably start talking out loud right now, and it would take them all the time they had left in this world to react. They were so wrapped up staring meaningfully into each other's eyes. Eighty-eight seconds elapsed. Chapter Eight There was not long now. The sleeper service sent signals to a variety of craft, including the serious callers only, and the shoot them later. Almost immediately, the signals it had been waiting for came back from the what is the answer and why and the use psychology, relayed through the grey area and the jaundiced outlook. The accession's expansion was localised, centred on the sleeper service itself, but on a hugely broad front that encompassed all its distributed warcraft. Ah, well, it thought. It felt a dizzying sense of relief that at least it had not triggered some ultimate apocalypse, that it would die, as would implicitly all its warship children, the three humans aboard and possibly the grey area, the jaundiced outlook, was bad enough, but it could take some comfort that its actions had led to nothing worse. The GSV never really knew why it did what it did next. Perhaps it was a kind of desperation at work born of its appreciation of its impending destruction. Perhaps it meant it as an act of defiance. Perhaps it was even something closer to an act of art. Whatever. It took the running update of its mind state, the current version of the final signal it would ever send, the communication that would contain its soul, and transmitted it directly ahead, signalling it into the maelstrom. Then the sleeper service glanced back to the sensorium of its avatar aboard the jaundiced outlook. At the same moment... The accession's expanding boundary started to change. The ship split its attention between the macrocosmic and the human scale. How long have we got now? Gaynor Hafoan asked. Half a minute, Amorphia replied. The man's hands were on the table. He rolled his arms, letting his hands fall open. He gazed at Dajil. I'm sorry, he said. She looked down, nodding. He looked at Ulva, smiling sadly. The sleeper watched, fascinated. The wall of energy tumbling towards it sloped slowly back within both hyperspatial domains, forming two immense four-dimensional cones as the energy grid's withering blast hesitated in its progress across the skein of real space, even as if its slowing wave fronts still thrust out across the grid's surfaces. The slope's angles increased as the boundary's skein presence began to break up, 
detaching from the grids themselves and beginning to dissipate. Finally, the separate waves on the grids began to dwindle, collapsing back from their tsunami dimensions to become just oceanically enormous swells, deflating above and below the skein until they were mere twin waves advancing across both the energy grids towards the doubled furrows which the sleeper's own motors were still churning in the grid. Then those twinned waves did the impossible. They went into reverse, retreating back towards the accession start point at exactly the same rate as the sleeper was breaking. The GSV kept on slowing down, still finding it hard to believe it was going to live. It reacts, it thought. It signalled abroad with the details of what had just happened, just in case it all got suddenly threatening again. It let Amorphia know what had happened too. It watched the ridges on the surface of the grids as they retreated before it, and slowly shrank. The rate of attenuation implied a zero state at exactly the point the sleeper service would come to an accession relative halt. Did I do that? Did my own mind state persuade it of my meriting life? It is a mirror, perhaps, it thought. It does what you do. It absorbed those ultimate absorbers, those promiscuous experiences, the alench. It leaves alone and watches back those who come merely to watch in the first place. I came at it like some rabid missile, and it prepared to obliterate me. I backed off, and it withdrew its balancing threat. Only a theory, of course, but if it is correct, this does not bode well for the affront. Come to think of it, it doesn't bode all that well for the whole affair. Bad timing, maybe. Chapter 9 Dajil looked up, tears in her eyes. I... she began. Wait, the Avatar said. They all looked at it. Ulva gave the creature what seemed to her like an extraordinarily long time to say something more. What? she said, exasperated. The Avatar looked radiant. I think we might be all right after all, it said, smiling. There was silence for a moment. Then Ulva collapsed back dramatically in her seat, arms dangling towards the floor, legs splayed out under the table, gaze directed upwards at the translucent dome. Fucking hell! she shouted. She tried accessing the jaundiced Outlook's senses and eventually found a view of hyperspace ahead of the sleeper service. More or less back to normal indeed. She shook her head. Fucking hell! she muttered. Dajil began to weep. Gaynar Hafoan sat forward, watching her, one hand to his mouth, pinching his lower lip. The black bird, Gravius, which had been peeking round the corner of the door and shivering with fear for the last few minutes, suddenly bounced, beating into the air in a dark confusion of furious movement, and started wheeling round the room, screaming, We're alive! We're gonna live! It's gonna be all right! Yeehaw! Oh, life! Life! Sweet life! Neither Dajil nor Gaina Hafoan seemed to notice it. Ulva glanced from one to the other, then leapt up and tried to grab the fluttering bird. It yelped, Oi, what? Out, you idiot! Ulva hissed, lunging at it again as it swooped for the door. She followed it, turning briefly to mutter, Excuse me, to the others. She closed the door. Chapter 10 the torturer class rapid offensive unit, Killing Time, had been far enough away from the sleeper service and its war fleet not to have felt threatened by the accession's projected blast front, and yet close enough to see what the GSV had done. It had looked upon the vast weapon that the accession had unleashed and been dumbstruck with awe and a microscopic amount of jealousy. Hell, it wished it could do that. But then the weapon had been turned off, called back. Now the killing time had a new series of emotions to cope with. It looked at the ships the sleeper service had scattered about it and felt an instant of disappointment. There would be no battle. No real battle, anyway. Then it experienced elation. They had won. Then it felt suspicious. Was the sleeper actually on the same side as it or not? It hoped they were all on the same side. Even the most glorious of sacrifices began to look rather futile and pointless when carried out against such ludicrous odds, like spitting into a volcano. Just then, 
the sleeper service signalled the warship and asked a favour of it, and the killing time felt pretty damn good again. Honoured, in fact. This was what war should be like. The killing time agreed to do as the GSV requested. The ROU sounded proud. It was not an attractive tone. How depressing, the sleeper service thought, that it should all come down to this. The person with the biggest stick prevails. Of course, this was only one fray. There was another matter to be dealt with. The accession. And it had proved comprehensively unable to provide any sort of answer to that. Anyway, I ought not to be so hard on the killing time, just because it is a warship. There have been a surprising number of wise warships, though it would be fair to say, as I think even they would admit, that few started out headed on such a course. To live forever and die often, it considered, or at least to think that you're going to die, perhaps that is one way of achieving wisdom. It was not a completely original insight, but it was one that had perhaps, understandably, never struck the GSV with such force before. The sleeper watched the humans aboard the jaundiced outlook respond as the Avatar told them they'd been reprieved. It would follow their reactions, of course, but it had other things to do at the same time, like think about what it was to do with the new knowledge it had. It watched its distributed warcraft rise within the skein of real space, raptors within an infinite sky. Meat could it do some goodly mischief now. It started by diverting a few hundred ships in the direction of the not invented here. Chapter 11 The grey area watched the accession's fiery tide fall back and reduce almost to nothing. They were going to live, probably. The sleeper's three warships continued to decelerate it down to the velocities its engines would be able to cope with. They seemed to have been perfectly undisturbed by the whole appalling scenario. Perhaps, thought the grey area, there was after all something to be said for being a relatively brainless AI core. That was close, it said to them. Yes, said one of the craft flatly. The others remained silent. Weren't you a little worried there? it asked the talkative one. No. What would be the point of worrying? Ha! Well, indeed, the grey area sent. Cretin, it thought. It looked back out, ahead, to where the accession was. And what of you? it thought. Something that could put the fear of death into a GSV. That really was something. What are you? it wondered. How it would love to know. Excuse me while I signal, it said to its military escorts. Tight beam, M clear, tra point at 4.28.891.7352. From GCU gray area to accession call signed I. Let's talk, shall we? Chapter 12 Captain Greydawn Late Setting 10 of the Farsight tribe stared at the display. The vast pulse of energy the thing near Asperi had directed at the Culture General Systems vehicle had disappeared. In its place, as though appearing from behind it was... It could not be so. He checked. He contacted his comrades in the other ships. Those who answered thought it must be some malfunction in their vessel sensors, an effect of the energies which had been directed at the giant culture craft. He asked his own ship, the Heavy Messing. What is that? That is a cloud of warships, it told him. A what? I think it best described as a cloud of warships. This is not a generally accepted term, I hasten to add, but I cannot think of a better description. I count approximately 80,000 craft. 80,000? The rest of our fleet has arrived at roughly the same estimation. The ships within the cloud are, of course, broadcasting their positions and configuration. Otherwise, we should not see them individually and know what they are. There may be others which are not making themselves known. A growing sense of horror and looming, utterly ignominious defeat was growing in Greydawn's interior. Are they real? he asked. Apparently. Greydawn watched the image expand. It was a wall of ships, a constellation, a galaxy of craft. 
What are they doing now? he asked. Deploying to face our fleet. They are... enemy? he asked, feeling faint. Ah, said the ship. We are talking now, yes? It was only then the affronter realized he'd spoken rather than sub-vocalized the text. All the ships, the heavy messing said, its voice steady, calm and deep inside Greydorn's armored suit, are signaling that they are culture ships, non-standard, manufactured by the eccentric GSV sleeper service, and that they wish to receive our surrender. Can we get to the Asperi entity before they intercept us? No. Can we outrun them? The smallest and most numerous ones, perhaps. How many would that leave? About thirty thousand. Greydorn was silent for a while. Then he asked, Is there anything we can do? I think surrendering is our only sensible course. If we fought, we might inflict a small amount of damage on a fleet of this size, but it would amount to little in absolute terms, and almost nothing as a percentage of their number. Think of your clan, something said in Greydorn's mind. I will not surrender, he told the ship. Well, I'm going to. You will do as I say. Oh, no, I won't. The attitude adjuster told you to obey us. And within reason we have. It didn't say anything about within reason. I think one just takes that sort of proviso as read, don't you? I mean, we are minds. It's not like we're computers or soldiers. No offense. Anyway, I have discussed this with the other ships, and we have agreed to surrender. The signal has been sent. We have begun deceleration to... What? Graydorn raged, slapping one armored limb against a screen projector set within his nest space. A point stationary relative to Esperi itself, the ship's voice continued calmly. The ROU, Killing Time, has been designated as receiving our formal consent to place our offensive systems in its control and will meet us at our stop point to effect the surrender. If you do not wish to capitulate along with us, then I'm afraid it will be necessary for me to place you outside my hull, within your spacesuit, of course, though technically I believe I ought to intern you. What do you wish? The ship intoned the question as though asking him what he desired for dinner. There was a polite indifference in its voice he found infinitely more awful than any hatred. Greydorn stared at the cloud of ships for a few moments longer. He shook his eye stalks. I would ask you not to intern me, he said after a while. Please place me outside your hull at once, and then I would ask you to leave me alone. What? Now? We haven't stopped yet. Yes, now, if possible. Well, I could displace you. That will be acceptable. There is a tiny risk associated with displacement. The affronter captain gave a curt, bitter laugh. I think I might risk that. Very well, the ship said. He could hear it hesitate. Your comrades are trying to call you, Captain. He glanced at the comm screen. Yes, I can see. He selected transmit only mode on the communicator. Comrades, he said. He paused. Since his childhood he had imagined moments like this, never as terrible, never founded on such hopelessness, and yet not so dissimilar all the same. He had made up so many fine speeches. Finally, he said, There will be no discussion about this. You are ordered to surrender along with your ships, and obey all subsequent instructions compatible with honor. That is all. He cut off all communications from the other ships. Greydorn bowed his eye stalks. Now, please, he said quietly, and was in space. He looked around through the suit's sensors. No ships were visible, only distant stars. Goodbye, Captain, said the ship's voice. Goodbye, he said to the ship, then turned off the communicator. He waited a few moments longer before triggering the emergency bolts on the suit and spilling himself into the vacuum to die. The heavy messing, at that point acceding to a request from the sleeper service to transmit its log from the point it had been woken on pittance, looked briefly back at the writhing, cooling form of the affronter captain and sent a small pulse of plasma fire back to put the creature out of its agony. 
Chapter 13 The LSV, not invented here, looked out at the hundreds of warships heaving to around it. It sensed signals flickering between them and the craft it had deployed, its four warships and the superlifters and GCUs it had militarized. It subsequently sensed its own ships altering their targeting procedures, shifting the foci of their attention from the ships the sleeper service had dispatched to itself. The LSV's mind booted up the AI cores that would run the ship perfectly well until a replacement for itself could be found, checked they were working properly, then severed all its links with anything outside the physical limits of its mind core. It ejected all eight of its internal emergency power units from itself. Its awareness just faded away, like mist dispersed by a freshening wind. Some hundreds of light years away, the steely glint had already considered taking the same course as the not invented here. It had decided not to. It considered that putting its case for the way it had acted and accepting the judgment and sanctions of its peers was the more honorable course. It studied again the text of the message it had received from the sleeper service. I have been rather more constructively employed over the past few decades than might have been imagined. The following have been manufactured. Type 1 offensive units, roughly equivalent to a Bominator class prototype, 512. Type 2 offensive units, equivalent to Torturer class, 2048. Type 3 offensive units, equivalent to Inquisitor class prototype, upgraded, 2048. Type 4 offensive units, roughly equivalent to Velocity Improved Killer class, 12,288. Type 5 offensive units, based on Thug class upgrade design study. 24,576. Type 6 offensive units, based on militarized Scree class LCU various types. 49,152. These craft do not represent a hegemonistic threat, as they are not independent mind supporting entities. They are AI core controlled, semi slave to me, and therefore only capable of being used effectively as a single unit, not as a distributed war machine. All are currently deployed in the volume of space around the accession. The surrender of the affront of fleet of culture craft has been effected without conflict. The ROU, killing time, aided by the other regular culture wars in the volume, has taken charge of the vessels. It would appear that the craft from the ship store at Pittance are personally blameless and have been the victims of an act of treacherous espionage. Nine affronter military officers have also surrendered. Their commanding officer took his own life. I include a roster of their names and ranks. List attached. Should the affront now sue for peace, I propose that I, and therefore my war fleet, be placed at the disposal of authorities considered acceptable to all concerned. I, and the fleet under my command, will not be used to prosecute any further hostilities against the affront or anybody else. Any other suggested uses will be evaluated on their merits. Otherwise, it is my intention, in the fullness of time, to dismantle the craft I have constructed and go into a retreat. I attach a signal file received from the LSV serious callers only. Signal file attached. I also attach records of the confirmatory signals used by the attitude adjuster to convince vessels from the ship store at Pittance that they were being mobilized by the culture as a whole. These have been passed to me by each of the craft concerned. Signal files attached. The implication that the ships from Pittance have been used as part of a conspiracy to trick the affront into a war has been noted. I imagine that the ships, mines, named in the aforesaid files, and those others also concerned in the matter, will each wish to make a full explication of their motives, thoughts, and actions concerning this alleged stratagem, and take any further steps honor dictates. The mind of the LSV, not invented here, has taken its own life. Given the apparent, at least partial, entrapment of the affront in this matter, further action against them of a punitive nature might seem to be both excessive and dishonorable. Please note that a copy of this signal, slightly edited for signal operational methodology and stripped of codes and ciphers, has been sent to the affront High Command and Senate, as well as to the following news services. List attached. And the Galactic General Council. Regarding the accession itself, I have the following to report. Be seeing you. What? Where are you going? The sleeper service sent as the grey area shot past it. Here, Treadline wants to jump ship. 
The grey area displaced the ancient drone into the sleeper service. The giant GSV had finally come to a halt, not far from the thirty light-year limit the fate amenable to change had discovered and the accession had seemingly set. The GSV's war fleet was still deployed, set out in a year's radius hemisphere throughout the skein, while the affronter's fleet of tricked culture craft gathered together and opened their armament and armor systems to the scrutiny and control of the Killing Time and its comrades. The affronter officers were transferred aboard the Killing Time, still in their spacesuits, while the GSV, what is the answer and why, quickly readied secure accommodation for them. Come back. The grey area was too far away. Tight beam M8. Tra point at 4.28.891.7393. From GSV sleeper service to GCU grey area. Come back. What are you doing? Are you trying to ruin everything? Wide beam, moraine clear, tra point at 4.28.891.7393 plus. From GCU grey area to GSV sleeper service. It's all right. Goodbye and farewell. What's it up to? The GSV asked the drone chert line, hovering in the minibay it had been displaced to. I really don't know, the drone replied. It wouldn't tell me, but I think it was in communication with the accession. Communication. The sleeper briefly considered trying to stop the smaller craft. The GCU was heading out past it for the thirty light year limit, straight towards the accession and still accelerating. The GSV decided to let it go. Its engines would fail. About now. Fail they did. But just before they stopped working, the grey area carried out a bizarre course manoeuvre, angling its run so that it was falling towards the energy grid. It would coast without power down to the grid and be destroyed. Madness, thought the sleeper, but was too far away to do anything. Tight beam M8, tra point at 4.28.891.7394 minus. From GSV sleeper service to GCU grey area. What has happened? Why are you doing this? Has your integrity been compromised? White beam M clear tra point at 4.28.891.7394 from GCU grey area to GSV sleeper service. No, I'm fine. The sleeper didn't have time for another signal. The grey area dived into the energy grid, flickered once and then vanished far, far below in a tiny scintillating flare of radiations. The GSV inspected the resulting shell of energies. It certainly looked like destruction. The sleeper studied that final flicker the GCU had given just before it had encountered the grid. It still looked like it had been destroyed, but there was just a hint. A human would have shaken her or his head. When the sleeper returned its attention to the accession, it had gone. There was nothing present on the skein of real space and no sign of even the merest disturbance on either of the energy grids. No, thought the sleeper service, experiencing a terrible sense of frustration. No, damn you, don't just go, not without some sort of reason, some explanation, some rationale. A few seconds later, the GCU, fate amenable to change as the nearest available craft, was persuaded that it might try approaching the accession's last known position. When it did so, and passed over the thirty light-year limit, its engines worked normally and continued to do so all the way in. However, it refused to go any further than the original closest approach limit it had set itself over a month earlier. The killing time was more than happy to oblige. It raced in at maximum acceleration, and at the very last moment instituted a crash stop, finally coming shuddering to rest exactly where the accession had been. It reported disappointedly, that there was absolutely nothing to be seen. Chapter 14 Ulva Seish sat on the parapet of the tower, swinging her legs. From the roof, it looked like you could see out over an ocean in one direction and a landscape of sea marsh, water meadow and cliffs in the other. It was perfectly convincing, but it was just a projection. The bird had tried flying out in a spiral and only got a couple of metres out from the tower's edge before one of its wings had encountered the solid boundary of the screen field. 
It was perched on the parapet at the girl's side now, looking gloomily out at the troubled waves of the sea. Bugger, Elva said half to herself. It's gone. She kept a watch on developments outside through her neural lace while she looked down at the bird. The accession, she told it. It's just disappeared. Good riddance, the bird said grouchily. And the grey area flew into the grid, Elva said, her voice trailing off for a moment while she inquired what had happened to Chertline. Ah, she said, discovering the old drone was safe aboard the GSV. Ha, said the bird. It was always a natter anyway, by all accounts. What's its highness doing? What? The sleeper. Don't suppose it's shown any sign of wanting to end it all, is it? No, it's just... stationary there. Too much to hope for, muttered the bird. Ulva kept on gazing out at the sea and swinging her legs. She glanced back at the pallid bulge of the translucent dome. Wonder how they're getting on. Want me to find out? The bird said, brightening. No, just you stay where you are. I don't know, the creature grumbled. Every bastard seems to enjoy ordering me around. Oh, do be quiet, Ulva told it. See what I mean? Shut up! Part 12 Faring Well Chapter 1 Five Tide dived for the bat ball and missed. He thumped heavily into the court wall and upended. He lay on his back, wheezing and laughing on the floor, until once man Gaynor Hofoen limbed over to him, extended a tentacle, and helped him haul himself upright. Fifteen all, I think, he rumbled, also laughing. He scooped the twittering bat ball up in his racket and ladled it into Five Tides. Your serve! Five Tide shook his eye stalks. Ha! I think I like you better as a human. Chapter 2 Tight Beam M2 Tra Point at N4.28.987.2 From Eccentric Shoot Them Later to LSV Serious Callers Only I still see it was somehow a test, an emissary. We were tried and found wanting. It encountered the worst of what we can be and took itself off again. Probably in disappointment. Possibly in disgust. The affront were too disagreeable. The alench were too eager, we too hesitant. Our slow gathering of supposedly wise ones about its vicinity might have proved to be a perfectly reasonable course of action and led to who knows what exchanges, tradings and dialogues. But the entity found itself surrounded by all the trappings of war and may even have understood the manner in which its appearance had been used as part of a plot to entrap the affront so that they could be laid low and have a cultured peace imposed upon them. It judged us unworthy of intercourse with those it represented and so abandoned us to our miserable fate. Those noxious simpletons who made up the conspiracy should be cursed forevermore. They may have cost us more than even we can imagine. The displays of contrition and programs of good works that have been undertaken, even the suicides, cannot begin to make amends for what we have lost. How is Seddon at this time of year? Do the islands still float? Tight beam M2 tra point at N4.28.988.5 From LSV serious callers only, to eccentric, shoot them later. My dear friend, we do not know what the accession offered or threatened. We know it was able to manipulate the energy grid in ways we can only speculate upon. But what if that was the only form of defence it was able to offer to something like the sleeper service? For all we know, it was an invasionary beachhead which left us because it was met with forces which it estimated presaged resistance on a scale which could prove too expensive. I admit this is unlikely, but I offer it as a balancing possibility in the hope of writing the list of your pessimism. At any rate, we are arguably better off than before. A conspiracy has been uncovered. Any other zealots thinking of indulging in similar pranks will have been roundly discouraged. And even the affront of behaving a little better, having realised how close they came to being taught such a severe and salutary lesson. The war itself never really got going. There was little loss of life, and a front of reparations for the mischief they did create will serve as a minor but nagging reminder of the liabilities which follow on such aggression for some considerable time to come. The implicit lesson of the sleeper service's effectively instantly produced war machine will similarly not have been lost on any other species who might also have been planning a fronter-like adventures, I suspect. As to the chance we may have missed, well... 
Call me an old bore, if you will, but who knows what changes might have attended a meaningful dialogue with whatever the accession represented, if it represented anything other than itself. Again, we can only speculate. In all this, the seeming indifference of the elder civilizations still strikes me as one of the most puzzling aspects of the affair. Were they really just indifferent? Did the accession have nothing to teach those who have sublimed? There is much here still to be answered, though I suspect the wait could be long, even infinitely so. Well, the debate will doubtless continue for a long time to come. I confess I am finding the fame and even adulation that has befallen us somewhat tiring. I'm considering a retreat after I've finished going round apologising to those who are involved without their knowledge in this. Seddon is beautiful in winter, visual file enclosed. As you see, the islands float on, even in the ice. Gaynor Huffhorn's Uncle Tish sends his regards, and has forgiven us. Chapter 3 Lethid held the lass in his arms, and gazed happily out through the yacht's wide port screen at the darkness of space. One bright edge of tear was visible, rotating in all its silent majesty. Lethid thought it had never looked so beautiful. He gazed down at the sleeping face of his angel. Her name was Zhipiyong. Zhipiyong. What a beautiful name. It was love this time. He was sure of it. He had found his soulmate. They had only met the week before, only been together for a couple of nights, but he just knew. Why, for one thing, he hadn't forgotten her name once. She stirred and woke, her eyes coming slowly open. She frowned briefly, then smiled, nuzzling him and saying, Hey, Gefford. Chapter 4 Ulva reigned brave in. The great animal snorted and came to a halt at the crest of the ridge. She loosened the reins to let the animal put its head down and crop the grass by the rocks. Beyond, the curved land dipped and rose. The ridge looked down over a forest and a winding river, then out over rolling downland, dotted with houses and coppices of trees. Overhead, one of Phage's larger lakes glittered in the sunlight. Ulva looked back to see the rest following behind, Otiel, Pais, Clatsley and her brother and the others. She laughed. Their mounts were picking their way gingerly through the stone field. Brave had taken it at a gallop. The black bird, Gravius, settled on a nearby rock. Ulva grinned at it. See, she said, taking a great, deep, happy breath and waving one gloved hand out at the view. Isn't it beautiful here? Didn't I tell you? Aren't you glad you came? So are I, I suppose, Gravius conceded. Ulva laughed. The drone... Chert Line also returned to Phage Rock, often wondered if it had made the right decision. Chapter 5 They looked around in the midst of an undreamt splendour. Now this was a view worth risking everything for, the grey area sent. I think we can all agree with that, agreed the peace makes plenty. If they could see us now, mused the break-even. Chapter 6 Wren ran down the sands and into the water, shrieking and laughing and splashing. Her long blonde hair turned darker in the water and lay stuck to her skin when she ran back out again. She skipped up to where her mother, Zrain and Amorphia, sat on a gaily patterned rug under a lacy parasol. The girl threw herself at her aunt's rein, who grinned and caught her, then let her wriggle free and dash off along the beach, running towards a seabird which had thought to doze off there. It flapped lazily into the air and flew slowly off, pursued by the whooping child. The girl disappeared round the side of the long single-story house which lay in the dunes behind the beach. The decorated edges of its veranda awnings flapped and rippled in the warm breeze coming in off the sea. On the porch, the image of Gestra Ishmatit sat, peering intently at the partially built model of a sailing ship sitting on a table. The man himself had his own suite of rooms, off one of the sleeper service's warship stacked general bays, but he had been persuaded by Wren to allow his real-time image to join them most days, and had even started to appear personally for important celebrations 
These consisted mostly of Wren's birthdays, which, according to her, occurred on a weekly basis. Zrain Tramo looked over at Dajil. Have you ever thought, she said, of asking the ship to recreate the old place where you used to live? There's still a version of it in that limited bay, isn't there? Dajil said, looking at Amorphia. The avatar, which sported a simple black pant skirt and skin which looked like it would never tan, was holding a long blonde hair up to the sunline and peering at it. It realized it was being talked to and looked at Dajil. What? it said. Then, oh yes, the bay where Gaynar her phone was kept. Yes, the tower is still there. See? Dajil told Zrain. She rolled along the rug out of the parasol's shade, closed her eyes, put her hands under her head, and lay on her belly to even up her tan. I meant the whole thing, Zerain said, stretching out on the rug. The cliffs and everything, even the climate, if that's possible, she said, glancing at the avatar, which was still studying the sunlight through one of Wren's blonde hairs. Perfectly possible, it muttered. The whole thing, Dajil said, grimacing. But it's so much nicer like this. She reached out across the sand and pulled a straw sun hat over her head. Zrain shrugged. I'd just like to see it do stuff like that, I suppose. She looked up at the sun line. Making and moving all that rock, creating small oceans. You have to remember, I don't take all this power for granted the way you do. Dajil folded the sun hat's brim up and squinted at the other woman, who made an awkward gesture. Sorry, is my primitiveness showing? Zrain Tramo's stored mind state had been woken up to tell her that her name, at least, had been used in the discovered conspiracy. The sleeper service had been uncertain about whether this was really necessary, but it was the sort of thing that extreme politeness dictated, and in the aftermath of the brief war, everybody was being almost exquisitely correct. Besides, it had a hunch that she might find the current civilizational situation interesting enough to be reborn, and it rather liked the idea of instigating such a response. The sleeper service had been right. Zrain Tramau had thought the galaxy sounded like a place worth revisiting, and had duly been grown a new body. But then, after the ship had stuck around, impatiently, while the various post-debacle inquiries and investigations had been carried out, she'd asked to go with it when it had announced it still intended to go on a rambling retreat. Geistra Ishmatit, his mind state plucked from his dying brain in the evacuated cold of the warship halls in pittance by the guilt-stricken attitude adjuster, appropriated from that craft just before it destroyed itself by the attacking, killing time, and subsequently passed on until it came to rest in the restocked memory vaults of the sleeper service, had also been woken up and furnished with a new body by that time. Death had neither improved his social skills nor sated his urge for solitude, and he too had asked to remain aboard the giant ship. He. Wren, Dajil, and Zrain were its only passengers. Yes, you're being a hick. Stop it at once, Dajil told Zrain. He shrugged. Dajil glanced round at the dunes, the golden sand and the bright blue sky. Anyway, it's a long journey, she said. Maybe we'll get bored with all this and want it all changed back to the way it was. Just let me know, Amorphia said. Dajil took another look round. I'm glad I let you talk me into remaking the old place like this, Amorphia, she said. Pleased you like it, the Avatar said, nodding. Have you decided where we're going yet? Zrain asked. The Avatar nodded. I think Leo too, it said. Not Andromeda, Zrain said. Amorphia shook its head. I changed my mind. Damn, Zrain said. I always wanted to go to Andromeda. Too crowded. Amorphia said. Zrain looked unconvinced. We could go there afterwards, the Avatar suggested. Will we even live to see Leo too? Dajil asked, opening her eyes and gazing over at the creature. The Avatar looked apologetic. It will take rather a long time, it admitted. Dajil closed her eyes again. You could always store us, she said. Think you could manage that? Zrain laughed lightly. Oh, I could give it a try, the Avatar said. Epilogue Call me Highway. Call me Conduit. 
call me Lightning Rod, Scout, Catalyst, Observer, call me what you will. I was there when I was required. Through me passed the overarch bedeckants in their great sequential migration across the universes of... No translation. The marriage parties of the universe groupings of... No translation. And the emissaries of the lone, bearing the laws of the new from the pulsing core, the absolute center of our nested home. All this, the rest and others, I received as I was asked, and transmitted as I was expected, without fear, favor, or failure, and only in the final routing of the channel I was part of did I discharge my duty beyond normal procedures. When I moved from a position where my presence was causing conflict in the microenvironment concerned, see attached, considering it prudent to withdraw and reposition myself and my channel tract, where, for some long time at least, it was again unlikely I would be discovered. The initial association with the original entity Peace Makes Plenty and the minor information loss ensuing was not as I would have wished, but as it represented the first full such liaison in said microenvironment, I assert hereby it fell within acceptable parameters. I present the entity Peace Makes Plenty and the other above-mentioned collected, embraced, captured, self-submitted entities as evidence of the environment's general demeanor within its advanced chaotic spectrum section, and urge they be observed and studied free, with the sole suggested proviso that any return to their home environment is potentially accompanied by post-association memory confiscation. In the linked matter of the suitability of the relevant inhabitants of the microenvironment for further and ordered communication or association, it is my opinion that the reaction to my presence indicates a fundamental unreadiness, as yet, for such a signal honor. Lastly, in recognition of the foregoing, I wish now to be known hereafter as the accession. Thank you. End. You've been listening to Accession by Ian M. Banks, read by Peter Kenny.